request everyone to please be seated. The National CSR and Sustainability Conclave 2022, which is being organized by CIL in association with CCL, is about to start in next few minutes. Uh, I would request everybody to keep their phones on silent mode and enjoy the event. I will request all the volunteers to kindly guide the participants towards the seats. Participants from different subsidiaries of CIL. Hello, Digije. Hello, Digvijay. Hello, Digvijay, Digvijay. I request everyone to please be seated and put their phones on silent mode. Namaskar. Johar. Digvijay, kuch bolo. Good morning to everyone. I. Pooja Prasad, I request ENT department to please uh, check with the echo sound that is coming. हाँ मैं तो मैं करता हूँ तेरी मेरे को तो आने हाँ 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 मैं कर रहा हूँ मैं संगीत तो कॉल कर रहा हूँ संगीत जी मेरी आवाज़ आ रही है मतलब आप मैं लाइव स्ट्रीम भी देख पा रहा हूँ। ओके ओके ठीक है ओके गुड। ओके ओके ठीक है ओके गुड। ओके ठीक मैं निकलता हूँ। गुड मॉर्निंग एवरीवन। आई पूजा प्रसाद एंड आई निकिता भदानी। वेलकम ईच एंड एवरीवन टू द सीएसआर एंड सस्टेनेबिलिटी कॉन्क्लेव 2022 कृत्य से कर्तव्य तक � Go together. The two-day CSR conclave has been conceptualized and visualized in quest for gaining knowledge on different aspects of CSR and sharing best practices converged on a single platform together with our sister companies. Today, we feel honored to have the presence of very eminent and distinguished guests sitting in front of us, present here physically and connected with us Virtually. I feel privileged to welcome Shri P.M. Prasad, Chairman Come Managing Director, Central Coal Fees Limited. Shri Vinay Ranjan, Director Personnel and IR, Coal India Limited. 
श्री पी वी के आर मल्लिकार्जुन राव डायरेक्टर पर्सनल सेंट्रल कोल फील्ड्स लिमिटेड श्री अरुण कुमार ओराव इंडिपेंडेंट डायरेक्टर कोल इंडिया लिमिटेड श्रीमती जाजुला गौरी इंडिपेंडेंट डायरेक्टर सेंट्रल कोल फील्ड्स लिमिटेड श्री अमित ठाकुर स्पीकर टेरी श्री भास्कर चैटर्जी फॉर्मर सेक्रेटरी डीपीई मिस्टर एम के सक्सेना डीपी एचईसी एस्टीम्ड गेस्ट एग्जीक्यूटिव डायरेक्टर्स जनरल मैनेजर सीएसआर ऑफ ऑल सब्सिडीज एच ऑफ सी रिप्रेजेंटेटिव फ्रॉम मेकॉन सिंगरेनी नवेली लिग्नाइट एच representative from our implementing agencies moderators from deloitte members from press and media fellow cdk the participants from cil and subsidiaries ccl officials students from iim rachi ladies and gentlemen i extend a heartfelt warm welcome to everyone at the two day csr and sustainability conclave at rachi now I would request the guest of honor, Chairman Cum Managing Director, Central Coal Fields Limited, Shri Priyam Prasad, to take a seat on the dais. Yeah. With a big round of applause, please welcome our CMD Sir, Shri Priyam Prasad. I would now request our guest of honor, Director Personal and IR, Coal India Limited, Shri Vinay Ranjan, to please a please take a seat on the dais. Thank you, sir. Now I would request everyone to please stand up for the corporate gift.
Thank you so much. Light is a symbol of brightness and prosperity as it expels all the darkness from our lives. To make this morning a blessed one, let us evoke Goddess Saraswati by kindling the lamp of knowledge and wisdom. For seeking the choicest blessings, I invite the guest of honor, CMD CCL, Sri PM Prasad, and Director PNIR, Sri Vinaranjan, CIL, to kindle the lamp. I invite Bhaskar Chatterjee, sir, to please come up on the stage to join our guest of honors. I request Amod Khan, sir, to please come up on the stage to kindle the lamp. Shubham Karoti Kalyanam, Aryogyam Dhan Sampada, Shatru Buddhi Vinashayam, Deepa Jyoti Namastute. Thank you, sirs. I would now request Director Personal CCL, Sri PVKR Malika Arjun Rao, to please come on the stage and welcome our guest of honor, Sri PM Prasad, CMD, Central Goldfields Limited, with Uttreya, Momento, and Abuke. I would again request DP sir to please welcome our guest of honor, Sri Vinayaranjan, Director PNIR, Coal India Limited. I am privileged to welcome the person having knowledge combined with ability and the power to empower each one of us through his words. The head of CCL family, Sri PM Prasad, Chairman come Managing Director CCL, to deliver the welcome address with a big round of applause. Please welcome CMD CCL Sri PM Prasad. Good morning to all. Respected director personnel, Sri Vinayaranjan sir, uh, the 
dignitaries present, uh, Dr. Bhaskar Chatterjee Sahib, former secretary, government of India, and he is uh, popularly known as the architect of CSR implementation in 2013 and subsequently it came in 14. From the last eight, nine years, now it has become mandatory from the eight years, uh, all the uh, industries should uh, put their uh, profitability into organizing the CSR activities and uh, uh, developing the local communities and people. Uh, and see Kant Saab, former DGP Goa and former DGP Arunachal Pradesh and also he was former chairman Child Rights Commission. Uh, see Takur from Terry, uh, Coal India Independent Director, Dr. Arun Oran, Independent Director from CCL Board, Dr. Gauri Madam, my colleague directors, Director Personnel from HEC, uh, Director, uh, Executive Director IACM, Executive Director Coal India Limited, see Sai Ramji, he has come from the last two days, he has uh, been the organizing and he is behind this show. Last year, Chairman Sir has uh, put this idea to hold a CSR conclave by Coal India Limited. The venue will be at uh, CCL. Today he could not come, but he has sent his best wishes. Today there is a launching platform of auction for the, this uh, abundant coal mines. Yesterday, uh, NIT was also prepared and today it is going across the subsidies. The abundant uh, coal mines, which were at any point, that point of time, uh, found uneconomical or not profitable or due to some reasons it was closed. Now it will be coming under this uh, tendering process and subsequently private players will be coming and uh, with their technology they will run these mines. Today that is the day uh, it is being uh, uh, inaugurated from Mumbai. So chairman sir along with secretary Cole and honorable minister were present today in, at uh, Bombay and he has conveyed his best wishes for this conclave. I have requested him to attend at least for tomorrow so that uh, future every year it will be mandatory that the uh, from Coal India it will be organized across the subsidies and the participation today it is appearing to be low. I think uh, in another one hour it may be full. So this is a just a beginning the, as the CSR policy has started from 13-14, it is eight to nine uh, years. So it is a beginning and I welcome all the delegates across the Coal India, outside Coal India and all other uh, industries, the general mayors, the participants, a warm welcome to one and all from Coal India and the CCL in particular. From the last eight years, we know about uh, 1,25,000 crores, the audited figure of uh, amount spent by all the industries, both the government sector and public sector and private sector. In the eight years, roughly about uh, 17 to 20,000 crores in a year. If you look at Coal India, Coal India is also spending about 500 crores a year. CCL is also about spending about uh, 50 crores in turn. In the last eight years, CCL has spent about uh, 500 crores. To name some of the good uh, corporate uh, responsibility projects in CCL, it is the JSSPS along with uh, Jharkhand state government. Uh, it is to promote the sports, almost about 430 young children from different uh, districts of uh, Jharkhand. They are uh, taking the coaching, the free coaching, free education. They recently, last year, tablets were uh, present to them uh, so that they can be at par with their uh, other uh, peers in the schools. So both education is also being taken care and they are already getting under 14 and under 17 at national level, Asian level, gold medals and uh, silver bronze they are getting. And we hope on one day from this JSSPS stadium, somebody will bag Olympic uh, gold medal. The day will not be far away. Some uh, law lordly schemes were started earlier, even before my joining. They were running uh, successfully in last year. More than 10 uh, students got uh, admission IIT and NIT. They are also from all background, uh, from interior parts of the state. So that's also doing well. And uh, 
need of the hour even we may have to adopt some villages also in future so to have our presence from coal india perspective you can have a model village you can adopt and you can work on it so once this just transition is also is of the present uh, need of the hour uh, dialogue it is going world bank teams are also coming so in a phased manner after 2070 2070 if you see if the coal mining is not there even coal mining is at it will be at peak at 2030 up to 2047 next 30 years 40 years some mines in every 10 years some mines will be closed so the communities and the villagers how best they can be put their economy if you see a district like korba 60% of gdp is based on uh, coal mining once the coal mining will not be there what will be the effect of uh, the economy of that district so such things should also be kept in uh, mind and regarding uh, csr we have a lot to do we are it is only just beginning in 8 to 9 years to do any big things it will take decades at least it will take 3 to 4 decades to uh, make the presence even if you adopt a village just like uh, mp mps uh, honorable mps they adopt a village uh, likewise we have also to adopt village the need is there to develop the village like smart villages now it is not like smart cities it is should be smart villages the next we have to focus on villages uh, almost about uh, 8 lakh villages are there in the india so unless you improve villages it is not uh, you cannot uh, inclusive growth cannot be come only from big cities so we have to focus and regarding this is a uh, good move by chairman sir and uh, our dp sir to have this conclaves and the speakers and with their length of experience and the uh, organization they have served i think it will be very fruitful i wish the organizers uh, a great success uh, definitely from next year the attendance will be more uh, Uh, we will across the other companies also we can uh, ask them to participate so this is a just beginning and uh, i hope with the in this two days some uh, nice deliberations will come best practices across coal india across other uh, companies which have come we can learn and we can implement the, it is uh, not enough only we have to at company level only we have to see the best practices even anywhere even tatas uh, from terry he has come uh, mr takur we can adopt the best practices in the years to come similarly i request uh, dp coal india also uh, on a foundation day of coal india we have to if we announce best area best company is there uh, minister award in csr best areas for csr best uh, unit definitely there will be a kick and uh, people will participate and will contribute to this uh, noble cause you can see recently in uh, usa water water is also being treated as essential commodity just like uh, oil and uh, gold because there is a scarcity of water if you see in uh, another 5 to 7 years almost 25% of the world population will be uh, somewhere or the other will be lack of uh, water resources when we when once we do mining either open cash underground the water table also gets down so it's not that just by drilling boreholes by providing tankers we are providing uh, water it is our uh, duty to ensure that uh, the surroundings should not be deprived by our activity if you are not there definitely the village is green uh, say 40 years back 50 years back if you see any villages they are very with green lush and uh, entirely once the after the mining activities definitely it will be affected so this has to be taken care so csr is a mandatory it is our uh, duty to develop the surroundings so once again i thank the uh, real guests uh, like uh, basket chatty saab the shri khand ji and uh, mr takur uh, and all others uh, dignitaries present all the members who are be attending delegates from the different uh, companies once again i welcome and uh, i thank uh, all of you for coming here and participating this in the first uh, csr conclave of coal india thank you thank you sir for sharing your expertise and knowledge with us and motivating us in making this event a grand success 
a dynamic personality, a learned individual, and a far-sighted administrator, under whose able mentorship, Coal India Limited has always been able to stand out time and again. I take the privilege to welcome Sri Vina Ranjan, Director of Personnel and IR, Coal India Limited, for his keynote address. A big round of applause. In fact, uh, if we have a caller mic or a mic, I can speak from there, but it's okay. Hey, kuch caller mic le ye. Okay, barrier should not be there, any barrier should not, it's a barrier, you know, like. Hello, hello, hello. Hello, yeah, I'm audible. Very nice. I can speak from here. Yeah. Uh, good morning, everyone. <laughs> Uh, good morning, uh, CMD, CCL, Bhaskar Da, Amod Sir, and uh, our Coal India ke independent director, when he told us that this event is happening, he was very excited and he said, I will definitely go Arun Sir. Uh, Gauri Madam already supported uh, in all our uh, CSR endeavor, a field person. She goes uh, every time. Uh, directors of uh, CCL, uh, our two EDs bhi aaj yahan aaye hue hain, to unka bhi yeh swagat hai. Aur ek uh, director sahab humare uh, dusri company se bhi aaye hue hain. And everyone, uh, first a big round of applause for you all. You came all the from all your subsidiaries. Uh, let me uh, spend couple of minutes on why and how and what. And what will we be doing two days? You know, you have given your two days time here in, in Ranchi, a beautiful city, Jharkhand, capital Ranchi. Uh, last November, there was a HR conclave happened in our one of the subsidiary in NCL, Northern Coalfield. And that was fantastic national level conference with good speakers from Mumbai, Delhi, and all around. There we conceived the idea of a CSR conclave and said, which subsidiary to give? And I'm very happy for CMD CCL, a big round of applause for him. He raised his hand and he said, let's do it in Ranchi. Because see what happened, uh, we do our work and we never get a time to go outside and think what we should plan and see. And we all we are busy in our all operations. So this is the time we Come out of your daily work, routine work, you know, ideas, and think through. Here, expert who has come all the way, they have, you know, plethora of experience. Hear them and conceive your ideas for what you will be doing next. In uh, let me set the context for uh, CSR in uh, CIL. If you take corporate spend, amount of corporate spend, we are number three in India. 535 crores last year, 21, 22. And only two companies ahead of us. Can you name them? Reliance, obvious choice, number one. Not ONGC, Tata Trust. Tata Trust. And we were, Coal India, if you consolidate expense of all the subsidiaries, we were 535 crores, number three. So huge amount of, you know, budgets we have and we have been doing here in, in, in Coal India. But to my expectation sitting at the helm of uh, CSR and sitting at the headquarter, am I happy with the way Coal India is uh, talked about CSR in business world? Am I happy? <laughs> no, I am expecting sitting at the you know, headquarter more. So we should have a brand on, on CSR, a visibility, and the impact. 
the necessary impact which we wanted to create in you know uh, uh, for the communities and coal india is the only company where we work with most remotest place in the country where no corporate goes all our mining operations where in jharkhand in a korba talchar where where most of the corporate companies you know don't go there so that's why our responsibility to support our communities goes up and very apt name krit se kartavya tak krit is what things which we do jo hum kaam karte hai wo krit and kartavya what we should be doing as a corporate and as citizen what we should be doing to iske liye ye humne ye do din ka conclave rakha hai ki what we should be doing krit to kar rahe hain kaam to kar rahe hain but kartavya kya hai as a corporate citizen तो उसमें हम लोगों को मंथन करना है आपको अच्छे अच्छे स्पीकर्स आए हैं आपके पास आ, अब देखिए ग्लोबल कॉन्टेक्स वर्सेस इंडियन कॉन्टेक्स अगर सी साइज की बात करें मार्केट साइज की बात करें स्पेंड की बात करें वेरी फ्यू कंट्रीज इन वर्ल्ड विच इंडिया वाज़ द फर्स्ट विच इज मैंडेटेड द सी स्पेंड कि आप जहां से प्रॉफिट कमाते हैं जिस एरिया से प्रॉफिट कमाते हैं जिस बिजनेस ऑपरेशन या प्रोडक्शन या सर्विसेज से आप प्रॉफिट कमाते हैं यू शुड बी गिविंग बैक टू योर कम्युनिटीज सोसाइटीज एंड वेयर यू ऑपरेट एंड भास्कर दाई इज हेयर एंड ही इज वन ऑफ द आर्किटेक्ट एंड इन इज प्रेजेंट फॉर्म अगर आप इक्कीस बाईस का स्पेंड देखेंगे क्लोज टू टेन थाउजेंड कंपनीज ने बीस हजार करोड़ से ज्यादा का सी एस आर रेस्पेक्ट किया दैट इज इंडियन सी एस आर साइज अकाउंटेबल इफ यू गो टू दिनिस्ट्री साइज ट्वेंटी थाउजेंड क्रॉस कैन सी द अमाउंट ऑफ यू नो मनी और अगर आप गवर्नमेंट की स्कीम देखेंगे तो ओनली पांच स्कीम जो हैं जो इस साइज से ऊपर खर्चा होती है गवर्नमेंट स्कीम में मनरेगा हो गया पी एम किसान योजना हो गया पी एम जल योजना हाँ चार पांच ही है और बाकी जितनी योजना है उनमें खर्चा जो है ये सी एस आर So you can imagine the impact. What what CSR people do? Twenty thousand crores, which is expenses more than so many government schemes. अब कुछ लोगों का ये भी कहना है कि भास्कर दान ने तो एक जैसा corporate tax जैसा लगा दिया है. जब हम tax देते हैं thirty five percent, forty five percent. Sorry, मैं आपका नाम ले रहा हूँ. I'm not uh, mean that way. Just just to tell. तो क्या ये corporate tax है? CSR क्या corporate tax है? एनी वरी एनी बड़ी नहीं ये पैसा जो आपका है ये आपके हाथ में है जो आप टैक्स देते हैं वो आपको मालूम नहीं है कहाँ खर्चा हो रहा है सरकार की स्कीम भी कभी ये आपके हाथ में है एंड यू गेट ब्रांड इमेज आउट ऑफ दैट एंड यू कैन सी द इम्पैक्ट आप यू कैन चूज द प्रोग्राम कि किस प्रोग्राम में हमें खर्चा करना है किस प्रोग्राम में खर्चा नहीं करना है और आपकी सोशल वैल्यू कॉरपोरेट वैल्यू आप इससे लेते हैं है कि नहीं अब आइए ग्लोबल में ग्लोबल में कुछ कंट्रियों ने अभी धीरे धीरे इंडिया वाज़ द फर्स्ट कंट्री इन 2014 व्हेन द न्यू लॉ केम कंपनी लॉ केम एंड इट वाज सेक्शन 135 में मैंडेटेड हो गया फिर दूसरी कंट्रियों की भी नींद खुली इंडोनेशिया ने अभी रिसेंटली इंडोनेशिया ने भी मैंडेट किया कुछ मॉरिसस ने भी मैंडेट किया लेकिन अभी भी वहाँ पर उनके खुद से ओनली थिंग दे नीड टू डू दे नीड टू रिपोर्ट इन देयर एनुअल There's no mandatory, but annual report में आपको आपके इसमें लिखना पड़ेगा कि आपने सी एस आर के अंदर क्या क्या किया इंडिया में है लेकिन अब ये जो ट्वेंटी थाउजेंड करोड़ की बात मैं कर रहा हूं वो कहां चला जाता है विच आर द स्टेट जहां सबसे ज्यादा सी एस आर होता है एनी बड़ी महाराष्ट्र हाँ यहां से एक दो लोग जवाब नहीं देंगे तो अच्छा है यहां से खासकर दो तीन लोग जवाब नहीं देंगे तो अच्छा है बाकी लोगों को मौका दिया जाए ठीक है ना यू नो द रीजन वाई आई एम टेलिंग यू नॉट टू गिव एंसर महाराष्ट्र की प्राइवेट सेक्टर के जितने जो हैं बट अगर अगर पॉवर्टी इंडेक्स देखेंगे तो वॉट विच आर द थ्री पोअरेस्ट स्टेट इन इंडिया बिहार जहाँ हम आज खड़े हैं झारखंड उड़ीसा ये अगर इंडेक्स अगर पॉवर्टी इंडेक्स जो नीति आयोग हर साल इशू करता है नीति आयोग से भी इशू होता है 
बट वहाँ नहीं हो पा रहा है और वहाँ पे जो हमारा सबसे ज़्यादा रोल है खासकर झारखंड में झारखंड में हमारी तीन कंपनियाँ हैं कोल इंडिया की तीन कंपनियाँ झारखंड में ऑपरेट करती है सी सी एल ऑब्वियसली हेडकोर्टर रांची बी सी सी एल हेडकोर्टर एट धनबाद एंड ईस्टर्न कोलफिट दे हैव थ्री एरियाज इन झारखंड तो हमारा यहाँ तो कर्तव्य ज़्यादा बनता है यहाँ हाँ सी एम पी डी भी है सी एम का बजट थोड़ा कम रहता है तो इसके लिए थोड़ा सी सी एल के और इसमें बट सी एम पी भी है थैंक्स फॉर रिमाइंडिंग तो ये चार कंपनियां हमारी जो है वो हेडक्वार्टर एट झारखंड है तो हमारे झारखंड के प्रति तो ज़्यादा कर्तव्य बनता है कितने से कर्तव्य है तो उसमें कर्तव्य हमारा बनता है और जब हम कर्तव्य की बात करते हैं अधिकार की बात करते हैं तो कर्तव्य हमको ड्यूटीज जो है हमारे कॉन्स्टिट्यूशन में भी सेक्शन फिफ्टी वन ए उसमें बताया गया है ग्यारह ड्यूटीज लेकिन क्या होता है हम ज़्यादा अपनी अधिकार की बात करते हैं कर्तव्य की जो बात होती है तो कर्तव्य कोई दूसरा करे हमारा अधिकार तो हमको मिलना चाहिए सेक्शन ट्वेल्व से आर्टिकल ट्वेल्व से आर्टिकल थर्टी फाइव तक हमको बताया गया कि हमारी फंडामेंटल राइट्स क्या हैं छह फंडामेंटल राइट्स है उसके बाद सेक्शन है उसके तो हमें बताया गया है लेकिन आज मैं ज़्यादा ड्यूटीज़ पे कर्तव्य क्या है उस पर ज़्यादा विचार करूँगा अब नेक्स्ट क्वेश्चन है क्या देर इज़ अ कॉन्सेप्ट ऑफ बैड सी एस आर एंड गुड सी एस आर डू यू थिंक कॉल बैड सी एस आर एंड गुड सी एस आर ये प्रोजेक्ट एक अच्छा सी एस आर का एग्जाम्पल है और ये प्रोजेक्ट एक खराब वी शेल टॉक अबाउट इट कि क्या होता है कि खासकर हमारी कंपनियों में कि कोई भी प्रोजेक्ट को अच्छा हम खराब ऐसा बोल नहीं सकते हैं दैट इज ऑल डिराइव फ्रॉम द नीड असमेंट कि कम्युनिटीज का नीड क्या है लेकिन कुछ जो हम वन टाइम एक्सरसाइज करते हैं मेडिकल कैंप उसे कुछ सेक्शन को फायदा हुआ बट देर इज नो लास्टिंग इम्पैक्ट जैसे फिर हम मैरिज हॉल आई कैन अंडरस्टैंड मैरिज हॉल इज अ नीड ऑफ दैट कम्युनिटी दैट पर्टिकुलर विलेज दैट पर्टिकुलर यू नो है और कभी कभी हम स्कूल में कुछ बिल्डिंग बना दिया जो कि सिर्फ 400 500 लोगों को इम्पैक्ट कर रहा है वी शुड बी थिंकिंग ऑफ क्रिएटिंग इम्पैक्ट एंड लॉन्ग टर्म इम्पैक्ट अब दूसरा क्या भी होता है कि आप लोग देखेंगे जितने हमारे सी एस आर में कितने लोग काम कर रहे हैं हाउ मेनी पीपल आर वर्किंग इन सी एस आर मोस्टली सी एस आर में कि हमने काम डिपॉजिट बेसिस पे दे दिया उसके बाद बोर्ड मीटिंग मार्च में भाई यू सी लाना यू सी लाना ये हम लोग चेस कर रहे हैं यू सी के लिए है कि नहीं मार्च के महीना में सी एस आर कमेटी की मीटिंग होनी है और सी एस आर कमेटी में पूछा जाएगा मैडम तो पूछती है हर मीटिंग में कि यू सी कितना हुआ कर, पैसा खर्चा यूटिलाइजेशन सर्टिफिकेट आया कि नहीं आया तो हम लोग भागते रहते हैं और मुझे ये आपको बताते हुए बहुत खुशी हो रही है कि हमारे पास जो सी एस आर के जो कैडर के जो लड़के हैं दे ऑल आर फ्रॉम वेरी गुड इंस्टीट्यूट यू नेम द बेस्ट ऑफ द इंस्टीट्यूट इन इंडिया वर्क एज एज अ स्टडी एज अ फंक्शन वो सब वहाँ के बच्चे हमारे पढ़ के आए हैं नहीं मिट मैं किसी को चिन्हित नहीं कर बहुत लोगों को जानता हूँ मैं क्लोजली काम किया हूँ इनके साथ में दे आर ऑल दे आर ऑल माई कोलीग्स इन ईस्टर्न कोलफील्ड एंड सेंट्रल कोलफील्ड एंड इन अदर सब्सिडी डब्ल्यू सी एल ऑल्सो लोग सब अच्छी जगह से हैं तो कैन वी टू डे नेक्स्ट टू डेज कि रादर दैन थिंकिंग ऑफ अ डिपॉजिट वेसिस वर्क कि क्यों नहीं हम एक डी खुद क्रिएट करें एक खुद ऐसा एम्बियंस क्रिएट करें जहाँ की एस्टिमेट्स हम खुद बनाएं नीड असमेंट करें और उसके बाद प्रोजेक्ट इम्प्लीमेंटेशन के बाद उसकी इम्पैक्ट क्या हुआ और वो स्टोरीज को करें ब्यूटीफुल स्टोरीज इन इन कोल अगर आप देखेंगे कोल इंडस्ट्रीज में ब्यूटीफुल स्टोरीज लेकिन वो हम ठीक से कैप्चर करके उसको हम मीडिया वर्ल्ड को या फिर बिजनेस वर्ल्ड को ठीक से बता नहीं पाते ब्यूटीफुल स्टोरीज ब्यूटीफुल इम्पैक्ट क्रिएटेड ब्यूटीफुल चेंज क्रिएटेड इन द कम्युनिटीज अभी सी एम डी साहब ने दो प्रोजेक्ट का नाम लिया जो कि झारखंड का आइकॉनिक प्रोजेक्ट है बाल थल सेमिया प्रोजेक्ट जो कि कोल इंडिया गरीब बच्चों को उनके बोन मैरो ट्रांसप्लांटेशन के लिए दस लाख रुपया देती है और अभी मैं मुंबई गया था कोकिला बेन में फैंटास्टिक थ्री मंथस ओल्ड चाइल्ड हैज गिवेन देयर बोन मैरो टू हर एल्डर सिस्टर चार साल की बच्ची तीन साल महीने की बच्ची ने से निकाला गया था तो ये सब ब्यूटीफुल स्टोरीज यू नो एग्जाम्पल्स हमारे पास हैं जो कि हम कैप्चर करते हैं और अभी मैं बताऊं कि हमारी वो सी में नहीं था लेकिन एज अ गॉड गुड कॉर्पोरेट सिटीजन 
एक हमारी वर्कर की बच्ची दो साल की बच्ची एस में एक ऐसी गंभीर बीमारी से पीड़ित थी जिसका इलाज अभी तक नहीं बना है उसका एक ही इलाज था जो कि हमको एक इंजेक्शन इंपोर्ट करना पड़ता था स्विट्जरलैंड से जो कि 16 करोड़ वैल्यू और आपको विश्वास होगा कि कोल इंडिया ने 16 करोड़ सैंक्शन किए उस बच्ची के लिए दिस इज नॉट सी एस आर बिकॉज वी कॉन्ट डू सी एस आर फॉर आवर इंप्लॉयज बट इट्स गुड स्टोरीज दिस नीज टू बी यू नो टोल्ड टू द कॉर्पोरेट वर्ल्ड टू द इंडिया पीपल की कोल इंडिया हैज गॉन अहेड एंड you know done such a wonderful gesture to their own employees abhi aaiye ki project si baat karte hain aur jab maine bola ki my expectation is that we should be doing our own estimation dpr and implementation theek hai implementation agencies ko hum la ke leke aa sakte hain aur uske baad impact trigger kar sakte hain wo kaise hoga क्या करना पड़ेगा हम कृत से कर्तव्य तक भी बात करते हैं लेकिन उसके लिए क्या चाहिए समर्पण डेडिकेशन और जितने भी हमारे सीएसआर डिपार्टमेंट के लोग बैठे हैं आज मैं उनसे एक वादा लेके यहां से जाना चाहता हूं बिफोर माय uh, स्पीच की नोट एड्रेस इज ओवर कि 22, 23 विल बी अ लैंडमार्क ईयर इन टर्म्स ऑफ सी इन करेंगे आप लोग हाँ करेंगे आवाज नहीं धीरे क्यों आ रही भाई जोश नहीं है जोश नहीं आएगा तो एवरीथिंग इज जोश आपको मैं स्पोर्ट्स फील्ड का एग्जांपल बोलता हूं आपने कल रियल मैड्रिड और उसका मैनचेस्टर सिटी का मैच देखा नाइनटी एटी नाइन नाइनटी एट मिनट में वो क्या था पैशन वो रियल मैड्रिड बाहर हो रही थी लेकिन एट्टी मिनट में गोल हुआ नाइनटी मिनट में गोल हुआ फिर एक्स्ट्रा टाइम में गया और एक्स्ट्रा टाइम में करके वो सो फैंटास्टिक कम What was behind it? Passion. तो आप लोगों को भी passion, एक change बदलाव लाने की passion. कि हम बदलाव लाएंगे हमको company ने power दिया है, mandate दिया है. और मुझे वैसे ही लोग चाहिए हमारी team में जो कि इस passion में शामिल होना चाहते हैं. कुछ लोग होंगे इस group में जो बोलेंगे यार DP साहब कुछ भी बोल के चले जाते हैं, भाषण देके चले जाते हैं, कुछ होने आना है नहीं, Cold India से ही है. हैं ऐसे लोग हमारे यहाँ. तो ऐसे लोग जो हैं मैं उनको पहले आज से बता देना चाहता हूं कि भाई आपको अगर लगता है कि हम नहीं कर पाएंगे तो आप साइड हो जाइए हमको मौका दीजिए हम करके दिखाएंगे और यही टीम करेगी क्योंकि आपको देखिए आपको किसी के जीवन में किसी कम्युनिटी में बदलाव लाने का उसकी सेवा करने का मौका मिला कितने लोगों को मिलता है और भी कंपनी के पैसे अपने पैसे से नहीं कंपनी हैज गिवेन यू बजट to change the lives theek hai but karna kya hoga agar hum acche csr project ki baat karte hain to sabse important hai livelihood creation skill development livelihood creation ki hum aisa livelihood create kare ki migration na ho dekhiye migration sabse zyada kis se hota hai jahan hum baithe hain us bihar se उड़ीसा से वेस्ट बंगाल से यही स्टेट के लोग जाते हैं दूसरे जगह में कमाने के लिए हम भी हम भी बिहार से मुंबई गए थे जब हम ये किए थे अपना एमबीए करने के बाद तीस साल पहले तो लोग माइग्रेट करते हैं बड़े शहरों में तो वैसा हम स्किल क्रिएट करें एंड लोकल लेवल पे करें ठीक है ना वो एक कहावत है ना कि इफ यू गिव अ फिश टू वन पर्सन ही विल इट इट अगर किसी को फिश यू गिव ए फिश टू वन पर्सन ही विलेटेड एंड टुमारो ही विल अगेन स्टैंड इन योर डोर कि भाई एक और दे दो तो वो हमको वैसा काइंड ऑफ सी नहीं करना है कि आप उनको रोज देते रहें एक बार आप उनको कुछ भी करके देंगे फिर अगले दिन वो तो कुछ समय बाद वो खत्म हो जाएगा फिर अगले दिन फिर आके खड़े हो जाएंगे बट यू टीच देम हाउ टू डू द फिशिंग अगर उसको फिशिंग सिखा दोगे वो कल आपके पास नहीं आएगा वो जाएगा फिशिंग करने के लिए और अपने भी खाएगा और अपने परिवार को भी खिलाएगा तो आई एम टॉकिंग अबाउट दैट काइंड ऑफ यू नो इम्पावरमेंट वेयर वी डू सच काइंड ऑफ प्रोजेक्ट इन एट सी आई एल एंड टू ठीक है डी पी का हमारा एस्पिरेशनल uh, डिस्ट्रिक्ट का प्रोग्राम होता है टीम्स uh, आते हैं हेल्थ सैनिटाइजेशन 
और आपको ये भी बता दूं कि कोविड के टाइम में हम मतलब टू सिक्सटी नाइन क्रॉस एज ए सी आई एल ह्यूज अमाउंट ऑन ऑन आर क्रिएटिंग इंफ्रास्ट्रक्चर टू सिक्सटी नाइन क्रॉस ऑफ अमाउंट वी हैव डन इन ट्वेंटी ट्वेंटी ऑक्सीजन प्लांट्स हमने करीब थर्टी थ्री प्लांट्स लगाए हैं सिक्स प्लांट्स इन आर ओन हॉस्पिटल्स एंड रेस्ट ऑफ द प्लांट्स इन डिफरेंट स्टेट्स एम पी यू पी अदर महाराष्ट्र वेस्ट बंगाल दोज काइंड ऑफ जब मिशन प्लान वायु प्रधानमंत्री जी ने शुरू किया था तो उसके तहत हम लोग एज ए गुड कॉर्पोरेट वी हैव ऑल्सो कॉन्ट्रीब्यूटेड थ्रू सी एस आर तो वो तो थीम चलता रहेगा वेर यू हैव टू सपोर्ट द नेशनल कॉज जब राष्ट्र की जरूरत है और वहां पे आपको सीएसआर करना है तो वो तो चलता रहेगा लेकिन मैं आप लोगों से वादा लेना चाहता हूं कि 22-23 हम दो थीम लेके चले ऑल सब्सिडरीज ऑल सब्सिडरीज के जीएम सी लोग भी हैं यहाँ पे हाँ सी के तो मैं देख रहा हूं आप, आप कौन से कंपनी से बी सी से और डब्ल्यू से हाँ अजय हाँ और एन सी हाँ, तो दो थीम लेके आपको चलना है इस बार Apart from the theme which is mandated uh, through DP's uh, theme or a special district theme, एक है skill development. कम से कम दस हजार बच्चों को skill development का target लेना है इस बार कोल इंडिया में. Okay? Somebody must note it. Ten thousand. And out of this ten thousand, at least thirty percent should be women. ठीक है? मैडम थोड़ा हमारे एरिया में विमेन उतना नहीं आते हैं एटलीस्ट <laughs> <At least> बोला <laughs> मिनिमम बोला <laughs> मैक्सिमम तो टेन थाउजेंड करना है उसमें से अगर टेन थाउजेंड विमेन हो जाए वेल एंड गुड वी विल बी हैप्पी तो एटलीस्ट थर्टी परसेंट शुड बी विमेन आउट ऑफ दैट ठीक है ऑल जी एम आप लोगों ने नोट किया ये चीज को मनोज है ना ठीक है ना तो दिस थीम वी वॉन्ट टू एंड Second is how should we run a program for livelihood creation? को वैसा skill हम दें और maybe कुछ skill देने के बाद हम seed funding जिसको बोलते हैं हम जैसे कि for example ये example किसी ने मुझे दिया था कि आप किसी बच्चे को उसके area में for example tire repairing, tire puncture एक छोटा सा स्किल है वो सिखाया वो तो सिखा दिया लेकिन उसके पास पैसे नहीं है कि ही कैन स्टार्ट हिज ओन तो सीड फंडिंग टेन थाउजेंड आप उसको बोल दीजिए कि भाई आपका मेन मार्केट में आप एक छोटी सी जगह ले लो आप टूल्स एंड मशीनरी एंड टूल्स खरीद लो ये दस हजार बीस हजार जो भी आपको ये हम स्टार्टिंग मनी आपको देते हैं सो दैट यू कैन स्टार्ट योर बिजनेस उसके बाद फिर यू रन योर बिजनेस यू मेक योर लाइवलीहुड तो उससे दो चीजें होंगी दो चीजें क्या होंगी एक तो वो बंदा खुद सेल्फ सफिशियंट हो जाएगा अपने पैरों पे खड़ा हो जाएगा एंड ही कैन फीड हिज फैमिली एंड ही डजेंट हैव टू माइग्रेट विच इज अ बिग यू नो माइग्रेशन पॉपुलेशन आईएलओ का सबसे बड़ा टॉपिक है आज के दिन में अगर आईएलओ के पास 10 से 15 चार्टर्स हैं और डिफरेंट टॉपिक्स हैं तो सबसे बड़ा अगर कोई डिस्कशन का पॉइंट है वो माइग्रेशन वर्कर्स नॉट इन इंडिया अक्रॉस वर्ल्ड एवरी कंट्री नॉर्थ अफ्रीका से यूरोप जा रहे हैं दूसरी कंट्री से दूसरी जगह जा रहे हैं तो हाउ टू स्टॉप द माइग्रेशन पॉपुलेशन एंड हाउ माइग्रेट पॉपुलेशन आर इम्पावर्ड एंड क्रिएट लाइवलीहुड एंड फॉर देयर हेल्थ सैनिटेशन एंड देयर होम एकोमोडेशन वो उनको जहाँ भी रहें उनको घर रहने को एक दो छत मिल जाए तो ये आई एल ओ के लेवल पर तो हम एज ए कॉरपोरेट सिटीजन गुड कॉरपोरेट सिटीजन ऐसा काम करें और तीसरा एक्सपेक्टेशन मेरा है कि जो हम काम करें उसको आपको यू नीड टू यू नो सही उसके डॉक्यूमेंटेशन हो सही लोगों तक पहुंचे लोगों तक पहुंचना भी तो जरूरी है ना आजकल लोग बोलते हैं ब्लो योर ओन ट्रम्पेट हर कंपनियां दूसरे जो प्राइवेट सेक्टर की हैं वो तो अपना टेलीविजन एड भी दे देती है सी का टीवी सी आ जाता है टीवी कॉमर्शियल के रूप में आ जाता है आई डोंट वॉन्ट टू नेम द कंपनीज यू नो विच कंपनीज आई एम टॉकिंग अबाउट दे पुट टी वी सी दे हैव डन दिस काइंड ऑफ अ थिंग यू नो इन इन ओरिसा और कॉमर्शियल के रूप में दिखा देते हैं बट हम नहीं करते हमें 
मुझे हम लोगों को करना भी नहीं है कमर्शियल के लेवल तक नहीं आना पर डॉक्यूमेंटेशन होना चाहिए सही रिप्रेजेंटेशन होना चाहिए हमारे वेबसाइट पे आना चाहिए सक्सेस स्टोरीज मैप्ड होनी चाहिए सक्सेस स्टोरीज टू बी टोल्ड ऐसे फोरम में जहाँ कि बिजनेस के लोग मिलते हैं एक बड़ा फोरम में ये सक्सेस स्टोरीज बताना चाहिए कि हमने ये सी प्रोजेक्ट लिया था और ये काम किसका है हम सबका है एवरीबडी नीड्स टू बी देर इट्स अ टीम वर्क कि सिर्फ भाई हमारी पीआर टीम है सिर्फ पीआर टीम की रिस्पांसिबिलिटी है पीआर टीम प्रेस से बात करती है सोशल मीडिया वेबसाइट चलाती है तो पीआर करेगा नहीं आप भी आपके कम्युनिटी में जो भी फोरम में आप जा रहे हैं उस फोरम में आप बताइए कि हम सी टीम से हैं और हमने इस तरह की इम्पैक्ट क्रिएट की है इस तरह की स्टोरीज और यू ऑलवेज कैन पब्लिश आर्टिकल्स इन वेरियस न्यूज और आपको परमिशन की जरूरत है तो मैं सब डायरेक्टर पर्सन से बोलूंगा कि भाई सी के एग्जीक्यूटिव आर्टिकल निकालना चाहते हैं और स्टोरीज बनाना चाहते हैं तो उनको परमिशन दीजिए कि दे शुड गो टू यू नो बिग सी एस आर मैगजींस एंड टेल कि दिस सी एस आर इज डूइंग अंत में मेरा पंद्रह बीस मिनट हो गया तो मैं अंत में लेट मी समराइज देट में कि इच्छा क्या है कि हम सी से एक पैशन से आसमान में सुराख करें चेंज बदलाव लाएं और उसके लिए क्या चाहिए हैमर पत्थर वो है ना कि कौन कहता है कि आसमान में सुराख नहीं हो सकता एक तबियत एक पत्थर तो तबियत से उछालो यारो धर्मवीर भारती जी ने साथ ये बोला था दुष्यंत दुष्यंत कुमार जी हाँ थैंक यू मैंडी तो ये सच हो सकता है You we always can do passion चाहिए और सब लोग साथ में आए इकट्ठे आए I'm sure एक जो इतना बड़ा corpus है CIA के पास वो सही जगह पे जाए और हम impact create करें और आगे सालों में जो हमने 22 तेईस का जो theme दिया है आज उसको जब हम अगले मई में मई तेईस में यहाँ मिले तो एक रिपोर्ट काट दें जो भी उस ऑडियंस आए और सर लोग आगे अगले साल भी हम बुलाएंगे जरूर तेईस में क्योंकि ये प्रसाद साहब को मैं बहुत बहुत धन्यवाद भी देना चाहता हूं कि इन्होंने रिस्पॉन्सिबिलिटी ली है जैसे एचआर मैंने एनसीएल को दे दिया एचआर कॉन्फ्रेंस वो करेंगे सी एस आर एंड सस्टेनेबिलिटी कॉन्फ्रेंस सी हर साल करेगा अभी ये सर ऑन बिहाफ ऑफ यूर आई एम कमिटिंग तो हर करेगा और uh, before i conclude i must thank people who has uh, worked for last one month in finalizing uh, speakers talking to them and coordinating with them uh, i want to have a big round of applause for mr sairam <laughs> he is there standing he is our ed csr uh, at uh, corporate so he and his uh, team uh, has done wonderful job uh, ccl uh, cmd saab Uh, he's, he has given his blessings, and he has always, uh, whenever I spoke to him, he said, "Nani, you rest assured, we will be doing our best, and we can see the arrangement, best of the arrangement under his leadership has happened." So, one round of applause uh, for <laughs> CMD sir. And at the end, our director personnel, uh, CCL Rao sir, who was also here last one month, was very busy. When he was here. फ़ोन करना कि सर हम ये कर दे रहे हैं वो कर दे रहे हैं ऐसा अरेंजमेंट कर दे रहे हैं इनको बुला रहे हैं उनको कर रहे हैं तो राव साहब के लिए भी एक बार वी वी शुड दे एंड इंटायर सी सी एल टीम हु हैज़ मेड दिस ब्यूटीफुल कलर कोऑर्डिनेशन आई कैन सी ब्लू येलो एंड एंड वेन अर्लियर इट वॉज वेरी ब्लैंड कलर्स वी सेट नो 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 थोड़ा लाइफ में कलर आना चाहिए सो दैन वी चेंज दिस बैकग्राउंड कलर्स एंड आपके इन्विटेशन मैन एवरी तो इसके साथ ही आ, मैं आप लोगों का धन्यवाद देना चाहता हूं फॉर पेशेंट लिसनिंग एंड इफ एनी बडी हैज एनी सजेशन एनी इम्प्रूवमेंट एरियाज आई एम हेयर टिल लंच और उसके बाद भी मैं दो दिन यहां पे हूं प्लीज टॉक टू मी और आ, हम साथ में सीआईएल की जो सी एस आर एक्सपीरियंस को आगे लेके चले और मुझे पूरा भरोसा है कि हम आसमान में सुराख करेंगे थैंक यू
Thank you so much, sir, for mm -hmm. enlightening us with the valuable insights mm -hmm. on CSR and guiding us mm -hmm. for a roadmap mm -hmm. ahead. Mm -hmm. I would request officials from <laughs> CCL to please escort the dignitaries on the dais towards the designated seats. I would request Sri Vinay Ranjan, Director Personnel and IR, Coal India Limited, for launching the short film on sustainability prepared by Central Coal Fields Limited. So uh, we will give you a remote and uh, you will press the button and the movie will get launched. A big round of applause. कोल इंडिया हम स्ट्रेंथन करना चाहता है आप समझ के रहिए और आने वाले 20-25 वर्ष के लिए 30 वर्ष के लिए कोयला बहुत जरूरी है ये तो हम सब लोग जानते हैं इट इज़ द मोस्ट नेसेसरी फॉर द इलेक्ट्रिसिटी कोल इंडियन कंपनीज द सब्सिडीज दे हैव अ लॉन्ग हिस्ट्री ऑफ वर्किंग इन द स्टेट्स ईस्टर्न स्टेट्स एंड सेंट्रल स्ट and have a very good connect with the local people and the local communities. In my tours, my reviews, I have found that they have completely been honest in the task of keeping up the environment of the states they are working in. And I have no doubt that in the times to come, Coal India Limited will come out as a great promoter of environment forestry and air quality of the regions that is working. Coal India Limited is the premier coal mining company in India. It is government owned and headquartered in Kolkata. It is in fact the largest coal producing company in the world. Coal India is a Maharatna public sector company contributing 83% of the total coal production in India. Mining the coal in an ecologically sustainable way becomes very important. Coal India is trying to reduce its carbon footprint through automation, mechanization and digitization. In this context, we are trying to plant as many trees as possible and actually in this year we have increased our target by 60 percent compared to the last year. We are venturing into solar power generation as well and we expect that in next three years Coal India will be net zero carbon company. Central Coal Fields Limited is one of the seven coal producing subsidiaries headquartered in Ranchi, Jharkhand. It has 42 operational mines spread over eight districts in Jharkhand. Some of the major mines are Amrapali, Ashok, Magad, North Orimari, Karo, and North Karanpura, besides Rajrappa and AKK. Contrary to the popular perception that coal mining is detrimental to the environment, CCL is concentrating on several initiatives to preserve the environment and ensure inclusive development of project affected areas. The projects utilize mine water to the maximum extent possible for industrial and domestic requirements. All the open cast mines have oil and grease trap in workshops. Water treatment plants have been provided for supply of safe drinking water to employees. 
The washeries are operating on the principle of zero discharge. Water discharged from open cast mines and underground mines of CCL are used by local population and the CCL colonies for domestic and other purposes after proper treatment. An MOU signed on 30-10-2017 between Coal India Limited and the Government of Jharkhand for utilization of 25,250 million gallons of water. In the financial year 2020-21, CCL has granted three NOCs to Drinking Water and Sanitation Department of Jharkhand Government for utilization of mine water for community use. Provision of water sprinkling by mobile sprinklers is in all the open cast mines. At present, CCL has 61 mobile sprinklers. Majority of them are mist type of sprinklers which are technologically superior to normal sprinklers. The railway sidings of the company use varieties of techniques like fixed sprinklers, windscreens and a green belt to mitigate environmental pollution. Railway sidings also use continuous real-time PM10 analyzers for continuous monitoring of ambient air quality. Central Coalfields Limited is in the process of procuring continuous ambient air quality monitoring stations for all the areas of CCL. The company has developed the mine voids filled with water for promoting busy culture. The objective is to improve the water quality through biological methods and consequently create a cost-effective method of income generation for the local community. More than 3 lakhs of fish seeds of Katla and Tilapia varieties have grown in the areas earmarked for busy culture projects. CCL contributes to the national goal for renewable energy by installing rooftop solar power plants at its various project sites. CCL has distributed solar kits among the indigenous and vulnerable Birhor community. In this light was very difficult in our village. So, with 1500 solar panels, pankha, and battery, and two bulbs have been given to the ये सारा काम सीसीएल द्वारा कराया गया है। ऐसे हम लोग पहले अंधार में रहते थे, अभी लेड और बैटरी मिला, सोलर मिला, पंखा मिला, तो यूज करते हैं। जैसे कि पहले यहाँ नहीं था बना हुआ, तो हम लोग बहुत दूर से पान लाते थे, नहाने के लिए बहुत दूर नदी जाना पड़ता था, अभी यहाँ बना तो थोड़ा आराम ह The Sports Academy at Kelgao, Rachi was established in 2016 as a joint initiative of Central Coalfields Limited and the State Government of Jharkhand. This CSR initiative of CCL aims at lending wings to the dreams of the children of the state, nurturing them holistically so that they can scale great heights in the field of sports. At present, 437 sports cadets about 96% of whom belong to the scheduled castes, scheduled tribes and other backward communities are undergoing training. They have won 702 medals, including 87 medals in national championships. As a responsible corporate citizen, CCL has taken all measures to align corporate social responsibility with its approach towards sustainable development. Our social initiatives are focused on activities designed to improve community health, sanitation, skill development, as well as promotion of sports and games. 
the company endeavors to expand its CSR footprint in the communities that it serves and generate wider benefits for them. The company has spent over 480 crore rupees on CSR since April 2014. The success of projects like CCLK Lal Ladli, Kaya Kalp Public School, etc., a testimony of the company's sincere efforts. Recently, Matul Baghel, a student of our flagship scheme, CCLK Lal, has joined Coal India as a mining engineer. Multiple skill development training activities are also organized by the company throughout its operational areas for the benefit of the community. CCL provides vocational training to individuals in the region for their skill development. It is focused on self-empowerment of the local community. Modern mining technology is deployed by the Central Coal Fields Limited to ensure sustainable mining. This ensures productivity, prevents wastage and makes mining operations safe without compromising the share of future generations. The introduction of surface miners for coal mining instead of shovel dumper system is significant. Surface miners have minimized the need of drilling, blasting and crushing of coal. The company has undertaken four first mile connectivity projects to replace the existing road transport between pit heads and dispatch points and to switch over to seamless mechanized coal transport system through conveyor belts, which is a covered system for movement of coal, reducing the dust pollution. Besides corporate governors, one thing is we have to have a social responsibility. We have to take all the stakeholders in confidence. We have to see their uh, livelihood, their uh, development as an index we have to monitor. Uh, the surrounding areas, if we grow with us, then it will be a fruitful thing. A lot has to be contributed from this coal industry, coal India in particular, as we being uh, plus 83-84 percent uh, coal production. So, uh, we will take all the possible uh, steps and we will ensure that uh, CCL from uh, this Jharkhand will be a role model in the country in the best practices of environment we will ensure. Central Coal Field Limited, as part of Coal India Limited, is trying its utmost to carry out its mining operations in a sustainable manner. It is giving top priority to inclusive growth, environment conservation and to self-empowerment of all the stakeholders. After seeing this movie, let us have a huge round of applause for us for being a part of such a responsible organization. This movie is not only a snapshot of the work done by us, but also sums up the motto of this conclave, which is Kritya Sikartavyata. Moving ahead, now we will start with the technical sessions. It is important to have a brief insight of what these two days of conclave holds for us. To set the context, I would invite Shri B. Sairam, Executive Director, Coal India Limited, on stage. Distinguished guests, speakers and participants, before I elaborate on the context of the conclave, let me tell you that at the end of this two days conclave, the one word that all of you would be uttering is wow. Why I'm saying so and why I'm so confident about this is that we have brought a galaxy of speakers who are the intellectuals in development sector 
and are the masters of their own field. While each of the speaker will be individually introduced by our anchors, I will just speak on the ingredients which, which we have put in this assortment, which we will be serving you in these two days. We have with us Dr. Bhaskar Chatterjee, sir, who is the doyen of Indian mandated CSR. He has an immense grasp on the subject of CSR. When he says, I am quoting, sir, legislation has brought CSR from back room to the boardroom. So this one-liner speaks volumes about the ecosystem of CSR in India. We have Professor Satish Agnihotri with us. He has vast experience in the field of public service, which he is putting to good use now in developing a frugal and disruptive innovation in rural technology, sitting at IIT Mumbai. We have Dr. Shashi Ratnagar Sing, uh, uh, Singh Ji, uh, sitting left to us, whose areas of research are the mechanisms of benefit sharing with community in mining sector and the land conflicts. Uh, incidentally, both these subjects, that is land conflicts as well as uh, benefit sharing with community, they carry a lot of, uh, I mean, uh, relevance to Coal India Limited. We have Sri Amod Kandji, who has done some path-breaking work on empowerment of marginalized children and on protection of child rights. We will be having Mr. Ranjan Mahapatro, who is the director of HR at Indian Oil Corporation Limited, a Maharatna PSU. You must be knowing the famous tagline of uh, Indian oil, Pahle Indian Fear Oil. Over the years, Indian oil has launched some high impact programs like Arugyam, the mobile medical service, Vidushi, the career coaching for girls, and survey Santu Niramaya, the healthcare services. We have with us Wing Commander Anupama Joshi, ma'am. Pehle inho ne, namaste ma'am. Pehle inho ne asman ki bulandiyon ko chhone ka prayas kiya, apna sapna pura kiya, aur uske baad ab jameen se jodne ka sankalp liya hai. She has established micro-credit services for marginalized persons, marginalized people for earning their livelihood. And more than anything else, what she has done is that to make the world realize that it is not only the corporates and big organizations, but these lot of people living on margins who also require this investment capital and working capital. <coughs> we have Mr. Subhranshu Patnaik from Deloitte, who will be deliberating on ESG, the environment, social, and governance. The importance of ESG can be assessed from the very fact that uh, SEBI LODR has made ESG reporting mandatory for the top 1,000 companies by market capitalization. And then we will be having it today evening from 5 to 6, Dr. Arvind Srinivasan from Arvind Eye Care, who will be joining us in virtual mode from Chennai. The name resemblance of Arvind Eye Care and Arvind Srinivasan are just coincidence, and both of them carry the uh, uh, this thing inspiration from Maharshi Arvindo. Today, Arvinda happens to be the biggest eye care service provider in the world, thanks to their uh, scalability and uh, their affordability. The famous thing about Arvinda Eye Care is their assembly line concept. We all know assembly line concept, but there is a difference. In the conventional assembly line, the job is on move and the mechanic or the operator is stationary. Whereas in case of Arvinda Eye Care, the patients are stationary and the entire paramedical and medical team, they are on the move. So this concept will be deliberated by Dr. Arvind Srinivasan today evening. We will be listening to Mr. Saro Rai from Tata Steel. Have you learned about Manasi? Anybody? Is it a CSR project of Tata Steel? So the total, uh, full acronym, the full word is Maternal and Neonatal and Newborn Survival Initiative, M-A-N-S-I, Manasi. This is the flagship project of uh, Tata Steel. And uh, it has gathered the world's attention when one of the Sahiyas, that is the uh, Asha worker from Jharkhand, Ms. Mamata Sahu. She got the opportunity to deliver a talk at a uh, high-level forum in United States, in United States, USA, on the subject of, and how this uh, Manasi project has created positive impact in Sarai Kala block. Then we will be having uh, Dr. Amit Thakurji, who is sitting here. Uh, he's from Terry, 
is a perfect blend of csr sustainability environment and sustainable energy solutions then we will be having uh, dr dhawal bhat from kokila ben hospital mumbai he is a medical practitioner and a social entrepreneur amalgamated into one so he will be enlightening us on his wisdom on how a private uh, hospital can engage itself in the uh, public health care services so with this i am sure that the next 12 deeply engrossing sessions will enable you to gain a deep insight and wisdom on how csr can contribute to the nation's development agenda thank you very much and wishing you some action packed sessions thank you thank you so much sir moving ahead with the first technical session for the for, for the first session on role of civil society organization in governance and csr with huge round of applause i would like to invite shri amod k kant retired ips and general secretary prayas on stage please a former ips officer who has held the post of dgp in goa and arunachal pradesh shri kant founded prayas in 1988 with an aim of restoring the lost childhood of children in need of care and protection and juveniles in conflict with law today prayas has over 1200 centers in 10 states and is serving over 50000 marginalized children youth and women shri kant has played instrumental role in prominent legislations such as juvenile justice act and pa and protection of children against sexual offense posco act he has also prepared the groundwork for a number of institutions related to women and children including the rape crisis intervention center in delhi and the national level child helpline 1098 sir the stage is all yours Uh, thanks for this invite saram saab i'm very thankful to you uh, prashad mr aram prashad you started off with the right note and gave the direction and of course informed what coal india is doing your subsidiaries are doing which is definitely wonderful work being done by you uh, vinay ranjan of course my neighbor from his childhood <laughs> well i think it was very impressive to hear you really and uh, you brought out uh, the essence of what exactly we are supposed to do my guru and mentor bhaskar chaddi ji sir thank you sir i am taking the first session in your place <laughs> and for the reason let me explain to you that uh, uh, there is a body now which i am going to attend a program in the community in ramgarh after this uh, program i am mean, before the program i'll have to go there this is something about jan shikshan sansthan Uh, i was reminding bhaskar sir that uh, way back uh, in 2019 99 2000 uh, before that there was an organizational called shramik vidyapeeth which became and which was a partner organization for the creation of prayas also we converted shramik vidyapeeth into jan shikshan sansthan uh, bhaskar sahab was that time dg nlm and of course i was in police but i was helping him there and that organization had ups and downs it has survived and uh, let me inform you that uh, the prime minister has recently announced 73 jan shikshan sansthans across the country one of them happens to be in ramgarh where i am going to participate and this jan shikshan sansthan uh, is a remarkable organization sir before i talk about the subject i would like to refer to it because there is a big problem of disconnect between the community and the programs between the community between the programs skill development program and the industry as a result uh, annually there are about 1 crore trainees coming out of uh, various programs skill development programs at the national level out of them not more than 8 to 10% find jobs it's a it's a big issue it's a very important area that we must think about and as uh, vinay ji talked about uh, uh, skilling as being the area and the 
target area or perhaps the most important uh, uh, area in which you want to work this year now. Uh, I would like to say and thank you very much, Coal India again, that uh, for nearly 200 youth, you had given a project to Prayas. It was a community-based Prayas uh, project where uh, the community and the youth, they were brought together on the same platform under a Coal India program, 2019-2020. Uh, and the program was a success. And I'm sure that dramatic changes have taken place in the lives of those youth whom we looked after through you. And thank you once again. We are a partner. We remain a partner in the entire activity. Uh, friends, uh, there's a lot to say. In fact, uh, on the issues relating to voluntary organizations, I would like to speak from various angles. Uh, first of all, Prayas itself, uh, as you know that uh, I was in the police, and it was a chance product. 1988, uh, in the city of Delhi, a lot of these children were found without homes. And uh, they came in the contact, or they came in the care of the police officers and voluntary organizations. But there was no place to keep. There was no program as such. And in those times, I'm talking 1980s, we did not have many homes and shelters which were created later. And the Juvenile Justice Act, which was the basic law for children in the country for their protection, for their care, for their rehabilitation, was still taking root. So it was a chance creation. From 1988 till date, uh, now nearly 44 years, this organization has grown far and wide. We have today, friends, about uh, 161 centers in 10 states of India, the latest being Kashmir, where I go frequently. We are served by 684 full-time co-workers. I call them co-workers. They are not employees because they own this organization. There is a very strong and powerful governing body of 25 highly respected people. And this organization runs uh, 38 homes and shelters in these states I am talking about, starting from Andaman Ikwar Islands, where we are running a lot of programs for children, up to Arunachal Pradesh, where we are running primary health centers, community health centers, and a lot of programs for the health under NRHM and otherwise. In between, we have got Bihar, we have got Jharkhand, we have Gujarat, we have a lot of these states where we are working. So this has given us an opportunity to understand, the opportunity to know ki what exactly is the role of voluntary organization in various uh, situations in the, in the context of the national development. See, CSOs have to play a very important role in the, in the national development, in services, particularly concerning the marginalized segments of the society and good governance. Uh, there's a small article which I have shared with uh, the organizers. They might have a look at it. The Indian state, as you know, is an amalgam of a strong, very vibrant, and uninterrupted democratic institutions. We are served by a very powerful steel framework, that is the bureaucratic structure of India. And of course, India's economy is growing. It has grown beyond all limits. And today, as you know, we are the fifth largest economy, perhaps fifth or fourth largest economy in the world. Particularly after 1991 liberal liberalization, privatization, and globalization, the economy has expanded. Now, despite the fact that they are fourth or sixth largest economy of the world, and we happen to be third strongest military power in the world also, our problem is that we are not really correlating ourselves in terms of human development indicators. It is believed that India is 131st in the human development indicators. When we talk about uh, the poverty, when we talk about children, women, variety of issues concerning health, etc., the human development indicators define the real health of a society. And why this uh, dichotomy is there, one has to see. During our COVID times in past two years, uh, nearly 75 million uh, people went down the line in the poverty. They became part of the BPL and all. And on conversely, I mean, this is something uh, which must be understood. Conversely, India had 94 or 98 billion years. Now they are said to be 148 billion years. At the global scale, we have so much of richness, so much of affluence, so much of expansion of our Indian economy in terms of the individuals and the companies becoming so rich and so powerful, in terms of the people becoming poorer. This is something which is very, very important. And the voluntary sector, when I talk about the role of voluntary sector, we are supposed to bridge the gap. This gap between rich and poor, this gap between those who are haves and those who have nots, and the gap between, let's say, those people who become billionaires and the companies who have made it big, and the 
people of India, the poor becoming poorer, it is something which is very, very important. We need to understand. This country has nearly 3.5 million voluntary organizations, as you know, 3.2 million. It, it's a part of a report given to the Supreme Court of India that the exact number of the voluntary organizations who are registered in this country, they happen to be 3.2 million. Well, I think they have, they have a very role, important role to play. When we talk about the, the national scene as a whole, we first of all think about uh, the democratic institutions from panchayat to parliament, elected bodies, they are the masters. We talk about the Indian governance as it operates from Patwari to prime minister, the policeman to prime minister. There is a structure, governance a structure which is very, very important. They rule the country, they run this country. In their hands is not only today's development process, but the entire destiny of the country. And of course, the India's economy, the market economy, which according to us is the third very, very important sector. And now being the fourth or sixth largest economy in the world, they have a role to play. Now, the fourth sector, the fourth sector of India's development process, which on the one hand combines with the democratic institutions, on the other side, they have to work with the government and the political masters also. They happen to be the voluntary organization, these 3.2 million voluntary organizations. See, the India's political situation, the India's political hierarchy or political system is such which is generally caste and community driven. They have their own agenda. So far as socio-economic profile is concerned and socio-economic conditions are concerned, the, the political masters and the political workers are not exactly so much conversant with that. So we need, we need those organizations, those individuals and those voluntary organizations particularly emanating from the ground who understand the society as much, let's say our political workers, uh, as our masters, as our democratic institutions they do. So voluntary sector has a very important role to play. That's the point I'm trying to make. The time has gone when we were just charity. The Gandhian system of uh, work, I mean the selfless work completely, dependent on charity, or probably something where we are not exactly supposed to play as part and parcel of governmental structure is something which is, uh, which is to be transformed into a management type of voluntary system where we should be transparent, we should be responsive, we should be inclusive, and we should be accountable with whatever we do. And especially when we are talking about the CSR, corporate social responsibility, or the money coming from foreign sources, or the money, money coming from uh, the government under the various schemes and projects, we are supposed to be giving account of it. Unless we are accountable for all that we are getting. We are accountable to community, we are accountable to law, we are accountable to various companies from whom the money is coming, we are accountable to the government. So that kind of accountability or that kind of responsiveness to the community also is something which is very, very important. Whether voluntary organizations can create an alternative path of governance and alternate, alternative path of development, it is something to be seen. You might be aware about Bangladesh. Bangladesh one time used to have world's largest voluntary organizations. Something called Bangladesh Rural Advancement Committee, something called Gramin Bank. I had two, three opportunities to visit those places. Maybe Bhaskar Bhai might have gone there and seen the Bangladesh organizations. I mean, one organization has, let's say, 15 lakh children, or 15 lakh youth doing programs. India doesn't have that kind of organizations. But that was the time, I'm talking about 20 years back, when I had a chance to visit Gramin Bank and BRAC in Bangladesh. In those times, the government of Bangladesh, or the state of Bangladesh, was not so strong and development oriented. Today, things are different. These organizations remain. They are working with the government. But now today, the government of Bangladesh has become far more conscious of people's needs and poverty. As you know that uh, the human development indicators on that chart indices, Bangladesh is superior to India. It's not a good thing happening. I mean, Bangladesh is nowhere compared to India. Nepal is nowhere compared to India. Pakistan and Sri Lanka are nowhere compared to India. But when you look at the human development indicators, if we happen to be 131 out of 189 states, Bangladesh is better. They are about 100 or something. Not the best, but of course they are better. So this is something, you know, which is, uh, which is a matter of thought that uh, why it is happening, why this gap is there, and who is going to fill the gap. In my opinion, in the considered opinion of various people who serve the voluntary organizations, it is the role of the voluntary organizations to do it. 
nearly 25 to 30 percent Indians happen to be below poverty line. I mean, the earning as you look at it. And they happen to be there, and the number is not really reducing, although in our reports we saw it. One, one I would like to refer to one of the latest reports, that is national education policy, as you know. National education policy, uh, while it was being drafted, uh, during the drafting period, sir, I had a chance to have a look at the draft. There was a figure that in India, there are 62 million children who do not go to school. That information was there in the draft of the national education policy. Aap log jante honge national education policy, 2020 mein jo bana hai, bahut hi document hai, bahut behtereen document hai, bahut achhi planning hai, naye dhang se pure education ko develop kiya ja raha hai. To sir, jis samay, when I saw this number 62 million, I met HRD minister, Mr. Nishank. I told him that these 62 million children who don't go to school happen to be our clients. They happen to be our children because Priyas works for them. And a lot of voluntary organizations work for them. We generally think that in India there are 35 million children who happen to be children in need of care and protection. In India there are about 32, 20 million children who are orphans without family support, without any kind of support from any, any sources. I mean, they are on the streets. They are homeless children, they are lost children, they are that kind of children. So I said that these children who are not going to school, majority of them happen to be that kind of children. When the report finally came, then uh, before that, I got a call from his office and they wanted to have a small note from me, which I gave. And that note came, came as it is in the national education policy, where they admitted that there are 32 million children who happen to be socio-economically deprived groups. And the source is, uh, NSSO 75, 75th round, which talks about this thing. 2017-18 ka ye document hai. To ye ek badi important baat hai ki itni badi sankhya mein bachche hamare desh mein garib hai, be sahara hai, bina ghar ke hai, school nahi ja sakte hai. Right to free and compulsory education happens to be a dream for them. So these are very important points jisko ki hum loon ko karna padega and I think the voluntary organizations, 3.2 million of them, they are the ones who are supposed to do it. Corporate social responsibility, just ki hum yaha baat kar rahe hain, it comes as a boon to us. Sir, aap ne bataya abhi, uh, Vinay sahab ne, 20,000 crores, pichle saal kharch hua. 20,000 crores, I mean the total amount that comes to according to our calculation, Bhaskar bhai batayenge iske baare mein, is about 24, 25,000 crores. If we are able to get that kind of money, the organizations who are into direct services, the organizations who happen to be in the social sector, voluntary sector, Health, education, poverty elevation, environment, children, women, disabled, socially deviant. These are the classes of people, you know, who happen to be the main recipient, who claim to be the main recipients of our CSR funds. If this 24,000 crores go to the organizations who have the capacity to serve, who know how to work on the ground, I think it would be a real boon. It's not happening. In fact, last year, as you know, sir, that nearly 10,000 crores went to PM care. I mean, I have nothing against PM care. In the Honorable Prime Minister has done a lot of excellent work. The program in which I am going just now is the, is the product of Prime Minister's announcement, Jan Shikshan Sansthan in Ramgarh. But it happens to be true that uh, this entire CSR fund should ultimately go to those kind of organizations who are into direct services. Let me inform you, sir, that when there were high-powered committee constituted in Ministry of Corporate Affairs, I had a chance to make presentation there also. We learned that a lot of UN organizations were getting CSR fund. Lot of money of CSR in the private sector particularly, not in the public sector, not in organizations like Coal India. It was going back to the same people in, in the form of foundations and trust. This is a very big कि बड़े जो कंपनीज हैं वो अपने फाउंडेशन बनाते हैं अपने ट्रस्ट बनाते हैं पैसा अपने पास रख लेते हैं वो पैसा नहीं जाता है उस पर्पस के जिसके लिए बना हुआ है तो ये एक बहुत बड़ा एक सवाल है कि इसको हम कैसे इसको इसको दूर करें और किस ढंग से हम इसमें ऐसे पॉलिसीज बनाए प्लान्स बनाए जिसमें कि हम इसको कर पाएं मैं इसकी बात नहीं करूंगा कि सीएसआर कैसे होना चाहिए किस ढंग से उसको डिस्ट्रीब्यूट करना चाहिए भास्कर साहब बताएंगे इसके बारे में मोटी सी बात मैं ये कहना चाहता हूं कि सीएसआर फंड मस्ट गो to the voluntary organizations who are into services. This is a very important thing that we need to understand. Now, when we talk about the, the areas and the vision, the vision is well laid down. Indian constitution is so clear. We talk about freedom. We talk about justice. And justice, of course, is economic, cultural, social, political justice. So this kind of justice is, will become a myth if we are not able to take care of the economic deprivations. 
those who are deprived and poor, those who are have nots, particularly in those areas where we talk about these children and women and disabled, elderly, all those kind of people. I think these are the areas where we are supposed to work. Profile badal raha hai. Voluntary organizations ka profile badal raha hai aur badalna chahiye. 32 lakh organization ki baat mein kar raha tha. Abhi 32 lakh organization mein nearly 1.3 lakh organizations have joined in Darpan portal. Aap tu jaanti hoong Darpan portal ek requirement hai jismein ki wo support nahi mil sakta hai government ka jab tak ki Darpan portal jo niti ayog ka hai usmein aap enroll na hoong. This is for the voluntary organizations. So the number is increasing. We are already there, 1.3 lakh is a good number now. A time will come when 5 lakh organizations will go on the open portal. So we have a change in the budget, schemes, programs, we have to work on that. They have to look into areas of deprivation, that is government, government needs the NGOs for programs. Majority of schemes and programs of government are being done through voluntary organizations. जो पहले था कि सोशल सेक्टर प्रोजेक्ट में जो गवर्नमेंट स्कीम को इम्प्लीमेंट कर रही है उसके आउटकम आउटकम को हम देखते हैं तो लगता है कि बहुत सारी चीज नहीं हो पा रही है गैप बहुत बड़ा होता है वॉलंटियर ऑर्गेनाइजेशंस गैप को फुल कर सकती है पीपल्स पार्टिसिपेशन हम लोगों से जुड़े हुए हैं द वॉलंटियर ऑर्गेनाइजेशन इफ इट इज ट्रू टू इट स्पिरिट एंड कैरेक्टर हैज टू इमर्ज फ्रॉम द पीपल हैज टू इमर्ज फ्रॉम द कम्युनिटी सो ऑब्वियसली वी आर एज क्लोज टू द कम्युनिटी एज प्रोबेबली द पोलिटिकल वर्कर्स हु हैपन टू आर एम एल एज एंड एम पीज सो दिस इज द the limitations of bureaucracy. A bureaucracy has a character and that character has to be there. And they have a role to play. They are rule bound. They have a variety of limitations. And there, of course, the voluntary organizations are able to fill those gaps. And of course, corruption, inefficiency, unresponsiveness is common everywhere in the government, outside government. But we are not supposed to be that. Voluntary organizations are supposed to be more motivated, more idealistic, and of course, responsive to the core. One small point I would like to mention, sir, this is about the law again. 1860, following the first war of independence in 1857, as you know, three very important things occurred. One, of course, was India's education system created by Macaulay. Second was the area where I worked, the criminal justice system. Indian Penal Court came, CRPC came. India created the criminal justice system. And surprisingly, sir, 1860 <laughs> is the year when Society Registration Act was passed. I mean, it's a matter for thought. Why after India's first war of independence called Sepoy Mutiny, we created a society registration act, and that remains true even now. So it is outdated. The point I'm trying to make that the damn thing is outdated, and we are supposed to create a different kind of situation where new regulation should come, new kind of system should come. We have brought a lot of changes. Thanks to Bhaskar Bhai kind of people, CSR has come off way. And of course, a lot of things happening in Niti Ayog. But there is a need for change. In 2007, let me, <coughs> let me inform you, friends, there was a draft national policy on voluntary sector. And draft policy, of course, uh, took note of weaknesses also and the strengths of uh, the various voluntary sector organizations. As we said, that majority of 3.2 million organizations uh, did not respond to the people's felt needs. They became like contractors, as you know. So results were not there. One time, you mentioned about one-time contribution, not giving result, not creating impact. So that was something which was, which was understood during our own study in 2007 in Planning Commission when we tried to create national policy. Larger picture generally was missing out. People didn't know what the country means in the country, what the country means, 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 it was an uncertainty, and it is also in volunteer organization, even in organization like Prayas, for example. I told you we are running 164 centers, we have nearly 700 employees, we are running 38 homes and shelters, 60 vocational training centers. One doesn't know which one we can run for how long, because these organizations cannot create funds. We are not a business house. We are not supposed to be economically productive in that sense, in terms of funds and resources. So obviously that remains a problem. One major development took place which I would like to mention. See, in 2018, the Prime Minister of India was somewhere talked to about uh, the voluntary organizations not being in contact with the government during the present government. So something was created called Civil Society Organizations Standing Committee, Niti Ayog. This body has almost all the leading organizations of the country. And of course, as I mentioned to you, 1.3 lakh Darpan portal 
uh, increase also had been made. This standing committee has six, seven important terms of reference which I would like to refer to you. Identification of areas where CSOs can be engaged for service delivery. Forum to deliberate major issues. The, the Niti Aayog's body, CSO is standing. I just close it. Can I speak for five minutes more? Okay. Hmm. So second point in this uh, standing committee created by Government of India through Niti Aayog was that it should become a forum to deliberate various issues and challenges, challenges like this that we are discussing today, suggest improvement in policies and programs the government, then implementation of various schemes and programs where voluntary organizations are supposed to participate. Then of course, there should be a synergy. A synergy was supposed to be created between the service delivery organizations, of course, people and the government. The last one was very important where I have been working especially, and that is 115 aspirational districts. You must have heard about it. They used to be called most backward districts earlier. The Honorable Prime Minister named it 115 aspirational districts. And last, the very important youth of Kashmir. Considering the extraordinary situation of Kashmir, a particular point was made about Kashmir. Where I go frequently, and recently I went there, uh, we had a meeting with 60 voluntary organizations along with Government of India's various departments and ministries. We are trying to develop something called Joint Action Plan. This Joint Action Plan is to associate the voluntary organizations of Kashmir with various programs of the government. There are some of the issues I thought I'll mention. And uh, uh, in terms of the futuristic uh, goals of India, there's something called Sustainable Development Goals, as you know. At the global level, we have got 17 goals uh, where India is not doing very well, but of course, we are trying our best. These 17 goals, uh, the Honorable Prime Minister thought thoughtfully, very thoughtfully, he decided to convert these goals into three parts. One was the vision, his own vision, and the vision through Niti Aayog, 15-year vision, which is started in 2015, seven-year strategic plans, and three-year action plan. These are things Sunobis did. We have been watching, not myself, but the Niti Aayog, and of course at the level of the Prime Minister of India, they are trying to see whether these goals are being met. And these goals become like beacon lights for us, like the vision for us. Uh, well, I'm very sorry to say that whenever we take account of these goals and the achievement in terms of human development indicators, because these 17 are the real goals which bring about the basic changes in life to people, the socio-economic condition of the people. There we aren't doing very well, but of course, we are very serious about it. When it comes to the governance part of it, which is very important for any kind of CSR partnership also, there of course, we, we can function. The voluntary organizations can function as advocates for the weaker people. They can function like watchdogs for the human rights. That's their job they do. At times, well, I think under inverted commas, as agitators for the aggrieved people, where problems are coming up mobilizes for public opinion. There are a variety of things that they can do. So broad, broadly speaking, I would like to say that in the present context where we are having a government we are, which is very powerful, very strong, trying to bring about change, we are having a parliament of various state governments where changes are taking place, we are having a very powerful economy. There is a gap, there is a big gap, and that gap has to be filled up by the voluntary organizations. This is broadly I'm trying to say CSR, I would like to only say that there is a real need, there is a real requirement that whenever we create partnerships in the CSR, something that you spoke, Vinayji, was really model. Because unless you understand what's happening on the ground, unless you are able to do a need assessment, unless you connect yourself with the people who need your services, who need your support, CSR will not, will, will not succeed. And CSR has to be essentially in terms of services, in terms of those kind of organizations and people who are working on the ground. An area, of course, as you know, uh, I'd like to just conclude by saying that there is a term called social sector, variety of activities like health, education, poverty, elevation, et cetera, et cetera. Segmented children, women, disabled, elderly, et cetera, et cetera. This is social sector and this is voluntary sector. They interface. I mean, there's no difference really. The voluntary organizations are supposed to work for them. Voluntary organizations can work from policy to grassroots levels, but I am representing the grassroots level voluntary organizations. And thank you very much once again. Thanks to you. Thank you.
thank you sir so it was a wonderful uh, session uh, so just to summarize uh, what mr khan said uh, some of the key uh, highlights of his speech uh, so he mentioned about the gap you know disconnect between uh, you know various uh, government you know government programs and skill development programs and the industry uh, he started off with shabik vidyapeet which started at in uh, 1967 in worli it is now a uh, junction instruction sangstan uh, 271 uh, units across india he spoke about uh, skill development uh, programs by various institutions including government 8 to 10% of uh, such uh, people who have been skilled are actually employable that's one of the concerns he mentioned uh, he started off with prayas uh, we started in 1988 uh, 164 centers uh, and uh, then also he spoke about india's rank in the sdi in, uh, index which is currently 131 compared to bangladesh which is around 100 and uh, you know there are 3.2 million voluntary organizations which is the fourth sector which has a very important role to play in the nation building uh, there also he mentioned about right to education uh, the national education policy 2020 is being aligned to kind of align with some of these needs uh, there is 24000 crores almost uh, worth of csr funds that are uh, you know allocated uh, based on the collection from the various uh, companies across india so how that can be linked to the voluntary organizations and uh, also he mentioned about transparency that is being uh, driven by the voluntary organizations uh, 1.3 lakh organizations have already registered in the darpan portal uh, there is a there is a need for a uh, connect between the government the bureaucracy and the voluntary organizations there is a standing committee which was created in cso standing committee in niti ayog where there are 6 to 7 areas which include synergy creation 115 aspiration district development and youth in kashmir and last he mentioned about sdg the 17 goals and how the government has kind of uh, come out with a three year action plan and there needs to be more concerted effort towards uh, you know you know the development across india thank you sir i think it was a wonderful uh, session uh, so maybe i think what we'll do is we'll have a quick round of questions from the audience i will start off with a my question for you uh, uh, my question please is that please carry on yeah. please carry on my question is that coal india is working in the remotest uh, areas in india mm -hmm. in terms of uh, mining uh, as virendra uh, uh, jain sir mentioned about you know jharkhand odisha and bihar these are the three uh, poorest states in india and coal india has its three of its uh, subsidiaries working in jharkhand so how do you see uh, you know the role of csos especially in these states because skilling because ra education and uh, you know health and sanitization and these are very important areas so how do you think how do you feel that what should be the modus operandi of the various organizations working in this uh, to kind of grow on the development path see coal india has already created uh, a model in my opinion and i know it because i have worked with coal india project we have done with coal india and they were very very successful project because ultimately uh, the problems are there and issues are there and more the remote communities and more the marginalized kind of people more is the problem which is quite visible it's not invisible and coal india's uh, various organizations set up you know in the remote places uh, they know very well what are ha what's happening in the communities so there uh, to solve the problems of the community in terms of their health need in terms of their poverty alleviation programs in terms of preparing the youth and uh, very beautifully vinay ji talked about migration you spoke about migration that why, why migration takes place uttarakhand is a living example jahan palayan shabd ki baat hoti hai aap uttarakhand mein chale jao har aadmi palayan ki baat karta hai and the state is not a success story by any standards so there uh, in jharkhand particularly if people migrate most of the migration is distress migration people like us i worked i belong to bihar i am in delhi but it is not in migration in that sense distress migration is on account of socio economic compulsions and those compulsions have to be responded it is the job and mind you an organization like coal india with such elaborate structure elaborate presence in the remotest places small places where everything is needed i think you have a ready made community ready made situation ready made problem which have to be responded 
and you are doing it very well. Thank you. So the second question is around uh, the connect between civil society organizations and the government and the states, I would say the bureaucracy. You mentioned about the standing committee, but uh, there was an article I was reading which said that, you know, there need to be more forums where these all of these three come together and the programs are designed accordingly. So what is your thought on, on th in that line? Uh, this particular body in which I have been member coordinator since the beginning yeah. represents the largest organizations of the country, including four biggest charities also, they are there. Uh, well, I think we find that uh, the kind of connectivity at all levels, let's say district level, for example. For example, at the district level, district magistrate is the key person. I mean, he's a big man and, of course, controls everything. But so many things are there with him that he is not able to. I mean, his office and his, uh, let's say, uh, brother offices and sister offices, they are not able to connect themselves with the people. So that disconnect which I am talking, see, India's story of the marginalized and poor, India's story of uh, deprivation in the midst of affluence, in the midst of such big things happening, is primarily on account of disconnects. One disconnect I told you, Industry skill disconnect, which I informed about 8 to 10 percent employment. The community government or the community CSR disconnect. Education skill disconnect, you understand that. Now I was telling Bhaskar Bhai just now that this combination, combination of a skill with education under one minister, one ministry is a remarkable thing. And national education policy takes care of those things. So these are the kinds of disconnects which have to be responded, which have to be corrected. Uh, I mean, integrated means integrated. Today, it is uh, a money or let's say an amount which goes to CSR amount that goes to a voluntary organization. It is no more charity. It is not no, no, no more a gift or a dole. It has to be a partnership. Very appropriately, Coal India has decided now that at those levels, wherever you are carrying out CSR projects, it will no more be just giving it out to somebody, to a voluntary organization, to a service provider, to let's say training provider, whoever but it will be a joint program. You should be partners in the action, and that kind of partnership has to be equal and integrated, okay? Sure. Any questions from the audience? Yes, sir. Namaskar, sir. I'm Arun Nurao, independent director. Thank you, Arun. Former hmm. police officer. In 2014, I took a voluntary retirement and I was working with Jharkhand. Sir, you told me a very good way to tell you about it. एक चुनौती की तरफ सरकार ध्यान लाना चाहता हूँ और सरकार गाइडेंस भी चाहिए सर ईसीएल इलाके में सारे सब्सिडीज में ईसीएल हम लोगों को थोड़ा नीचे ले जा रहा है उसकी मूल वजह है ईसीएल के कुछ चार गांवों के लोग आदिवासी संताल गांव के लोग उन्होंने माइनिंग के लिए मना कर दिया है और वहाँ ईसीएल का कोई एम्प्लॉय नहीं जा सकता एडमिनिस्ट्रेशन के लोग नहीं जा सकते पब्लिक रिप्रेजेंटेटिव नहीं जा सकते मैं भी गया था कुछ बातचीत किया मुझे जो समझ में आया सर कि जो सी एस आर के काम हुए वो उतनी आ, आ, अच्छे तरीके से नहीं हो पाया और ये जो चुनौती है ट्राइबल इलाके में उनको लगना कि हमारे इलाके से कोयला निकाल के हमारी ज़िंदगी अंधकार में तो कुछ उनके डिमांड्स वगैरह हैं लेकिन ये जो रिश्ता है हमारा कम कोल कंपनियों का और वहाँ के रैयतों का उसमें ऐसा डिस्टेंस बढ़ जाना ये सिर्फ ना ई में है ये मुझे और भी जगह दिख रहा है झारखंड में बड़ी चुनौती है सर सी एस आर या अन्य माध्यमों के मार्फत कैसे इस रिश्ते को थोड़ा और मजबूत हम लोग बना सकते हैं अरुण आपने एक बहुत ही एक, एक खास चीज़ को आपने पॉइंट आउट किया जिसको आपको सॉल्व करना ही पड़ेगा आपके पास चॉइस नहीं है अगर आप ये देख रहे हैं कि वहाँ की कॉम्बैट जाओ प्लीज वहाँ की कॉम्युनिटी वहाँ की कॉम्युनिटी ऐसी है जिससे आपका रास्ता ऐसा नहीं है कि आप काम कर सकें काम उनके लिए है एम्प्लॉयमेंट उनको मिलेगा इकोनॉमी उनकी बेहतर होगी सपोर्ट उनको आप देंगे फिर भी आप नहीं कर पा रहे हैं तो ये जो गैप है ये गैप शायद इसलिए है मैं आपको सही कर रहा हूँ ये गैप शायद इसलिए है कि उस कम्युनिटी के उस इलाके के जो नेचुरल लीडर्स हैं मैं पॉलिटिकल लीडर्स की बात नहीं कर रहा हूँ मैं प्योरली ए पोलिटिकल लीडर्स की बात कर रहा हूँ पोलिटिकल लीडरशिप के अलावा लीडर्स होते हैं आप समझ रहे हैं मेरी बात जो कॉम्युनिटी के नेचुरल लीडर्स होते हैं कम्युनिटी के नेचुरल लीडर्स होते हैं नेचुरल ग्रुप्स होते हैं उनको आपको कन्विंस करना पड़ेगा और बताना पड़ेगा कि ये उनके इंटरेस्ट में आप ये काम करने वाले हैं सी एस आर कुड भी ए मीडियम कुड भी ए सपोर्ट बिकॉज दे नीड द मनी पैसा तो चाहिए उनको पैसा आप सी एस आर के माध्यम से दे सकते हैं 
और उनको ये समझा सकते हैं कि उनके कम्युनिटी के प्रॉब्लम को सॉल्व करने के लिए आप कर रहे हैं मैं कश्मीर का एग्जांपल दे रहा हूं आपको कश्मीर में हर आदमी जानता है हिंदुस्तान में क्या हो रहा है किस ढंग का भयानक डिस्कनेक्ट है गवर्नमेंट और लोगों के बीच में वहाँ के सबसे बड़े साठ ऑर्गेनाइजेशन सी वहाँ के उनसे मेरी बहुत ही ज़्यादा दोस्ती इसके बावजूद मैं पुलिस ऑफिसर रहा हूँ वो जानते हैं मैं पुलिस में था इसके बावजूद भी अभी मैं गया दो दिन के लिए गया चालीस ऑर्गेनाइजेशन हमारे साथ थे और वो लोग हमारे साथ काम कर रहे हैं क्योंकि जिस ढंग से वो सोच रहे हैं जिस ढंग से वो सोच रहे हैं उस ढंग की सोच सरकार की नहीं है शायद गवर्नमेंट अलग सोच रही है वो अलग सोच रहे हैं लेकिन मिनी मीटिंग पॉइंट तो होता ही है मीटिंग पॉइंट वही होता है जहाँ उनके इंटरेस्ट को कम्युनिटी के इंटरेस्ट को लोगों के इंटरेस्ट को आप समझ पाएँ उनके इंटरेस्ट को आप समझ जाएंगे तो उनके एस्पिरेशन को भी आप पूरा कर सकते हैं तो मैं समझता हूँ कि दी ओनली पाथ एंड द ओनली वे यू कैन एक्सेस दैम इज थ्रू देयर इकोनमी एंड देयर हार्ट्स which i think only leaders from the community and the groups which are active in the community can do it aapko create karna padega unse relationship thank you any last question because sir we are uh, i know and we are getting yeah, late any last question uh, yes ji farmaiye um regarding the national education policy you said so there's um, uh, we have introduced skill as part of it which you mentioned but don't you think so there is a gap between from what you do in school versus what will be offered in college and are we prepared for that kind of a uh, employment scheme so you being a thought leader um aisa kyun nahi hota ki why do we not change policies why do we stick to only um one level and do not follow it up with the other level देखिए मैं नेशनल एजुकेशन पॉलिसी का गवर्नमेंट की बहुत सारी पॉलिसी का मैं हिमायती नहीं हूँ बहुत सारी चीज़ें गवर्नमेंट पे हो रही हैं जो शायद हम लोग को अपील नहीं करता हूँ मैं प्योरली बात कर रहा हूँ वॉल्ट्री सेक्टर की तरफ से लोगों की तरफ से लेकिन नेशनल एजुकेशन पॉलिसी एक काफ़ी न्यूट्रल डॉक्यूमेंट है और बहुत सारी चीज़ें जो पहले नहीं थी वो उसमें लाई गई हैं स्किल की बात आप कर रही थी अब शुरू से ही स्टार्टिंग फ्राम दिक्कस स्टैंडर्ड सिक्स स्टैंडर्ड के बाद से लेकर के आगे तक दे इज़ ए कॉन्टिनूम और वो जो कॉन्टिनूम है या वो जो पूरा का पूरा प्रोसेस है उस पूरे प्रोसेस में जो अब तक के हमारे रिक्वायरमेंट्स थे जो हमारे एजुकेशन को अनप्रोडक्टिव बनाती थी हमारे एजुकेशन के थ्रू लाइवलीहुड क्रिएट नहीं होता था सोसाइटी से डिसकनेक्ट नहीं था कल्चर से अलग हो रहे थे लोकल प्रॉब्लम्स अलग हो रहे थे लैंग्वेज अलग हो रहे थे वो तमाम चीज़ों को शामिल किया गया है हम सिर्फ इतनी बात कहने की कोशिश कर रहे हैं स्किलिंग एंड एजुकेशन दिस कम्बाइन इज ए वेरी पावरफुल फैक्टर इन द नेशनल एजुकेशन पॉलिसी विच शुड बी प्रमोटेड और स्कूल में भी होगा ये ये सिर्फ स्कूल जितने भी ऑर्गेनाइज जैसे मैं जनशिक्षण संस्थान की बात कर रहा था 330 जनशिक्षण संस्थान कंट्री में हैं 75 अभी प्राइम मिनिस्टर ने नया लॉन्च किया और ये सारे के सारे कॉम्युनिटी के ऑर्गेनाइजेशन हैं जबकि प्रॉब्लम ये हो रहा है स्किल डेवलपमेंट में कि अधिकतर इंडस्ट्री लेड ऑर्गेनाइजेशन ने को मिले दे वे फ्लाई बाय नाइट वो आए और गए उनका कम्युनिटी सिस्टा कोई नहीं था रिजल्ट ये हुआ कि उन बच्चों का क्या हुआ जैसे एक करोड़ बच्चे साल में ट्रेन हुए उनमें से उनका फ्यूचर क्या हुआ वो उनको नहीं पता है पहले क्या था वो उनको नहीं पता है लेकिन कम्युनिटी बेस्ड ऑर्गेनाइजेशन को मालूम होता है इसलिए मैं इस बात को कह रहा हूँ एजुकेशन में नेशनल एजुकेशन पॉलिसी में इसकी जगह है बस इतनी बात मैं कह रहा हूँ थैंक यू थैंक यू सर आई थिंक वंडरफुल प्लीज कैरी ऑन थैंक यू थैंक यू वील है वेस्ट डायरेक्टर पर्सनल सेंट्रल कोल फील्ड लिमिटेड श्री पी वी के आर मल्लिकार्जुन राव टू प्लीज कम अप ऑन द स्टेज एंड फेलिसिटेट आर फर्स्ट स्पीकर श्री अमोद के कंट विद मोमेंटो उत्तरी एंड अ पर्सनलाइज फ्रेम Thank you, sir. Thank you. 
knowledge is experience combined with ability knowledge is the power to empower with these words i would like to introduce our next speaker dr bhaskar chatterjee retired ias former secretary dpe for a session on recent amendments and changes in csr regime with a big round of applause please welcome dr bhaskar chatterjee on stage a former civil servant of great distinction dr chatterjee is widely acknowledged as the primary force for bringing a new paradigm to the realm of csr and providing it with an innovative and strategic vision he was instrumental in framing and issuing the csr guidelines for public sector enterprises in april 2010 thereafter he played a major role in inclusion of section 135 in the companies act of 2013 and in the framing of the rules thereafter he has also spearheaded the national foundation for csr as the director general and ceo of indian institute of corporate affairs he is a widely acclaimed practitioner a theorist and a teacher in the fields of csr sustainability and human resources his recent book sustainable futures imperatives for managing the social agenda focuses on the synergy of governments corporates civil society for a sustainable humanistic and inclusive development sir the stage is now yours yes so just go back to the introductory slide yeah <laughs> mr prasad mr ranjan my very dear friend and colleague of many years and perhaps the most humane policeman that this country has produced mr ramod kant uh distinguished invitees independent directors mr thakur fellow uh, csr practitioners ladies and gentlemen uh let me at the very outset uh, thank coal india and central coal fields for giving me this opportunity to be with all of you here this morning and to be able to address you on some of the very important changes that have recently happened in the CSR field so that many of you uh might first understand what these changes are what the context of those changes are why they have been brought in and to begin with therefore let me try and introduce to you that when we were writing the law uh you know that the law was actually passed in uh, december of 2013 but the fact is and this is important for public sector what is the date from which modern csr in india starts and this is important also for students of csr what is the date on which modern csr in india begins and the fact is that that date happens to be the 1st of april 2000 and not 13 not 14 but which year 2010 why 2010 because that is the date on which the first ever guidelines on csr were issued for public sector organizations the story of modern indian csr does not begin with corporate india in the private sector it begins with government organizations and the idea was to show that charity must begin at home if we are going to ask the private sector to do csr first we must be able to say it is the government sector which has been brought under a set of guidelines and then we shall talk about private sector and when we were conceiving the csr law and this was around 2011 
we conceived of CSR, and this is what I want you to put into your minds, as a triangle. What is that triangle? At the apex of that triangle is the government. The government's role being regulatory, but also a facilitator. The government is not just to squeeze our throats, but to facilitate the process of CSR. At the base of that triangle lies two things. One side, the corporate, public or private. What does it do? It sources funds, it directs, it outsources programs, it oversees, it evaluates, it monitors. This is what the corporate side does. The last of the vertices is indeed the sector that Amol Saab represents, civil society organizations. The three of them together constitute CSR. Take out one, CSR is gone. There is no CSR. And I was questioned meticulously on this point. Why have you conceived of CSR in this triadic fashion? And the answer was this, that corporate India is corporate India. What is happening, and this is what Amod Saab just said, at the very, 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 very grassroots in the communities is known to whom? Is known to those who live, work, believe, and literally work with the people in the communities at the grassroots. And they are our civil society organizations. So CSR was conceived in this triangular, pyramidical fashion. The second important thing was, where is CSR at the time when we were writing the law? And it was pretty much an intermittent activity. I'm feeling good today, so let's do some CSR. We should help some people, let's do some CSR. Now that is not consistent, it is intermittent. We had to go from this feel-good so-called philanthropic approach to what we now know as strategic CSR. Why strategic? Because today, CSR is about how we strategize so that we make the last mile connect and people who really need help are the ones who get it. We also had another concept which was mentioned by Sairam, who happened to be my student at the NTPC School of Management. It's a famous chatterjeeism, if I may say so, to bring CSR from the back room to the board room. These independent directors who we see here, why would they ever apply their minds on CSR if CSR never came to the board? Why do we have a CSR committee of the chairman of whom generally is always an independent director? Why? Why did I write that? Because CSR is not to be politicized. It must be an independent activity. It must not be directed by the families of the promoters. It is a professional activity to be done by professionals and practitioners. And to protect that, we made the CSR committee and wrote it not in the rules, but under section 135 itself. It is therefore a law which you cannot break. If you read section 135, the most important words that you will see are shall, 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 shall. There are no wills. Why did I repeatedly use the word shall? Because it does not give you 
a way out. And so over these last eight years, what I generally wrote as a relatively flexible law, today with the introduction of the CSR II form, CSR has become very much a compliance issue also. Very strict compliance by the Ministry of Corporate Affairs. And what I will share with you today are the set of rules that have come in January of two, uh, last year, which tell you more about the kind of oversight that the Ministry will have over CSR, and to also answer some of the questions that still remained in the minds of practitioners after the law and the rules came into being. Mr. Ranjan spoke about taxes, and I like that, and I'll spend one minute of it. The reason he said was, when we were introducing the law, many corporates said, Agar sarkar ke paas paise nahi hai, to 2% ka tax hi laga dijiye. Ye CSR humare sar ke upar kyon thop rahe hai? And the answer to that was very simple. We said, aapke paise hume zururat nahi hai. The total expenditure on CSR comes to around 22,000 crores a year. The budget of one ministry of the Government of India, Rural Development Ministry, is 1 lakh crores. So, aapke paise hume nahi chahiye. Lekin, aapke 2% of profit se, desh ka bhala kare. What was the rise of Detra? What was the reason for the law? Why does India have a law? No other country has it. Why suddenly did someone decide that there should be a law for this nation on CSR? Why? What's the jad? Kya hai? Kya zurut thi? Log to kar rahe the. And corporates would go on telling me, Kya chatterji sahab? Hum to pushto se CSR kar rahe hai. I have never met a corporate who did not tell me ki prior to the legislation bhi hum CSR kar rahe the. Zarur kar rahe honge, kisi ne mana to nahi kiya. Lekin fir bhi hum ne legislation kyo banaya? Because informal CSR is not strategic CSR. The idea was to completely change the concept from end to end. One last comment before I get on to this. What is CSR? Now, every person who is sitting here can ask me, Dr. Chatterjee, you are the Prime Minister of the Bharat Sarkar in an air-conditioned chamber, you have written the law of CSR in CSR. But aapne kahi ye nahi kaha. What is CSR? Government expects us to do CSR. Law mein bataiye CSR kaha, what is the definition? Rule mein bataiye, what is the definition? Shriman Bhaskar Chatterji, aapne pure law mein, pure rule mein, kahi bhi, ये नहीं बताया कि सीएसआर है क्या वस्तु आप कहां के पंडित हैं जिन्होंने बताया ही नहीं क्या व्याख्या ही नहीं किया कि है क्या व्हाट्स द आंसर टू दैट क्वेश्चन व्हाई डिड आई नॉट डिफाइन सीएसआर एंड द रीजन इज Definitions are a problem. If I ask one after the other in the front row, what is CSR? Every one of you will give me a different definition. Even if we finally make a definition and I put it on the screen, every lawyer and every other human being will interpret that definition in a different manner. Fulane shabd ka fulana arth hai. 
आपके लिए लेकिन आपके बगल वाले व्यक्ति के लिए उसका अर्थ अलग है सो देन वॉट इज सी एस आर अगर कहीं कहा ही नहीं गया तो जो हमारे इंडिपेंडेंट डायरेक्टर हैं और जो सी एस आर कमेटी के जो चीफ हैं वो क्या करेंगे जब कहीं लिखा ही नहीं है कि सी एस आर क्या है वो जाएंगे शेड्यूल सेवन एंड द एक्ट एंड द रूल सिंपली स्टेट एनी एक्टिविटी विच इज डन अंडर शेड्यूल सेवन इज सी एस आर दैट्स ऑल सो दे इज जस्ट दैट शेड्यूल सेवन ऑल द सब्जेक्ट आर लिस्टेड देर वॉट यू डू इन इट इज सी एस आर ओके नाउ गिवन दैट बैकग्राउंड let's try and see what are the recent amendments that have come about in the law and why have they come now you can see that way back 2014 15 to what has happened now the quantum of csr expenditure has grown sky high next slide please this is the rationale behind the changes now this is 22nd january 2021 and they have become effective from the date on which the rules were actually issued all right next please सिविल सोसाइटी ऑर्गेनाइजेशन जब पहले हमने ये लॉ लिखा देर वॉज दिस ग्रेट डिबेट कॉर्पोरेट्स ने यह कहा एनजीओ सिविल सोसाइटी ऑर्गेनाइजेशन भाई थ्री पॉइंट टू मिलियन आर देर बट हाउ मेनी आर रिलायबल आज यहां बोर्ड लगाया कल हटा के वहां लगा दिया फिर तीसरे दिन वहां चले गए एनजीओ का क्या है हाउ कैन यू ट्रस्ट एनजीओ तो डेलीगेशन ऑफ कॉर्पोरेट हु मेटर्स वुड ऑलवेज से सिविल सोसाइटी ऑर्गेनाइजेशन सर क्या कह रहे हो आप आर दे ट्रस्ट वर्दी देन वी वुड मीट डेलीगेशन फ्रॉम सिविल सोसाइटी ऑर्गेनाइजेशन वो हमें क्या बोले अरे सर कॉर्पोरेट जाने माने डकाए थे सर लूटते हैं लोगों को इनसे आप सी एस आर करवाओगे सर दीज आर बोथ अनट्रूथ बट दे आर परसेप्शन वॉट आई माई ट्राइंग टू गेट एट वॉट आई एम सेंग इज दिस ट्रस्ट डेफिसिट बिटवीन कॉर्पोरेट एंड बिटवीन एनजीओ over these 8 years what is the single biggest positive development in csr the gradual closing of that trust deficit as a result of this law corporates have started talking to civil society organizations and vice versa each has begun to understand the other's culture today many corporates for example in vedanta which i had now before we start a program we invite a large number of csos to come and talk to us ki flane jagah pe hum skill development ka kaam shuru karna cha rahe hain aap bataiye kaise kare we strategize with the help of csos csos also now know that corporates express expect accountability what kind of financial records what kind of documentation what kind of presentation what kind of professionalism must csos exhibit to make csr robust and the closure of that trust gap is a fantastic development in csr and that's why it's getting more and more traction and more and more success with the passage of time now 
सी एस आर वन फॉर्म क्यों आया और आपको सी एस आर वन फॉर्म से क्या लेना है दिस इज एन इनिशिएटिव स्टार्टेड बाय द मिनिस्ट्री ऑफ कॉपरेटिव अफेयर सो दैट यू कैन चूज your civil society organization in the understanding that government has vetted them today no corporate can choose any civil society organization to conduct this program unless they are registered on csr1 just like din pin min din zin pin jitne bhi itne hain इसका भी एक नंबर है सी एस आर वन फॉर्म में जो सिविल सोसाइटी ऑर्गेनाइजेशन रजिस्टर्ड है उसका एक रजिस्ट्रेशन नंबर मिलता है विदाउट दैट यू कैन नॉट गिव एनी सी एस आर प्रोजेक्ट टू एनी आउटसोर्स एन जी ओ विच इज डज नॉट हैव सी एस आर वन नंबर प्लीज रिमेंबर दिस वेरी वेरी केयरफुली नेक्स्ट प्लीज so here you have a complete database which you can access on the mca portal which are the ones which have csr1 number you can choose only from them and nowhere else next please kaun kar sakta hai csr who can do the actual csr activity can be performed by who ab aap ye keh sakte hain ki bhai chalte chalte mere ko ek bahut acha dost mil gaya aur hum to sara kaam sara csr ka kaam usi dost ke through karte hain uske dost ke zariye se karte hain bahut badhiya insaan hai kya aapke kabil dost csr kar sakte hain kar zarur sakte hain but not as per the law not as per the rules who can do the company itself can do one of the you talk about the biggest spender reliance hardly ever outsources it has a large army of csr in fact if you go to one of these uh, csr conclaves in reliance itna bada hall hoga iske double size ka हर एक बंदा इज एन एम्प्लॉई ऑफ रिलायंस एंड ट्राई ट्राई टू डू एज मच एज दे कैन थ्रू देर ओन एम्प्लॉई इज दैट द राइट वे पर हैप्स नॉट पर हैप्स नॉट अफोर्डेबल नॉट एवरी कंपनी कैन डू दैट दे स्टिल आउटसोर्स बट दे हैव अ लार्ज आर्मी ऑफ थाउजेंड ऑफ एम्प्लॉज डूइंग ओनली सी एस आर नथिंग एल्स बट दैट इज नॉट द ओरिजिनल मॉडल विच आई हेड सी बट येस a company can also do csr through its employees if it wants to then registered public trust registered society in combination for example if any one of the subsidiaries finds there are other companies here in jharkhand area who are willing to collaborate or cooperate with you you can also do csr in collaboration with other companies but such organizations must have a track record of at least 3 years of csr activity without that they would not be entitled next please so we come to this point about administrative overheads particularly ceo or uh, sorry सी एस आर कमिटी के मेंबरान याद रखें द एडमिनिस्ट्रेटिव ओवर हेड्स ऑफ योर सी एस आर वर्क मस्ट बी लिमिटेड टू टू परसेंट विच यू कैन शो एज सी एस आर एक्सपेंडिचर इफ यू गो बियॉन्ड टू परसेंट देन इट इज अ कॉस्ट दैट द कंपनी हैज टू बेयर मेनी कंपनीज डू मच मोर देन टू परसेंट टाटा डज मच मोर देन टू परसेंट बट दे शेयर only 2% has csr expenditure rest they bear themselves this however does not 
apply to civil society organization. This 5%, not 2 that I'm talking about, in the projects which you give a civil society organization with 5% overheads can't possibly implement any project. That would be stupidity. So 10, 15, 20% is pretty much the norm. But for the company, remember this very, very important factor. Many auditors also make this mistake. And I've had to pull them up by the years. The administrative expenditure of 5% relates only to the company, not to the civil society organization. So what are the activities which have been excluded? Ranjan sahab, aap dekhiye, aap ne jo bataya. Ye maine kab likha tha? Aaj is me diya tha. But I wrote it in 2011, much before the, because we were framing these rules in 2011-12. One time, leaving no impact has no meaning. Another very famous Chatterjee-ism. Please remember this. If it is not a project, it is not CSR. Ye apne brain aur dimag mein likhe rakhiye ga. Agar project nahi hai, to CSR nahi hai. Project mane kya? There are so many engineers here, they would know better than me. Money allocated, start date, end date, monitoring, evaluation, and duration. That is what a project is. So projects which are less than three months, six months are of no value. Please don't do any such because they leave no impact. In fact, the norm generally is six months. If there a project is less than six months, it leaves no impact. So try and avoid doing them. Of course, other things which have been prohibited now, you can see anything to do with employees. I still remember, <laughs> of course, as more of a joke, Raurkela. I am Secretary of Public Enterprises. I visit Raurkela. The chairman, you can imagine I will not name the company, but if I'm in Raurkela, you know who. And I said to that gentleman, uh, TK, we've done all your financial reviews, project reviews, production reviews. Let's come to CSR. Aap kuch CSR karte ho? Hare, sir. CSR? Rago mein bhehta hai, sir. Aap mere saath chaliye, mein aapko dikhata hoon. Is bade Raul Kela shahar mein, aapko itne CSR project humare milenge, aap to sir dang rahe jayenge. Or such much mein ant mein aashchar ya chakit hi raha. Kyon? Gaadi mein chal rahe hain. Chairman sahab bolte hain, sir, woh dekhiye school. Dekh raha hoon. Sir, woh humara school hai. Bilkul thik baat. Kaun padhte hain bachche? Sir, humare employees or kaun hoi thai? Aray bhai. Or thoda chale. Sir, woh hospital dekh rahe hain? Bilkul. Sir, humara hospital hai. Or baut achcha. Chikitsa kisko dete hain? Sir, humare employees ke dete hain? Yane, bohut logo ke man mein tab bhi tha, HR or CSR ke beech mein, fark kya hai? What is the difference between what you do for your employees and what you do for the underprivileged? Is a clear line of demarcation. Here you will see that. Again written by me way back in 2014. What is HR is not CSR. Imagine when I first approached this idea of 2%, Tata's told me, Hare Dr. Chatterjee, we are the masters of CSR. There is a gentleman from Tata here also, and they do excellent work. Please, this is not in any way a denigration of Tata does. Some of the best CSR ever known in this country has been done by them. 
and I acknowledge that forthwith. But the fact is that after the law came, the data representatives met me and said, we do 3.8% to 4% of our profits on CSR anyway. So what's this 2% about? When we recalibrated as per the law at that time, the expenditure of Tata's came down to 1.8. Now, of course, they have again exceeded their targets, rightly so, because there's a new regime. And the corporates no longer see CSR as a challenge, but as an opportunity. Next, please. A lot of confusion came that many projects don't finish. Tell me, CSR committee ke jo chairman hai, unhone socha ke bhai agar aap keh rahe ho ke long term projects karein, so let's do a three year project, two year project, four year, and those are the ones which really make impact. Then there is something has to be called ongoing projects. How do we now treat ongoing projects which are multi-year? That treatment is now given under the rule. All of you associated with, C, with CSR, please read that very, very carefully. How do you now treat multi-year projects has now been clarified under the law. Second important question, unspent amount. Ranjan sahab ne bola kya? March mahine mein kya hota hai? Daur, marathon, sprint, dhundo dhundo re sajana kya? UCs. UC dhundo bhai, kyunke bagar expenditure hum dekhai ni sakte hamara 2% hua ki nahi. But fir bhi, unspent amounts still exist. What to do with them? Now there is a provision that what is unspent, you can put in an escrow account separately. Doesn't matter if you haven't spent. You have now three more years. If you put it in the escrow account, you can spend that unspent amount over three more years. So government has given you a window that if there is such a thing as an unspent amount, you get time to actually spend it. But normally, try to keep projects within this four-year span. Read the last line. Because even though some people tried five-year projects, so far, the law only treats one plus three. And the board's decisions take only one plus three. Next, please. These are some rules about how long you can keep it in the escrow account, how much should be spent, how much time do you get at the end of the year before you put the money in the escrow account. These 30 days and all have been specified here. Next, please. What to do with assets? Many of you have created assets with the money on CSR. Example, you have created a school or a small hospital. But as I told you in a project, there is an end date and a start date. Now, it can't happen that you can do the whole life with that thing. Ranjan sahab ne hame kya bola? Machli pakadne ke liye aapko shikhana chahi. Na sirf ke hame aapko machli de de. To ek na ek din, jo dependence hai, wo khatm hooga. Jab khatm hooga, to kya hooga? U school ka kya hooga? U saspatal ka kya hooga? Wo rule mein kaha hai? Ab yeh, रूल में आया है 
what can you do with assets that you have created and to whom can you hand over under the law? Where does dependence end and where does it go after that? Again, Amod Khan sahab ne ek bahut acha mudra uthaya ki bhai mere agar CSR ke fund UNICEF mein chale jaye UNESCO mein chale jaye UNDP mein chale jaye then what the hell is this they are not entitled because they are international organizations they are not entitled to receive funds under CSR the only ones who are entitled are CSOs this rule has now very clearly said that UN agencies, multilateral organizations cannot act as implementing agencies. Darwaza hi band kar diya humne. They can only act as advisors or consultants. We shut the door on them. Next please. CSR committee ke ek bahut badi responsibility ye hai ki wo CSR policy banaye. If you go to the website of any of the, any company in India, practically any, what do you see in the CSR policy? Gine chune meethe meethe angrezi ke shab. CSR policy is so big that it is fun to read. But what is in it? The name of one project is not the name of the project. We will have to do six in the sky. पर किस तरह करेंगे कुछ भी नहीं बोलता कौन से प्रोजेक्ट्स हैं उसमें लिस्टेड नहीं मालूम द पॉलिसी व्हिच यू हैव मेड नीड्स टू बी अपडेटेड एवरी ईयर एंड नाउ अंडर दिस लॉ इन द मंथ ऑफ अप्रैल एट बेस्ट बाय मे Every single project which you want to do in the coming year has to be part of that policy. If it is not, the CSR committee will be held personally and collectively responsible, individually responsible, which means the planning for the next year. Rajan Sahib, kya kaha? Vice day sabse better. साल हमारा होगा क्यों क्योंकि हम दो चीज पे कंसंट्रेट करेंगे क्यों बोला बिकॉज वेन यू हैव टू थीम्स इन एडिशन टू वट एवर डी पी टेल्स यू द प्रोजेक्ट विच यू विश टू डू यू कैन लिस्ट आउट इफ यू हैव टेन डिफरेंट थिंग्स वॉट आर यू वॉन्ट टू लिस्ट बट नाउ द पॉलिसी हैज टू स्टेट एवरी सिंगल प्रोजेक्ट the name of the project, duration of the project, place of the project, where it is to be done, all that has to be part of the policy. Initially, I also remember that when we came out with the law, many people said to me, 2% to aapne kar diya. Now, Dr. Chatterjee tell us, बड़ी सारी कंपनी है विच आर नॉट गोइंग टू स्पेंड द टू परसेंट वॉट विल यू डू विद दम विल यू स्ट्रैंगल दम विल यू पुट दम इन जेल इन टू थाउजेंड फोर्टीन फर्स्ट ऑफ अप्रिल वेन वी अनाउंस द पॉलिसी मेनी दिस ह्यूज कलेक्शन ऑफ जर्नलिस्ट लाइक दिस एंड मेनी आस्क दिस क्वेश्चन दैट योर लॉ इज टूथलेस लॉ तो आपने बना लिया पर उसके दांत ही नहीं अगर 2% किसी ने स्पेंड नहीं किया तो उसका आप क्या करोगे एंड वी हैड गॉन टू द आइडिया ऑफ नेम एंड शेम दैट इफ यू डोंट पुट 2% परसेंट 
you will state why you have not spent it on your website so that you become visible to the entire world as a company which did not spend. Now, as I will show you, that will be somewhere near my last slide. Name and shame se bhi shameless log nahi dare. Shame hote rahe. Lekin unka reaction ye tha, kya fark padta hai? Shame ho rahe, hone dijiye, hume to munafa khori mein interest hai bhai. So now we have gone from the regime of naming and shaming to a policy of, which I will come to now, the punishment regime. We will come to that in a minute or so. So next. What to do if you have spent more Tata, as I mentioned? 2% ki jagai aapne 2.8 spend kar diya. तो क्या करोगे यह भी पहले के रूल्स में नहीं थे अब हमने उसको सेट किया यू हैव एन ऑप्शन वन इज स्पेंड किया जानबूझ के किया अच्छा किया करते जाएंगे एक्सेस नो प्रॉब्लम बिकॉज द लॉस इज एट लीस्ट टू परसेंट बट द ऑप्शन हियर इज इफ यू हैव स्पेंड टू पॉइंट एट Next year, now you may spend 1.2. You can offset against the next year. That freedom also has now come under the rules. Can CSR be a business activity? Example. Ek bada toilet complex humne banaya under Sulab. और हमने सुलभ टॉयलेट कॉम्प्लेक्स को जो यूजर्स हैं हर एक से या एक रुपए या दो रुपए की फीस ली फॉर द यूज ऑफ द टॉयलेट अब ये जो फीस हमने कलेक्ट किए यूजर से वो क्या है टेक्निकली इट इज अ प्रॉफिट बिकॉज यू हैव क्रिएटेड द कॉम्प्लेक्स Now you are earning money from it. And why do we have a problem with people who are opening hospitals and showing it as CSR? Because anything that is chargeable is not CSR. Hospital up khulte jaye, Malabar Hill mein bhi khule, Baikalla mein bhi khule, with respect to a particular company I am talking. But that is now discontinued. And therefore, the highest spenders will soon be brought back into the middle rung. Because when you earn profit from an activity, it is not CSR. Unless you plow it back, so wo jo do rupay, ek rupay hum sulab toilet charge kar rahe the, that was used for the maintenance of that toilet block. That is now permitted. Okay, next. Look at this last line. Rest is more or less okay. Luckily, यहाँ पे कोई CFO नहीं बैठा होगा. I hope. Okay, उस वो बेचारा तो लटक गया. CSR committee के chairman और ये जो CFO है, उन दो बेचारों पर इतनी responsibility है कि आप सोच भी नहीं सकते. And in this context, one more point. I have seen companies which have been delegating their CSR. CSR committees who have delegated their CSR to general managers. This should never be done because now, in the new CSR 2 form, every single project must be approved by the CSR committee of the board with the board resolution number. 
कंपनीज हैव इन द पास्ट सेड अरे भाई जीएम नॉर्थ को दे दो दो करोड़ जीएम साउथ को दे दो एक करोड़ एंड लेट देम टेक द सी एस आर एक्टिविटीज हम हर सी एस आर एक्टिविटी को बोर्ड थोड़ी दे सकता है नाउ देर इज नो सच थिंग एज डेलीगेटेड रिस्पॉन्सिबिलिटी इफ देर इज अ प्रोजेक्ट विच योर कंपनी हैज डन द बोर्ड एंड द सी एस आर कमिटी इज डायरेक्टली रिस्पॉन्सिबल every single project must have a board resolution number and date if it is not approved by the board directly the csr project cannot be taken up therefore backroom to boardroom more and more boardroom responsibility next please the single i told you one was the trust deficit but the single most important development now is again ranjan saab spoke about that impact assessment humne impact kya kiya currently and this law will also soon change I and mean, this rule will soon change after 2 3 years only those projects whose value is more than 1 crore has to be evaluated independently not by you independent in uh, evaluation agency which is called third party evaluation apne peet thap thapane se kaam nahi chalega this is my best practice won't work any project whose value is more than 1 crore has to be evaluated by a third party and very soon this amount will also go further down idea being what impact you have created must be professionally assessed by processes like SROI or whatever and there are many good independent evaluation agencies available in the country who must be brought into the ambit of evaluating your projects self evaluation apna report card khud hi likhna che subject hain che subject mein maine 100 mein se 100 sare number maine apne aap ko hi de diya this is no evaluation self proclamation is useless that is only propagation next please finally this is the last slide i will not bother to read it i will leave it to you but we have moved from you may do to the new penal provision every member of the board and the csr committee must know this it is no longer an option this is a mandation right so with this not very pleasant subject i will come to the conclusion of my submissions to you happy to take any question thank you dr chatterji pleasure hearing you so just have captured some of the aspects uh, that you spoken about over the last uh, for 50 45 50 minutes so i think you spoke about you know the modern indian csr it came about in 2010 but the public sector enterprises took upon themselves to kind of uh, you know uh, for the csr responsibility you mention about government corporate and civil society organization as a triad which could uh, you know propel csr and uh, before 2010 it was more informal csr today it's more strategic csr where it has gone from backroom to boardroom uh, as you mentioned now we are looking at csr 2.0 in the recent amendments uh you know some of the recent amendments talks about uh, csr one form implementation of csr spending you know who can spend uh, companies registered public trust or csr society international organizations are not allowed the, there is a cap on administrative overheads uh, list of inclusions and so on and so forth uh 
And you also mentioned about the kind of activities that are uh, allowed under to spend under CSR, which is under Schedule 7. So I think uh, it's very uh, well covered uh, presentation and uh, uh, some of the penal provisions, they will kind of deter some of these companies not spending because one of the data points I have, Dr. Chatterjee, is out of the 10,000 odd companies uh, listed under uh, uh, MCA, there are almost 30%, 30 percent, 30, and the number is 31 percent, who are either spending less than 2 percent, or there are 13 percent companies who are not spending any amount. So, so maybe I think those companies can be deterred in future uh, going forward. So I have a couple of questions for you. If I look at the Schedule 7 uh, of uh, Companies Act, there are two subclauses. One is subclause 3, which talks about uh, gender equality and uh, uh, women empowerment. If I look at today the BRSR uh, reporting and some of the other recent amendments that have come, uh, uh, I would say on the social, uh, women empowerment is one of the major areas. So what, what is your view about the kind of, uh, you know, CSR spend that have happened around this area and what can be done more? Well, straight away I will tell you that uh, not enough has been done. If you look at the total CSR pie, about 60% of it, maybe about 55% is still education, generally. Almost about 30% is wash. So water, sanitation, hygiene. Skill development is roughly around 10 to 12%. Women's empowerment is somewhere in the range of 5 to 7%. So how do you prioritize? Of course, a lot of this gender equality is now uh, mainstreamed, so directly the expenditure is not captured. For example, just now again, Ranjan Saab said that when we do skill development, at least 30% will be women. When you do, uh, let's say, village adoption, a large number of programs run for women. So many programs actually, because now women's empowerment is an across the board issue. It's not a standalone uh, one silo kind of thing. So those expenditures don't get captured. And yet there is still much to be done. Uh, no doubt about that. Thank you. So maybe the question from the audience. Can we get the mic here? I'm R.B. Prashad from Central Goldfield Limited. Uh, just I want to have a clarification regarding NGO and uh, CSO. As you said, there are a large number of CSO, roughly about 3.2 million in India. But selection of CSO for CSR activity is a challenging for a public sector company. Normally what happens, we prefer to go for L1. We are, our mind is designed to select the L1. But that is not possible in a uh, that CSO type organization. So do you have any common framework so that we can select a good NGO or good CSO uh, for implementing the CSR program? Because of lack yeah. of this, uh, what I found ki most of the CSR activities are of civil nature jobs. Because it is very easy to find L1 in civil work, but not in social work. So do you have any common frameworks for yeah. finalization of good uh, CSO? So there are, uh, there is one or two types of framework which I'll share with you, which many public sectors are now using, which even a company like uh, Vedanta, like mine is also using. We also had a typical, this L1 mindset. But gradually we realized that in social work, this L1 mindset doesn't work. So we do it in a modified form which is that we first float an expression of interest. EOI is what we float for any project that we wish to take up. And we invite bids, which are both uh, the technical specifications and the financial. So up to here, more or less that process is followed. But what we do is we have a small committee and we invite the top three or the top four to make presentations before the committee. It's a collective decision. The 
collective decision then is that if this is going to be what you want to do, we ask them, aapne iska bid itna low kyo karoge batao. You see, once the committee sits, it questions, aapka bid high kyo? Can you reduce? We get into a discussion with all the shortlisted three or four. And then we select amongst them based on certain parameters which we give them. They come back with the second bid based on whatever we have discussed with them. And then we decide this is the one we will take. So we partly follow the formula of L1 bidding, etc., so that when an auditor inspects. The auditor is aware that there is an application of mind in the selection of the CSO, that they have gone through the full process and the committee has decided that in view of the track record, the performance, the past performance, the capacity, the manpower and the ability of that organization to deliver the goods is the best. That is what we follow. Okay, sir. Thank you. Uh, sir, uh, good morning. Uh, this is Jajal Gauri, Independent Director, Central Core Field. Uh, sir, I want to say this, and I have talked about this, and I have talked about this, because I have been working with the NGOs for 12 years experience, and basically I am an advocate and journalist and a writer. तो इसीलिए मैंने जो सेंट्रल कोल्ड फील्ड पे अपॉइंटमेंट वो तो पहले दिनी उससे पहले दिनी मैंने राजरपा गई थी क्योंकि फील्ड विजिट करना बहुत बहुत मेरा इंटरेस्ट है बिकॉज़ अब मैं लेके कहा लेकिन ये जो माइनिंग के एरिया है नॉट ओनली सेंट्रल कोल्ड फील्ड आल माइनिंग एरिया पे यही हो सकते हैं सर जो जो फंडिंग है 60 परसेंट फंड्स एजुकेशन पे जाना है तो जाता है जाना भी है और मैंने ये कह रही थी जो सीएसआर पॉलिसी में लिया गया जो हमारे हानरबल चेयर चेयर सीएसआर के चेयरमैन सब चेयरपर्सन भी हमारे साथ हैं तो हमले पहले से यही कह रही थी यार इतनी लेकिन ये जो सर मैंने ये कह रही थी जो एजुकेशन पे जो हो रही है वो नहीं हो रही मैं रिसेंटली राजरपा गया राजरपा में मैंने एक कस्तूरीबा कॉलेज कस्तूरीबा ट्रस्ट से जो जा रही है वो स्कूल पे मैंने गए कम से कम 400 गर्ल्स हैं मैं नहीं से पहले 50 परसेंट क्यों नहीं बल्कि मैं विनयरंजन सर से कह रही थी क्योंकि वो दिन वो दिन ही नहीं कई दिन मैंने कभी भी मैंने स्कूल को विजिट कराओ मेरे को रोना ही रोना है क्योंकि मैं एक गांव के लिए लड़की हूँ गांव से आई एक गवर्नमेंट स्कूल के पास और उसकी 60 परसेंट फंड्स पहले एजुकेशन पे जाना है इसके लिए आप लोग कैसा कर सकते हैं वो करना बहुत जरूर है और एजुकेशन विद टेक्निकल ट्रेनिंग होना चाहिए और जो सार कह रही थी कई स्टूडेंट घर में हैं समझ समझ गया आपका ये सुझाव है ये प्रश्न नहीं बैठी बैठी बी कंप्लीट थैंक यू आपका य fact remains that uh, this is a decision which CSR committee has to take. If you feel that in your areas education is of that much importance, then what is the quantum of money that you will spend on education is a, is a call that your CSR committee will take. This is a suggestion which she has given and that is for you to please uh, take a call on. Okay, any right. other? Sir, we are at the top of the hour. Maybe yeah. one last question. Sure. Yeah. Sir, my one small point, sir. As you know that CSR money cannot be spent for the political party. For but the? Political parties. Yes. We cannot give fund to the political Correct. parties. But uh, if any political person, any MP, any MLAs, 
if he recommend some project through CSR in any area, is it acceptable? Yes, because if the suggestion is for a CSR expenditure, it is up to you in the CSR committee to accept it or not accept it. But that is not a contribution to his political party. No, but it is not a contribution to the political party, but individual if he takes such project, directly or indirectly gives some indication that some political person is doing something in the area. See, that is a call. That sense is uh, goes like that. There is something called the law and something called discretion. The law permits you to accept the suggestion of a member of parliament that some particular project may be taken up in his area. Law does not say no. But you cannot make a contribution to BJP or Congress directly. Okay, na? Okay. Now, what to do with it? Because MPs ke aate rehte hain, MLA, MP, oh, itna bada guchha ho jata hai. Aur ek MP kabhi ek project pe to bolta nahi hai, or 10, 12, 20 de deta hai. So, what do CSR committees do across private sector? Vedanta mein bhi hume milta hai. Aisa nahi hai ki public sector ke paas aata hai. Jo bhi jahan kaam kar raha hai, local MP, MLA ke itne saare chitthe a jate hai. Why do they come? Because they have people who come. Sir, let us do our own, let us do our own. So generally speaking, what we do is that we normally ignore such representations altogether. What the CMD does or the chief does is one or two selected projects which you think are of real benefit. And usually we also try to talk to the collector of that area. He answered recommendation aya hai. Kya, is it a worthwhile project? Collector is not? okay. I think if collector Haan. recommends some project. So then what happens area. is, wahi but MP ka jo MP or MLA no, recommend. Jo MP recommend head. kar raha hai. Letter head. I think uh, no, no, it is not, it not desirable to accept. Haan, you don't have to. What I do then is, hum ek cross check kar lete hai, uh, DM ke saath. Ki ye jo project recommend hai, do you also feel it is doable? One so, more. Yeah. Yeah. One more thing, sir. Hmm. Uh, what is the limitations to spend this CSR money? Limitation money? Limits. Where geographical we can limit, nothing. You can go from Kanyakumari to Kashmir. There is no geographical limit on any CSR expenditure. People like you who are in mining and production, you tend to do it in your area of operation. But suppose you are an IT company. And your office is on 6th floor, Nariman Point, Mumbai. So, you have to Arabian Sea. Mein kharch karna hai. Nee, that is so, okay. So, depending, the law says you can spend it anywhere in India. But in my opinion, sir, actually, the main concept to develop this CSIR, logically, wherever a company or a project is coming up, there is a lot of degradation of the environment. To compensate the people or local people who are going to be affected by that project, which is coming up in that certain area, the first right is of, uh, of them. Of course. So that in my right. opinion. You are right. But tell me, Infosys kya karega? Cogentrix kya karega? Unka koi area of operation hai hi nahi? But to kaan kharch karega ho? They may no, have. Please, uh, please understand. They may it have depends. some. No, no. They don't. The question is. If you are the kind of company you are, then where you spend your money depends on you. You are in mining, right? You are in production. So you would like to spend with the community with whom you operate. But there are many service companies who have no area of operation. Their area of operation is the whole world. Infosys kya karta hai? Are London says software ka program aya wo wo bana raha hai. So we kya apna CSR London mein karega? So it depends on the company that you are. In your case, you are 100% right. For you, your priority is the communities whom are associated with you. So you continue with your policy. Com uh, yes. But legally, it can be done anywhere. Okay. Legally, it is I okay, but I think time. it is mandatory. No, 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 it is not mandatory. Please. Mandatory, especially especially in mining mm -hmm. areas and the people who are affecting by this project, definitely that money goes to them. As I said, for their is, welfare. That right? is your policy. <laughs> policy this is my, it is not government of India policy, but your in policy. my... <laughs>
<laughs> you are right. आप ये अपनी पॉलिसी इसी तरह बनाइए yes. क्योंकि आप बिल्कुल ठीक कह रहे हैं थैंक यू सेशन सो मे बी यूर रिक्वेस्ट फॉरिटेशन टू है थैंक यू सर योर टॉक वॉज वेरी इन्फॉर्मेटिव एंड योर सेशन substantiates the fact that you, of you being called the father of csr in india uh, now i would request our cmd sir shri pm prasad sir to kindly come on stage and felicitate dr bhaskar chatterjee with memento utrai and personalized frame I would take the honor to welcome Shri R B Prasad, Director, Technical Designate, Central Coalfields Limited, and uh, Independent Director, C C L, Chairman S D C S R Committee, Shri Harban Singh, on today's occasion. Thank you, sir, for being with us today. Um, now it is time for high tea. Uh, I would request all the protocol officers to kindly escort the V I P S towards the green room area, and I would request all the G M C S R S H O D S and others. participants to kindly go to the right hand side of the auditorium for the high tea uh, we will due to paucity of time we will have cut short the tea break to just 10 minutes so request you all to be here within 10 minutes thank you हेलो हेलो
uh, invite him in virtual mode. So he will be joining us in virtual mode. Hello. Learning knows no boundaries. Though not physically present with us today, Though not physically present with us today due to uh, some urgent engagements, however, uh, he could manage to connect with us for the third session of the day. CSR. Yeah, Mr. Sorrai, this is Sairam. Are you able to listen to me? Good afternoon, Mr. Sairam. Uh, loud and clear, and I hope I am audible to everyone. May I please increase the volume of. Uh, please increase the volume. So, sir. are we audible now? Uh, is it? So we, I can hear you loud and clear. Am okay. I audible? Okay, okay, we are able to hear you. Yeah, right, right. Thank you, thank you, sir. Thank you, thank you. For the session, CSR centrality of social impact. I would like to welcome Sri Saurav Roy, Chief CSR, Tata Steel Limited, with a huge round of applause. Over to you, sir. So, thank you. Thank you very much. A very, a very good afternoon to uh, everyone here. And uh, a Jharkhandi Johar to everyone uh, here. Today, my, let me begin with a round of apologies for not uh, being there in person. I had a round of board meetings that had come up suddenly, so I had to sort of stay back, and I, it's entirely my loss. Uh, but thank you again. Thank you uh, to the entire team for thinking of uh, us when you were thinking of this event. And I think it's a privilege to be able to you know, be with you and then uh, interact with you uh, today. So. Uh, I have I have a I have a bunch of slides. I think I'll have about 20, 25 minutes of speaking time, and after that, I'm I'm you know look forward to you know any questions or any suggestions, comments that uh, people might have. Um, I'll just take a minute to share a bunch of slides that I have. Uh, just wanted to check: are the slides visible? Yes, sir. Perfect. Great. Okay. So, uh, um, I think so. Uh, well, welcome to possibly the first guest session uh, for the day, the second guest session for the day. Uh, I thought, uh, uh, you know, given the platform on which we are, uh, on which uh, you know we are having this conversation, and. Uh, you know, given the significant influence and you know intellectual capacity within the room and and commitment to the cause that is probably there that is there in the room, uh, I thought I'd share some perspectives and and seek your views on on something that we keep grappling with at the Tata Steel Foundation, on you know uh, while while we are doing CSR, how do we centralize or how do we prioritize social impact at all given points, under all decisions, under all considerations, and how do we sort of, uh, you know, remember why we are doing CSR and what the core purpose of doing CSR is. And uh, I have a few perspectives that I want to share with you. I'm uh, happy to seek your feedback on that. So just to begin with, I think uh, this is who we are, the Tata Steel Foundation. Uh, we, we, the core of what we try to do is to look at, you know, uh, our, our vision is an enlightened, equitable society in which every individual realizes her potential with dignity. And, and that's how we try and structure most of our programs, most of our community relationships, the kind of social capital uh, that we end up building amongst communities that who we work with uh, towards sharing, towards creating uh, solving core development challenges 
as of today, uh, uh, you know, just just some numbers on the right, uh, just to give you a sense of whatever I'm going to say, I'm going to say based on this experience that we have. I think on an annualized basis, uh, we reach about 2.873 million people directly every year. These are audited uh, direct numbers. Uh, our work currently in about is in about 4,700 uh, odd uh, gram panchayats across Jharkhand, Odisha, and West Bengal, where some of our networks are, uh, you know, pan India. Uh, we are also an uh, uh, implementing uh, foundation. Right? So we have about more than a thousand colleagues who are on the Tata Steel Foundation, or or who, uh, you know, uh, were busy implementing uh, live work on CSR as we speak. And our investment in the last eight years since, let's say, the CSR mandate came in from the government of India in, in this region has been a little north of rupees 2000 crores, which is about twice the mandated CSR spend for the, uh, the mandated floor or threshold CSR spend for uh, private enterprise in the country. And so that's, that's who we are. We are an implementing CSR foundation working across eastern India and uh, with, with sort of significant investments and feet on the street. And then that's where most of my perspective uh, that is derived from. Everyone in the room, when, when we are having this conversation, I think there's a, there's a need to, you know, have this conversation in a certain context, right? And my submission to you is that there is today a compelling case for impact leadership in the eastern part of the country. You know, if you just look at Jharkhand, Odisha, West Bengal, this part of the country, uh, you know, there is, I mean, most indices will give you uh, the need to be there. And, and we are amongst a few industrial houses who are located here. I, uh, in the previous session, the point was being made on, you know, are there any geographic moorings for CSR? And the distinction between information technology companies and manufacturing slash mining companies, you know, in a manner, we are located in a part of the world which has which has significant need to do uh, for development and i think we have a permanent presence here and i look at that as an opportunity for us to do something really meaningful you know and this combined with the kind of private resource allocation or the lack or absence of private resource allocation that happens in the eastern part of the country right and, and there are many reasons for that many structural reasons for that of how industrialization has happened over the uh, has evolved in the country, uh, you know, what kind of incentives exist, what kind of platforms, uh, or what is the capacity to absorb private development capital within, uh, you know, this region. There are many reasons, but the fact of the matter is there is a lot of need and there is, uh, you know, not enough private resource development, uh, private development fund allocation in this part of the country. And that is an inequation that has come to define uh, our context, our operating context as we speak. Having said that, it's not all bad news, you know, and, and, and this is not a sympathy case, this is not a pity case, and it's very important for us to remember that. So what's on the left on this slide, you know, if you look at SDG progress reports, if you look at SPI progress reports, if you look at SDI indices, many, many indices, you know, the, the need to do something in this part of the world comes out strongly. But what often doesn't come out or gets missed is what's on the right of this slide. You know, there is such tremendous inherent potential and reasons for us to be, uh, you know, for, for many of us in the audience and for me personally and my teams, we are at the sweet spot of being in a place where there is need, there is a lot of potential, and we have resources that are available. And I think that sweet spot is available with very, very few people uh, who, who have the kind of spirit that we have. Right? So what's on the right, if you look at, just let's just look at Jharkhand for the time being, you know, and maybe Jharkhand, Odisha, West Bengal. It's the right time to scale the climate narrative. If you look at any vulnerability assessment studies, how environment aspects are actually descending into being societal problems now, uh, these are playing out in the eastern part of the country. Uh, well, India is projected to be amongst the youngest countries in the world. And if you look at all scientific projections, this part of the world where we are is projected to be the youngest part of India in many ways. So we are sitting on a demographic leverage, which if not worked on, you know, well, can, can go both ways, but I see that as a massive opportunity. Okay? The kind of intellectual and cultural capital that exists, whether you look at it from a, from an indigenous or a tribal lens, whether you look at it from a, you know, any, any, any sort of this thing, uh, uh, abilities, I think are the populations where we, the communities where we work in, there, there's not just a need-based story, but I think there are 
uh, you know, massive lessons to be learned. There are massive strong points on which we can develop and pivot our, uh, our, our development work. And finally, models. You know, if you, if you look, uh, if you if you look globally or if you look even nationally, uh, if 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 uh, point one, point two, and point three on this slide are correct, you know, then there is a need to create models uh, that emerge out of Eastern India, emerge out of Jharkhand, emerge out of the mining locations that we work with, and are actually feeding or instructed to the rest of the world. You know, because the because the uh, as narratives change, this is the place where the change might happen in, in, in our part of the world. And then that's why it's so, uh, so important that we, get our, that we get our act right, that we get our investments and thinking right uh, on this piece, particularly all of us as we have this conversation today. And that's why I think what we do with CSR and as we speak of CSR, this as we speak of social impact, this conversation becomes more and more important every given year and every single day as we, speak, uh, as we talk. So that's the, that's the context I wanted to set out in the beginning. Now, when we look at CSR, I think a lot of the conversation is around Section 135 and Schedule 7 and you know, the Companies Act and, and the laws and the rules and the compliances that are you know, now coming our way, which was, which was referred to in the previous conversation. As someone who's, who's, who's an implementing, uh, who, who anchors an implementing team, as someone who's worked in this space for quite some time, as I'm sure a lot of you have, uh, there are certain fundamental questions that define social impact, you know, that define societal impact as we go by, right? And I would like to begin with a simple question, please, and, and, and look at it slightly differently. When we talk of Section 135, when we talk of Schedule 7, when we talk of CSR, there's a lot of conversation on, you know, what does Section 135 and Schedule 7 ask of us? Okay. Let me try, let us try and have a conversation on what do Section 135 and Schedule 7, what does the Companies Act not tell us? And my submission to this audience is that some of the most fundamental points on how we achieve good social impact are not at all restricted by the CSR regulation of the country. And I think that the decision at the end of the day, hand on heart, lies with us who are driving the CSR narrative in this space. So my submission is these are the five questions. And we'll look at each of these questions in the context of some of the work that we are doing. I'm happy to discuss this. These are the five questions on which you know there are actually no restrictions as far as regulation is concerned. It is completely up to us as we conceptualize our own CSR program. Let's begin with the first one. You know, if we are working with communities, if we are working for communities, then how deeply should we understand the communities we work with? You know, what kind of time, what kind of resources should we spend to understand, build social capital, understand nuances, and have the ability to say that, okay, within communities, let's not look at communities with a broad sweep of you know, poor or not poor, tribal or not tribal. How much time are we spending to understand exclusion, understand marginalization, understand aspirations, understand nuances? Uh, there is nothing in the regulatory space that stops us from doing this. And I think it's, it's something that we should reflect on. For us, uh, we believe that I think the grassroots governance systems, uh, the, the, the people anchored institutions, these are the bedrock of creating sustainable programs. Uh, we have an education program today that works with about about 1.25 million children uh, directly in about uh, 6,500 odd uh, gov government schools of Jharkhand and Odisha across the entire gamut of uh, what the RTE Act specified. And now the NEPA has also started talking about access. Are children coming back to school? Are all children going to school? You know, uh, is there universalization of secondary education? Har bacha class 10 pass kar pa raha hai ya pa rahi hai ya nahi? That is the fundamental question. Right? What is the quality of learning in government schools and what kind of governance exists? What work are we doing with school management committees? Each school, the school is a fundamental institution for the community. Is the school a well-governed place? Are school development plans being made? Are the schemes, entitlements uh, flowing to the schools? Uh, are these, are, are, is the school management committee an aspirational place to be? for the community or elders of the community? Is there correct representation? You know, this is what the program talks about and eventually measures our uh, success by how many, uh, you know, children are back in school and how many and what kind of learning outcomes are coming out of these schools. 
as part of this there are 2923 villages uh, in these two states that have been declared as child labor free zones where each child uh, as per as per ilo definitions each child who is of school going age in these villages are actually going to school and has been in school for at least one year that's the definition of a child labor free zone what is more important is we spent almost six and a half years now on creating village education registers with the panchayat so when when a village or a panchayat is declaring itself child labor free it is not tarasteel foundation that is making that declaration it is a panchayat which is making that declaration and it's a simple tool which says that aapke paas ek register ho you know in which you are just tracking the total number of children in your village or panchayat uh, are they of their of what age which class should they be in are they going to school are they not going to school if not then why and the moment all children on that list are going to school you are a child labor free village it's taken us about five and a half uh, about six and a half years now uh, to get this going but we believe that that that's the kind of time uh, that is required to be spent there was a lot of initial resistance but you need patience to overcome that sometimes you don't get an annual uh, you know impact or the result on that the results start only showing after three three and a half years but that's fine you know but that's when uh, all the nuances play out and it's important and only this is the reason why this program is now becoming sustainable and the model is getting picked up in multiple places if dr bhaskar is there it's a program that he's familiar with and we we i think uh, you know he's also uh, very graciously written about uh, what is called the thousand schools program uh how much time are we taking to understand the communities you know we we have a, a from jamshedpur in jharkhand to kalingan in odisha we have a 286 km highway which we want to work on as a corridor of well being uh we have no operations on this in on this corridor it's just you know operations at the two ends but we thought i think there's an accountability since the road traffic is going up etc etc so when we started working on these it took us almost one and a half years but we wanted to create a model which balances environmental social uh human all capitals uh and also we spent about a year and a half just doing a detailed assessment with about 600 volunteers today to create a platform a digitally led a uh, publicly available platform which is there with each of the district collectors to actually say that you know this is the need so this is possibly among the largest private sector assessments uh that has happened uh, covering about 99000 households 600 volunteers obviously a lot i mean we invested resources in doing this uh because we, there were a lot of gaps uh in in uh in the data that was available and this is this is a publicly available piece of information which is now cascaded into gram panchayat development plans gpdp which are now being tracked uh, by each of the panchayats uh we have a program called mansi which is on maternal and neonatal survival uh again this is uh, we work closely with public systems this is along with the national health mission uh this is been recognized as one of the best uh, this is been recognized as a model for application across brics countries by the brics council recently uh the core of mansi lies in the fact that communities are allowing us along with sahia didi to come in and work with them at one of their most intimate moments of childbirth pregnancy uh and and talk on subjects that are remarkably sensitive so uh you know the model that we started with this model se shuru kiya tha you know ki ye aisa program hona chahiye that model got transformed in one and a half two years time and we you know we were compelled to be flexible because our initial program design at least 20 25% of that was not working because as we went out and started our teams of about this other team of about uh, about 350 people now uh when they went out there many things you know uh, uh, superstitions play out uh, simple things like family dynamics play out sometimes you know uh, 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 tribal communities have their own nuances dalit communities have their own nuances so uh, you know taking all that into account and spending time to understand them and realizing that data data can only give us a definition of the problem and the indication of the solution but the solution actually comes from the kind of time we spend to understand spend in understanding communities and working with them uh in the last uh, about this program is about 8 years uh, uh on now we are covering all of kolahan in this program in the last well 7 years and this are independently verified assessed numbers 
uh, we've been able to cause a 64% reduction in IMR and a 62% reduction in maternal mortality rate in the last five years. And uh, I think we'll shortly go public with this, but very happy to share with you that the first five blocks of Jharkhand to achieve the SDG targets on MMR and CMR are now in Jharkhand and then Mansi have been, have been working in these cases. But again, if these programs have been successful, if they have been accepted, it's also because we spent a lot of time to, uh, before rushing in with a solution, in trying to see how the solution is contextualized and what kind of nuances are being understood and not looking at communities as a homogeneous mass and in broad sweeps. So that's the first one. The second question, I think, is something that is particularly, I think, this audience, as we have this conversation, is to keep asking us, you know, what are the new or underserved challenges that we can address through CSR? You know, I think there was a con there was a conversation on what kind of percentage of funds is allocated to education. Now, within education, you know, are there any nuance or specific challenges that need to be addressed? Is there a fresh way we can look at something? Sometimes we speak of equity, you know, equitable programs, equitable society. Uh, and we say that let's design a program and then try and make it equitable, you know, try and make it reach everyone. Maybe, maybe one way of doing things for people like us who have the resources and the intellectual capacity to do this is to go looking for inequity. You know, wo exclusion samaj mein kaha pe hai? You know, usko identify karne ke baad, then you try and solve that problem. So I'll, I'll give you a few examples. Uh, one of, you know, as we looked at Jamshedpur as an expanding urban conglomeration, we realized that like any other urban conglomeration, any city in the, uh, in the world, if you may, uh, there are blind spots of urbanization. And one of the biggest blind spots that we saw was, you know, children who are exposed to the worst forms of child labor. And worst forms of child labor is a defined term as for as for the as for ILO, and you know there 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 are instances of physical abuse, uh, substance abuse, and जो सबसे खराब हालत में बच्चे हैं, you know, उनके साथ हमें काम करना है. Can we look at making Jamshedpur possibly the first urban conglomeration that is free of the worst forms of child labor? Maybe it sounds utopian, but I think that's the that's the fun of what we do in CSA. I mean, let's 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 look at ambitions which uh, you know make people smile, but sort of motivate us. So today uh, we are reaching about, we have an assessment of how many children uh, are possibly exposed to the worst forms of child labor in Jamshedpur. Uh, we, uh, today we are reaching about 25, 30% of the children who are going through bridge courses, uh, residential, non-residential, both. And about 453 of these children have, have been admitted to mainstream English medium schools, private and government schools. And uh, we are, Hypothesis is if you're exposed to the worst forms of child labor, uh, if we gently, carefully bring you out of the psychological and physical ramifications of a childhood of that kind and get them into a safe, secure schools, then education is the path out of, of uh, you know, this, this vicious cycle of, uh, of a childhood of this uh, kind. And then that's what this program, the program called Mastiki Patshala, which, which we are uh, working on right now. Uh, there are prisons in the city and then you know if you look at if you look at inequitable uh, in, at least in Jamshedpur and then across Jharkhand, how do we look at a model of restorative justice at least from a uh, from from a time of incarceration perspective and the Jharkhand state administration is extremely kind because they had registered Tarasil foundation as the one organization which was uh, along with prayas and a few other organizations who were mandated to look at empathetic incarceration. So jail ke andar hum log, uh, not only vocational training, but actually jail ka mahal ka se kar sakte hai. You know, how can it be a restorative exercise rather than a punitive exercise, you know, so that when people are coming back into society, uh, you know, you come back, you come back a reformed person, not a punished person. Hum uh, log vulnerability ki baat kare thai, climate change ki baat kare thai, we were talking about some of these things, but I think if you actually go and spend time with communities, uh, uh, we are now at a stage where climate change and a lot of these, the science of that continues to be in conference rooms and, you know, uh, uh, high level conferences, but it started playing out in the everyday lives of communities and started affecting their everyday survival. And therefore, I think uh, a thrust that we have is to look at how do you combine what is an ecological or an environmental uh, imperative along with solving a social challenge. And how do you combine... Uh, 
I'm sure a lot of us have heard of the concept of ESG and how do you look at environmental, social and governance pieces? How do you combine environmental and social initiatives and make them land? So whether it's, you know, what's uh, right at the bottom of the slide where you look at, again, you look at panchayats, you look at grassroots administrations and see if there are biodiversity registers that they can maintain so that, you know, species conservation, biodiversity, these are, again, part of the popular mandate. Uh, can we look at, you know, greater emphasis on renewables, but in a manner where, uh, you know, link it to livelihood sources in a manner that, you know, uh, we don't create a solar park and then end up maintaining that solar park for the rest of our, you know, <laughs> for, the, for the foreseeable future. If it can be linked to uh, a model where, uh, uh, you know, there's, there's, it, it leads to higher incomes and that can get subsidized, and that process can be started with communities and that benefits can be shown. These are things that have worked for us. And I think uh, uh, this is something that we would definitely want to scale up and, and would want to leave you with. Uh, finally, uh, you know, we, we uh, underserved challenges. I think a lot of work happens around affirmative action for, you know, education, uh, health outcomes for tribal communities. But, uh, you know, particularly in our part of the world, we, 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 have more than a hundred years of shared existence, you know, shared, so I mean, more than a century of shared history and actually shared context with tribal communities. So we have a we have, we have a small effort called Sambad, which is a platform or an ecosystem of thirteen elements, which look at tribal identity, you know, which look at the look at uh, solve for the fundamental inequation that you know uh, the uh, identity as a tribal woman or man is often a source of diffidence or. Uh, you know, angst. Whereas on the other end, I think some, from a sustainability perspective, for many, from a social norms perspective, the kind of wisdom that actually exists among indigenous communities all over the world, and particularly tribal communities in our part of the world, is is absolutely phenomenal, and it's not available in PowerPoints and Excels and, you know, ready to, ready to understand, uh, uh, you know, means. Maybe I can't understand it, but I can have the patience and the temerity and the humility to understand it. So that that inequation is what we are trying to solve. Uh, there are language programs, there are uh, you know leadership programs, there are heritage conservation fellowships, and uh, it's essentially a platform for dialogue. The reason I've put it under newer underserved challenges is because a platform for identity often doesn't lend itself for obvious impact assessments. We can't show a quarterly impact. We can't show sometimes we can't show an annual impact, which is this thing. But that's okay. It's it's something that's ongoing. It's important, and I think. Uh, uh, if it's an important social issue, it needs to be addressed, it needs to be solved. And the onus of creating frameworks to measure impact, to do this is on us, the people who are trained, the people who have the technical and the educational qualifications to do that. So that's that's my humble submission on this. Uh, I think the last few slides are this. Finally, what uh, the third question, uh, what should be the principles of collaboration in the CSR space? I'll, I'll just send out our structure as the foundation. If we are investing, as I said, I think our, our investments are anyway 2x of what we are trying to put in. But if our, our expertise, our understanding of communities, our uh, investment itself actually gives people the confidence to put in their investment. If you remember the original hypothesis was there's not enough uh, private development allocation that is coming into uh, this part of the world. If they come into this part of the world, uh, and we can get more resources in and, and uh, you know, act as a catalyst, then why not? And therefore, we're absolutely okay. And about 45%, as I said, if we invest 100 rupees, 45 rupees over and above that 100 rupees, not substituting the 100 rupees, but over and above those 45 rupees are actually given to the foundation from, you know, many other foundations, uh, banks, uh, to go back to the previous, uh, this thing, if, if let's say an IT company and it's a, happening with us if an IT company wants to come and invest here they actually invest through the Tarasil Foundation. Having said that when when we it, we make that investment there is there is a thriving civil society in these states you know there are small NGOs, grassroots organizations, community-based organizations you know which are the heart and soul of the development process. Uh, how do we build capacity? How do we you know pass on funds? How do we work more efficiently through them? So, you know, these are also things that are constantly on our mind and we keep improving our processes around that. But I think the principle of, uh, you know, how do things come together? And that's why the value of a conclave like this, where, you know, we get an opportunity to think together. 
if you start thinking together, I'm sure you start, you know, sort of, you know, doing together, implementing together. But again, to go back to this, the, I mean, the principles of there are no restrictions on collaboration as far as you know, CSR regulation or law goes. It's completely up to us. A very important question therein is also if you look at the whole sustainability space, if there is an organization which is doing CSR well, the next level question to be asked, and again, there is no mandate or law on this, you know, which says what kind of influence should CSR have within our organization? Uh, if community se hum mil ke kaam kar rahe hai, we are working so closely, we have a lot of understanding. Is that understanding, is that empathy that is being developed, is that coming back within to our organizations? I know what about large teams who are not working on CSR? Is there a way in which you know they can slash participate or benefit from this? One of the experiments that we did was, you know, we had this, we we we, we created these wonderful immersion programs, you know. Uh, these immersion, rural immersion program, not rural, I mean, let's say community immersion program uh, are uh, at least a week to a fortnight, you know, depending on uh, depending on the structure, not on time mobility, but structure that is available for all the senior leadership within the Tata Steel group to begin with and parts of the Tata group also. The idea is not to go in and see our work. The idea is not to go in and education uh, The idea is to go in, spend immersive time, spend nights at least a week to a fortnight with communities, learning from communities with a basic understanding that you know there is wisdom that is outside the corporate understanding, managing principles, which are you know very simple. And there are nuances, what drives community behavior. And it's important as we, you know, as you know, as, as I think capitalism is going through a bit of a shift right now, as we, even as we speak, and as this new conscious, responsible businesses emerge, which are directions that our institutions, large institutions like ours is taking, I think it's very important that, you know, this consciousness amongst individuals and management styles and principles also undergo this. So 65 members of our senior leadership have gone through this. Uh, our, our unions uh, have, have gone through this immersion program. And particularly our mining operations, since you know, and, and for mining organizations, we all know how uh, closely intertwined with communities management of a mine is. And therefore, 100% of the leaders of all our community intensive mining operations have completed this program. Uh, maybe not now, but I'm very happy to have a separate conversation if required. But I think there's a, there's a marked change in approaches and, uh, you know, uh, management of relationships, stakeholder engagement once. Uh, for, for someone who's undergone this immersion program, someone who's not undergone this immersion program. So the fundamental question is, you know, if we're doing CSR well, we understand communities, there is empathy that sparked within that. How are we taking that within our organizations? Again, to go back to my fundamental submission, there is no law, there is no restriction on this. It's something that we can design and maybe we should be considering. And finally, what should team CSR look like? You know, and then this is... Uh, you know, maybe we can forget on the slide, but my simple submission is, I think now the time is come for some of the best talent in the organization uh, and appropriate talent in the organization to be put on CSR. And because there's a lot of intellectual capacity that's required, there's a lot of empathy of both head and heart that is required in CSR. Uh, you need people, you need leaders in CSR uh, who, if you place them, Amongst communities, if you place them in the remotest of villages, they'll be able to find their way through, speak the language of communities, and you know, spend nights there if required, and it are very comfortable. And the same person, once you bring them back within the company, within the institution, and place them in front of, let's say, the board of the company, you know, they will be able to speak a language which the board understands. But in speaking the language to the board and in speaking the language to the communities, there is no loss in translation and there is equal honesty in speaking both these languages. So that would be my humble submission. These are five questions which I think is core to any social impact process, be it through CSRs, be it through NGOs, foundations, whatever it is. And my, again, I go back to my simple submission that these five questions are not constrained by any regulation or any law. And it's completely up to us as institutions on how we look at this and how we define our own approaches. So. Thank you. Thank you very much for, you know, patiently listening to me. 
and giving me this chance. I'm very happy to hear some, you know, critique questions or feedback. Please. Uh, sir, uh, please stay with us online for a few minutes. As the session started sure. promptly, it would be an injustice to not introduce sir. Uh, you just listened to Sri Saurav Roy, Chief CSR Tata Steel. He is an alumnus of Delhi School of Economics and IIM Ahmedabad. Sri Roy has anchored the sustainability strategy work of Tata Sustainability Group and has also set up disaster response framework for Tata Group while managing the di disaster relief and rehabilitation program in different locations in India and abroad. Sir so is currently leading the CSR of Tata Steel globally and is working across 4,500 villages of India and reaching an average of 2 million lives in a year. Uh, thank you, sir, for creating an understanding of how CSR can create a positive social impact. I would ask moderators from Deloitte uh, to conduct the question and answer session, please. Thank you. <coughs> thank you, Mr. Roy. A wonderful session over the last 40 minutes, Mr. Rajiv from Deloitte. Uh, so some of the learnings for me, it was truly an eye-opener for me in terms of the Tata Steel Foundation, 2.87 million lives impacted. Uh, some of your programs like Mansi, which is renowned across India. It's a case study global as well. Uh, you have spoken about uh, various aspects, including understanding communities. You have spoken about uh, the kind of influence that these programs have and some of the new challenges. Uh, so a couple of questions from my side, especially uh, if I look at from a Coal India and a Tata Steel perspective. Uh, both the companies are working with remotest areas. These are the, as you mentioned, less than 9% of uh, capital investment is happening in this uh, three, four states, uh, lowest in the SDI index from a country perspective. Uh, so these states are primarily dependent on uh, activities like mining, and Tata Steel and Coal India both are in the mining. And one of the key challenges that we are facing over the next 10, 20 years is when the mining industry, you know, the mines are closed, there is a issue of just transition. How do I manage the people's livelihoods to alternate livelihoods. What has been your kind of uh, initiatives to kind of manage these just transition uh, challenges going on? Uh, you know, that's a, that's, a, that's a tough one actually. Uh, but what we are trying to do is, uh, there, is there is a livelihoods challenge in, in a lot of these areas. And therefore, that's where the dependence on the mining value chain comes from. Right. So the first first one is in each of these states. What we are really trying to do is to you know uh, uh, start at the base. As I said, uh, in a lot of these areas, significantly try and see. I spoke about universalization of secondary education. Har bacha class ten pass kar raha hai ki nahi kar raha hai. You know, and 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 uh, that's that's the first uh, effort that we are trying to put in. Okay, work with government schooling systems uh, part part of the private schooling systems also to say that you know every every child is passing through class 10 and clearing that because our belief is in the future as we said about 15 20 years now uh, you know having secondary education is going to you know uh, as automation kicks in as industry 4.0 kicks in as you know uh, many things happen the definition of merit is changing and earlier there was you know the scope or the opportunity of for someone who's not even a secondary pass 10th pass nahi hai is virtually going to be nil going forward, right? So two parts, I think there are some of our programs where we work on dignity of, you know, increasing the dignity of certain vocations. Uh, and second is looking at, uh, as I said, getting all children to clear class 10. Uh, second part is uh, on institutional skill building. You know, a lot of focus is on two month modules, three month modules, and then looking at that as vocational uh, training and then, you know, putting people into certain vocations which don't really last. So there's no argument against doing this program and we also do these programs and uh, they work quite well. Uh, but our thrust now is on institutional skill development, looking at IPIs, looking at diploma institutes and looking at how that architecture in the state can be significantly enhanced. And within that architecture, you know, so for example, currently there are three ITIs that we run in Jharkhand, okay, and then they're reasonably regarded. Most, almost 100% of the courses in these ITIs uh, are actually, have nothing to do with the mining value chain or the steel value chain. You know, most of them are actually have to do with, you know, vocations which are away from these value chains, equally remunerated. You know, sometimes the end vocation being in these areas or even away from these areas. 
so i mean last year we had 23 20 no sorry about 19 boys and girls actually go to hong kong from itis in jharkhand you know so those things are possible so you create opportunities and you know and and, and frankly <laughs> You know, mining is not an easy job. You know, mining value chain is not an easy place to be associated with, especially the as you move into tier two, uh, tier one parts of the value chain. So I think if you create options and obsessively work on those, I think there's a way out. And also to look at some of the mines that are closing down, I think there were there have been recent experiences where some of our mines were actually changing hands, or we are the you know end of the contractual period, etc. Uh, we're absolutely committed to stay in that area for at least two or three years after the mining closure. To you know, see our long-term promises through. You know, there's there's no question around that. I mean, that's why I mean that's the commitment of the foundation. Uh, also, I think uh, what was really heartening, we spoke about collaboration. This is an experience in Odisha where, you know, some of our minds were, uh, you know, we were transferring some of our minds to prospective, uh, you know, parties who would have probably taken the mine over. You know, some of them public, some of them private, for almost six months. In the run-up to the transition, we actually worked together, you know, in creating a complete handover plan. And uh, you know, eventually the mine remained with us, but we actually had a draft MOU in place, saying that from a community perspective, you know, these are things things that will continue. This is the kind of capacity we'll build. This is what will happen. So, you know, there's a HR transition, there's a this thing transition, but a lot of these closures we forget a community transition. You know, so if we just prioritize that at the same level as some of the other things, I, I, I. Think we should be quite okay. Thank you. I don't know if that answers you so, but yeah. yeah absolutely. Mm -hmm. So, any questions from the audience, or maybe I will ask another question. Uh, good afternoon, sir. This is Rakesh Vajir. I am a regional director with Biof Development Research Foundation. Uh, thanks Hi, for good that. Afternoon, yeah. Thanks for that insightful uh, presentation. Uh, one point which you mentioned really struck me on that well-being corridor that you were mentioning. Uh, though you don't have any operations, but still uh, you are developing that area. So one like uh, one issue that we are facing in the morning also we saw, and in your presentation also we saw, uh, the East region is uh, resource-rich but poor on the development indices. But as we have seen, most of the CSR support goes to like states like Maharashtra and Gujarat. We also have that experience. Like our most of our projects are there. So how do you yeah. like as a leader like uh, like Tata? They have a kind of say in. Uh, in this sector. So as a, a leader in this, how do we change that? Like, is there anything that you taking up to change this kind of uh, mindset? Because most of the corporates who don't have any area specific issues, they want it to be near their headquarters. They want the project to be near their headquarters. So Mumbai, so they want to be in, in Pune or uh, in Palghar that way. So how do we change that kind of, uh, the, like, is there anything that is being done at uh, Tata? Thank you. So, uh, no, uh, I mean, thank you. Thank you for the question. And I think you come from an organization for which I have a lot of regard for. So, you know, I, I think you, you do some excellent work. Uh, so, I see the question of geography is, I think, uh, particularly for large spenders, you know, the question of geography has to be sort of, you know, relooked. Because, uh, you know, within a certain set of panchayats or within one district, uh, I don't even know if it's good practice to pump in a lot of money at the same time. You know, I, I, I'm not even sure if the development outcomes uh, or social outcomes are actually, uh, social outcomes are not always a, you know, a function only of the kind of, you know, money that is being spent on that, right? So sometimes it, it, it leads to, uh, I don't know where it goes incentive wise, that's one. Uh, second, I, our experience uh, has been that, you know, some of the large spenders uh, across the country uh, you know, if they have partners of choice, they are very happy to come into areas where there is a need. And, you know, as we go across the country, some of the largest banks, IT companies, etc. are actually investing through us. Uh, sometimes with into Tadzi Foundation, sometimes we're getting them into, you know, and then linking them up with, uh, you know, civil society organizations who we believe in. 80% uh, of the time, it's just that, you know, the case hasn't been made very well, uh, honestly. And uh, as I said, from a need perspective, most organizations come, want to come and work where their need is. And uh, I, I don't have the numbers, but my gut feel would say that, you know, if you look at the largest, 10 largest spenders uh, on CSR, if you will, you know, there would be a set of PSUs. There would be, you know, and, and most of private companies. And the last part of the private companies have such large amounts that you're investing. You can't really keep investing in and around your 
uh, you know uh, area so there's a very natural reason to go beyond and then if someone goes and makes the case compellingly and correctly for a need on the need then i think that that i think that gets done to mujhe utna problem nahi dikha hai piche mare paas yeah there is a question before that i think i have a question for you uh, in the last sure. session we discussed about uh, the recent amendments in the you know csr uh, i would say uh, policy the 2021 amendment and uh, there it's very important for companies to now measure uh, measure objectively the kind of impact that you are making uh, for any program any project now uh, for such audits to happen uh, there are multiple uh, i would say uh, frameworks there like social return of in equity, uh, investment is something that people are looking at so anything from a tata steel foundation perspective that you have institutional as a framework for measuring impact because you mentioned about some of the projects uh, would like to share something about the impact so all our work whether it's building a community center or whether it's work like mansi or whether it's work like work like our education program you know everything happens with a log frame a logical framework or a theory of change uh, first of all however you know uh, chota or however however massive that theory of change is right so that's that's the first uh thing to do because if you don't create your programs with a theory of change there's actually nothing to measure or nothing to evidence that's that's number one uh second or i mean all of all all our programs have an impact assessment framework uh and and are get evidence if not measured uh multiple times uh and 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 that's 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 the thing to do the way we look at evidence is you know if you're not measuring if you're not evidencing uh you know forget what forget what the law needs us to do at the end of the day if we go and stand in front of let's say a sarpanch or a community unko kya bolenge ki kaam ho raha hai ki nahi ho raha hai you know that it's it's a question of accountability it's not a question of law or regulation right now having said that if when you mentioned sroi uh, you know we have uh, well we have a views on sroi per se because if it's if you're looking at the social return on investment what it does is and you know i mean our, our friends from deloitte would know that quite well it also needs you to attribute a financial value to most uh, social outcomes okay now if you're skilling someone and you say that okay ye skill development program ke baad this is let's say the starting salary that has been received and for the next 10 years this seems to be the imputed value of the starting salary attributing a financial value to that is fine that's that's doable okay you worked with a you you uh, you worked with panchayats and set up child protection committees which have avoided let's say 10 child marriages you know now honestly what financial value do you ascribe to that so the issue with sroi and i'm very happy to hear that because where we are struggling with right now as far as sroi is concerned is that the moment you start putting in a financial value uh, and given that it's a management decision making tool you know your resource allocation only goes towards what you can measure and some of the most fundamental social problems you can't measure you can't quantify you can measure or you can evidence but you can't quantify you know and whoever is adopting sroi my my humble submission again is to you know please look at it from this lens that if you only solve what we can measure then i i am not sure if you're doing you know the best uh, thing measure quantify it there are anecdotal measurements there are research tools which don't emphasize quantification so measurement is often mistaken for quantification and i think that's uh, something to be avoided thank you i think we are the close of the session so request the yes, for the felicitation it, to happen uh, it would have been an honor to felicitate you by our dignitaries in person sir nonetheless a token of remembrance from ccl shall soon be reaching you by post thank you so much sir thank you so much for connecting with us today a big round a big thank round you. of applause for our speaker thank you thank you very much and uh, it was a privilege to be with you today and my apologies again for not being there in person thank you thank you very much thank you thank you sir uh, sir you can now disconnect the call uh, not only this conclave has become a marker of success of csr at coal india but it has also allowed us to meet some of the brilliant minds of the country at a single platform cil along with its subsidiaries and other psus and implementing agencies have tried to showcase their csr efforts by means of an artistic 3d model standees banners etc 
The same is being displayed in the pavilion just outside the auditorium on your left hand side. Also, a specimen, specimen books by our honorable speakers are authored by some of our speakers is also displayed in the pavilion. Hence, um, uh, the pavilion will be inaugurated by our dignitaries and an award will be given for the best CSR stall. I would uh, re now request uh, Director Personal and uh, IR, uh, School India, uh, Sri Vinay Ranjan sir, and uh, D uh, Director Personal CCL, Sri Rao sir, to, along with other dignitaries, to please proceed for the inauguration of the pavilion. Yeah. So uh, we will be now uh, going for that pavilion uh, inauguration followed by lunch, and we will be uh, assembling here at 2.30. At 2.30, we will be assembling here. The next session is from uh, Mr. Srinath. He's from Tata Trust. So he has come all the way from Tirupati. Yesterday, he was in Tirupati. And then he uh, traveled all the way from Tirupati to Bangalore by bus route. And then catch the uh, morning flight from Bangalore to Rachi. So we must honor his commitment. That's why we will be requesting you to be here at 2.30 p.m. sharp.
and has held different positions in different Tata companies. He is presently holding the position of CEO of Tata Trust, which is a philanthropic arm of Tata Group. 66% Six, of the equity of Tata Sons, the holding entity of Tata Group, continues in, is, is held in the Tata Trust and dividend flow directly to support the philanthropic activities of the trust. Through the, sen through the century, Tata Trust have constantly endeavored to empower, enable, and transform communities across India while improving the quality of life of the tribal, unserved and underprivileged, backward and minority sections and others with a special focus on women and children. Sri N. Srinath has been awarded the Distinguished Aluminous Award by IIM Calcutta in 2020. With these words, I hand over the stage to you, sir. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you very much. Is this on? Can you hear me? Yeah, OK. Thank you. Uh, good afternoon, and uh, thank you again for uh, inviting me to be a part not on. This is the volume of Sir's uh, mic. Check. Better? Yeah, okay. Check. Okay. Um, let me start again. Thank you again for uh, inviting me to be a part of this uh, conclave. It's a great honor for us to be here and to be able to talk about the work that we're doing in the trust. Uh, the topic I've chosen is a slightly different one. Um, it's a little bit of the mapping of the journey of the trust themselves uh, in terms of, as many of you are aware, um, we have been in operation for more than 100 years as a trust. Uh, and we started with a certain intent. And our intent has changed over time with the changing requirements of uh, the social sector of CSR requirements with the change in laws. Uh, with the presence and entry of a lot of other people into the social sector space as well. So we've tried to stay aligned with the requirements of uh, the people that we are trying to serve. Uh, and in the journey, I think we have gone through several important transformations, which I thought it will be interesting for you to hear uh, from a standpoint of the kind of experience that our trusts themselves have gone through. Um, I think I'd like to start with... Uh, probably the most quoted um, quote of our founder. And I think this epitomizes the Tata Group more than anything else. Um, I've been in the group now for 35 years. I complete 36 years in June. Uh, but to each of us, whether you're in business or you're in the trust or in any part of the business or any part of the operations, um, the community is an important part of who we are. The community that we work with, the community that we are part of, the communities that we engage with, where we hire our people, the products that we sell to, almost anything that we do, uh, the community is seen as the central, most important part of whatever we do. And having them as a, having them as an active stakeholder and a participant in what we do, I think, is core to what the group stands for. And this is something that we've all lived by since the 1860s, when the first plant was set up. A little bit of the history of the trust, um, as I mentioned. Uh, it started with um, in the early 1900s with uh, the uh, setting up of the JN Tata Endowment. The JN Tata Endowment was effectively a support program for people seeking higher studies. It was identify the meritorious students that we have in the country and give them opportunities to get higher learning uh, in places where they may not be able to afford the education themselves. Uh, we are a total of more than 17 or 18 trusts. Multiple trusts have been set up at different points in time. We call ourselves together the Tata Trust. The Tata Trust is more of a brand than a corporate entity. The corporate entity is the SDTT, SRTT, and so on, the individual trust that we have. Um, and you will see that there are multiple milestones that we have uh, in the journey of the trust. And I'll just take you through some of the important ones. Um, many of you are aware that the Indian Institute of Science was set up by the founder. He didn't, unfortunately, uh, live to see its completion. But he initiated the setting up of the Indian Institute of Science. Uh, we set up the uh, Tata Memorial Cancer Hospital in 1941, uh, set up the Tata Institute of Social Sciences, Tata Institute of Fundamental Research, and many, many more institutions. And that's been an important part of who we are and what we've been trying to do. And I'll cover that in one of the subsequent pages in terms of how institutions have played a very important role 
in the evolution of the group. In terms of the kind of work that we've done, we started off largely as an individual grants making organization focused on helping people with individual problems of medical. Change the mic. Sorry. Apologies. My glasses. If I take off my glasses, maybe. Are you able to hear me now? Is this better? Okay. So we started off largely as a individual grant making organization supporting individuals who had difficulty in medicine or medical kind of support or education support. We moved from there to making grants to other organizations who were involved in the sector who were supporting philanthropic activities of some kind. Uh, in the last 20 years, uh, more and more, uh, because of challenges that we've seen in the last mile, we've gone into direct implementation ourselves. Uh, a lot of the programs that we do, and I'll talk about some of the programs, uh, we implement ourselves. And uh, the structure that we have is uh, we're focused on specific themes that we think are of national importance and national significance that we think we should be playing in. Uh, and we have a whole bunch of associate organizations, some of whom you'll see, uh, that are distributed geographically and that help us to implement the programs that we're trying to implement. From direct implementation, I think uh, the subject of today's talk, I think, becomes important, where philanthropy has become a lot more complex than what we thought it was. And I want to take a couple of minutes to talk specifically about that. All of us have done projects, all of us have done social projects, basically starting with some kind of problem identification, proof of concept, pilot scaling, and ultimately we get into some kind of impact assessment as well. What we are discovering more and more is that that's no longer the complete value chain. The value chain has a lot more elements in that. And I'll give you some examples. Market linkages become an important element of sustainability. Uh, creating institutions where you ultimately leave behind a self-help group or a federation or some kind of an organization where the community comes together the community manages the institution, the community runs the institution, the community benefits from the institution. Until you're able to get to that stage, the sustainability issue is always going to be open. When you do a program and you leave the program in the hands of individuals, the sustainability or the, the challenge of ensuring the continuity of that program is always going to be an issue. And therefore, more and more, I think the sector is veering towards the fact that Ultimately, what you have to leave behind are standalone organizations, maybe not necessarily standalone, but organizations that are effectively from the community, of the community, and by the community, which are in a position to be able to govern and manage the programs on their own and take it forward for their own benefit. Uh, financial inclusion is becoming extremely important. More and more realize that a lot of the use cases that we are supporting have good business cases for commercial lending. So we've started to talk a lot more. State Bank of India has been very helpful, very forthcoming. Um, in terms of wanting to support some of the programs that we've done. And we believe that, I'll give you some examples, right? So theoretically, if a person is getting into a piggery project, the first two pigs typically become a difficult, uh, difficult bankable proposition because the cash flows are not there and the banks want that comfort that there's going to be an annual kind of income coming in. But the third pig, once you've done the two, the incremental capex for subsequent, subsequent livestock, the third pig fourth pick or the third, third cow or the fourth cow or whatever, those business cases are much more viable from a banking standpoint. And we've got many, many cases now. I have a case of a lady who effectively started off with two cows and then went and bought five more cows with bank finance and has paid back all the money, right? And now her income has gone to three, four times the income that she started with. And she's able to, not only is she able to kind of promote or run her own operations, but she's effectively able to support other people who are trying to do the same thing as well. So there are many, many stories like this of people who managed to make sustainable livelihoods on the back of good financial modeling. Um, market leakages we talked about. Everybody is now talking about skilling. Skilling is becoming the new mantra. And you find that, for example, in a household, if you are providing education support to the children, if you're providing some kind of agricultural support to the male, if you're providing some kind of other livelihood kind of support to the, to the, the lady of the house, uh, there's always somebody else who can benefit from a skilling program who can help to supplement the income as well. And this is becoming more and more an important part of our own programs where um, we have multiple skilling initiatives. We have a separate entity called Tadas Tribe, which does skilling across multiple areas. We're now setting up two Indian Institute of Skills, one in Ahmedabad, one in Mumbai. Uh, which we announced recently, the, the start of, not start of, but the, the initiation of, uh, where the intention is to create new generation skilling programs for the next generation of uh, people coming into the labor force. 
So skilling is becoming important. Extension of skilling more and more is becoming entrepreneurship. People are talking about rural value chains, talking about self-contained self cycles of people who are able to generate income opportunities for themselves without necessarily working for somebody else. So rural value chains are also becoming important. Somebody who provides a nursery service to people who are doing agriculture, somebody who provides transportation services or cold storage sources to people who are doing dairy, things like that, where you're able to create a business opportunity around an existing value chain, even in the rural sector. So there are many opportunities like that. Um, Behavior change communication, I think, is worth, is worth mentioning. I'd just like to take a moment and talk about that. More and more, you realize that if you don't get the community completely aligned to what you're trying to do, the questionability of, or the question of sustainability comes up again. And the only way among the various things that you need to do to make your program sustainable is to ensure that you leave lasting change in the mindset and thinking of people. And this is not just advertising, or this is not just promotion, or whatever. This is where you're able to sit down with the community, able to understand where their feelings are, where their biases are, where their pros and cons of something is, and then to be able to work with them to change their mindset and to change their behavior. This is particularly becoming important in one of the programs I'd like to talk about, our cancer program, where we're going actively to talk about, uh, talk against abuse of tobacco. And that's, I think, a fairly complex behavior change uh, story that you need, because the stigmas on cancer are so many, and the myths and fears around cancer are so many. How do we do this? What has been the focus areas for us? How have we tried to choose the programs that we have done? And how do we run these programs? Um, clearly, the programs have to be issues of national significance. And I think the examples given there, health, nutrition, livelihood, and so on, kind of pick themselves. These are clearly national priorities. Coal India also has focused quite heavily on both uh, health and livelihood. I've seen that the work that you've done in the past focuses quite a bit on health and livelihood. So those are two very important sectors for us. Health is probably our bigger sector, if I include cancer as well, followed very closely by livelihood. These two are the two biggest sets of programs that we have. Uh, but again, we do programs in education, we do programs in water and sanitation, and we do programs in nutrition as well. We have other 10 or 15 smaller sectors where we are involved. We're involved in sports, we're involved in arts and crafts and so on, but that's relatively smaller compared to the big five that we have. Um, but having done that, um, you still need to apply all of the latest techniques, the latest in terms of innovation, the latest in digital capability, the latest in terms of the people that you can get. We, to get the best people and to get them motivated. And, and fortunately, people are willing to come and work in the sector. So getting people, uh, we, have, we have people fresh out of the MBA classes who come and work for us. So getting people to come and work in the sector is becoming more and more easy. But you need to get the best talent if you're supposed to drive some of the programs that you want to do. Um, and again, somebody like the trust, uh, because of the history that we have of working with the community, because the sheer reach and scale that we have, um, our ability to catalyze and converge the participation of other people is that much more, that much easier. I'm able to go to somebody and say, look, we need some help. And by and large, people generally don't say no. People are willing to come forward and help. So being able to catalyze other people's efforts, being able to bring multiple partners into the program, I think is a very important thing, of important part of what we do. Sorry about that. Yeah. Um, in terms of uh, in terms of the kind of programs, I spoke about the themes. The themes in blue are the five big themes that we have, and the other themes that we are are all in the black. I'd just like to draw your attention to the center of that of that particular circle. Um, the nature of programs that we do, and I think this is how we've chosen to define the kind of programs that are important for us and the kind of programs that we focus on. Um, and clearly, this is where uh, I talked about programs of national significance, national importance. And our focus clearly is at the people at the bottom of the pyramid. Um, and that's, that's a prime focus of all the programs that we drive. And even at the bottom of the pyramid, the focus is specifically on women and children. Because even at the bottom of the pyramid, they tend to be even more, um, even more differentially disadvantaged as compared to the men. So the focus is people at the bottom of the pyramid in programs of national significance, women and children. But then I think the other three variables are equally important. Um, the programs that we do have to have impact. There's no point in saying that I'm into a community where 50,000 people are impacted by some problem, and I've solved the problem for five of them. So you've got to do it at least for 5%, 10%, or a reasonable set of the population that you're dealing with for it to have impact. The program has to have scale. The uh, program must be, able to, must be able to ultimately cover a reasonable set of, um, of the impacted population again. How are you able to take the, the benefits of livelihood or education to a large number of people in the community and then expand that to other communities as well. 
And last but not least, it has to be sustainable. More and more, we're looking at programs where if we don't have a good, good ability to leave a sustainable story behind, we're increasingly asking ourselves if we should be even entering that program. Is that something we should be doing? Um, and I think that's the way the sector is going. More and more, it's becoming based on you have to ultimately create sustainability in all that you do. Otherwise, you're not really completing the task that you set out to do. Yeah. A um, couple of things in terms of uh, how do we work with other people. And I think it's an important perspective that we bring, which is um, we are very clear that for us to have a complete story, for us to be able to take an effective program out into market, there are multiple capabilities that we need to bring to bear. And uh, we've tried to do that by aggressively going out and finding partners to work with to help us in our programs. And I think um, I'll talk a little bit more about this in a couple of pages down. But the academic institutions has been a great source of support for us. We've supported, worked with multiple universities in India and around the world. Um, and that has been a great source of knowledge. That has been a great source of information. That has been a great source of us being able to create the capability that we need to be able to identify a lot of these programs. Second, um, many of our programs have tended to be partnerships in themselves. And I'll talk one example a little bit down the road, the India Climate Collaborative. So again, where we believe it's, not, it's important for multiple people, like-minded people, similar ideas, similar thoughts, similar motivations to come together to be able to drive an agenda forward. All our programs uh, have some form of partnership in them. Dhani is our dairy program. Uh, we run five dairies around the country. We're doing it in partnership with NDDB. So clearly, work with other organizations who we believe have the capability to help support our programs and where we believe the program can benefit by that kind of a partnership. Our presence is about 150 odd districts at this point in time. Uh, we've done multiple, multiple programs, more than 1,500 programs uh, over over the course of time. Um, and the impact has been pretty much across the board. As you will see the map, uh, we are in almost every state you can think of. So we have a fairly very wide national presence in all the programs that we do. A little bit about some of the programs, going a little bit deeper into some of the work that we do. Um, and the way we do this is for the big five programs, the big five teams at least, for the health, education, nutrition, we sat down and identified what are the areas of priority, what are the areas that require support from us, what are the areas that require an intervention of somebody like the Tata Trust. And then you ask the question, who is doing what kind of work at this point in time, what kind of government support is available, what are the priorities of government, what is government doing in each of these geographies. And then you go back and figure out, these are the kind of programs, these are the kind of interventions it makes sense for us to be in. So if you go back and look at each of these themes, we're not in all of the theme. We're in specific interventions that we've identified as being important for us as the Tata Trust to be part of, and have stayed focused on those. And I'll give you some examples. If you look at WASH, for example, right, our focus is more on, on water distribution and water availability in the household as part of the Jaljeevan Mission kind of program. Uh, if you look at a lot of other parts of uh, the water water value chain, we're not in some of those, right? So we've been very focused in terms of the kind of areas that we want to pick in. In education, for example, we're focused heavily on early children, childhood, early childhood education. We're focused heavily on teacher training. We're focused heavily on new new types of digital learning. But again, specifically focused on the areas that we think are important for us to go after. Um, and uh, as you can see, we cover a fair number of areas. and. Uh, these will be the areas of focus for us going forward, at least for some time. Just some examples of some of the pro sorry, some examples of some of the programs that we've done. I'll cover two programs in some detail. Um, let me just give you a flavor of some of the big themes that we've. Done. is our is our flagship program. I'll talk about it in some level of detail because we made good progress in that. Uh, the NCD program is where we are working with partners to help screen for uh, uh, NCDs across the country. As you can see, fairly significant target population that we're going after. This is becoming more important for us now when we look at our cancer program as well, where the outreach program and the need to screen people for early detection of cancer is becoming more and more important. And prevention, obviously, is a much better way to treat cancer than to try and cure it. Um, nutrition fortification has been a big part of what we've done. We focused on fortification of rice. We focused on fortification of milk. We've done fortification of salt. We've done uh, a fair amount of work with multiple states. We've worked in different geographies. We worked with the Food Safety uh, and Security uh, Council of India. We helped support some of the initiatives in terms of standard setting, in terms of identifying how fortification should work and how fortification should be made into a systemic process around the country. So both that system strengthening 
as well as at individual fortification programs across the state we've played across uh, both those value chains. Yeah, um, sorry, I just lost one. Parag, I think, is something I'd like to take a moment. Um, education was hit very badly by COVID. Uh, this was something that is a big focus area. Early childhood education, uh, primary school education is important for us. And with the schools being shut for nearly two years, uh, the programs collapsed quite badly. And what we did, as many other people did, is we did two workarounds. One was to basically get into community learning, where we identified volunteers that we were able to put in schools, houses, colleges, wherever you could, any op open space that was available, get together six or seven children, and try and keep some continuity alive with the school system. One of the lessons that we learned in our other programs was if the child falls out of the school system, getting a child back into the school system is much more difficult than sustaining education. So we were at any cost trying to ensure that there was some continuity, even if it was flimsy, some kind of association continuing with the education system. And therefore, community learning became more and more important. The second thing that we did, which also worked pretty well, was the Parag program. Parag is our library program, school library program. And what we did is we basically expanded the number of libraries, expanded the number of books, just put more books out there in, the in front of more children, and also started creating things like Jolna libraries, where people would walk around with books and distribute books to children and things like that. This is also something that worked pretty well in the middle of the lockdown. Uh, so this is something, again, which we think is a very important program. We are actively, actively developing books, illustrating books, um, and making books available in multiple languages and multiple formats for children around the country. Cancer care I'll talk about in some detail. Wash, Jaljeevan, I did cover a little bit. Yeah. Lakpati Kisan is, uh, is basically our one of probably our flagship program. It's a program that we've been running for the longest. It's been running roughly about six or seven years across the geography. We're working on roughly five lakh families as the target audience for us to be addressing the Lakpati Kisan program. The basic premise of Lakpati Kisan is that uh, agriculture gives you, let me come back, just, I'll just come back to this. Agriculture roughly gives you between 30 and 30,000 rupees per year as family income. And what we are trying to do is to, by calling it a Lakpati Kisan program, we're trying to earn, we're trying to change the family income above one lakh of rupees. Um, and we're doing that through a set of interventions. I'll show you a short film which will give you an idea of what it is we're trying to do. Could you roll the film, please? मेरा नाम जिनिद मीज है गांव बड़ा पांडू ब्लॉक मुरहू हम लोग 2015 से संस्था से जुड़े सिनी के साथ और नवभारत जागृति के साथ खेतीबाड़ी का काम शुरू किए लेकिन जब संस्था से जुड़े तो दादा लोग आए और किस बीमारी में कौन वाला दवा का स्प्रे करना है वो सब बताए और अब हम लोग अच्छी तरह से खेती कर रहे हैं पोली हाउस से करीब करीब छः लाख का पौधा यहाँ से निकालते हैं और किसान दादा दीदी लोग उसमें से लगाते हैं उस पौधा को जो कि स्वयरलेस पौधा होता है और उसको लगा करके काफ़ी आमदनी किसान दादा दीदी लोग का हो रहा है जो कि रोग रहित पौधा बनता है हर मौसम में हम लोग तरह तरह का सब्जी लगाते हैं गर्मी में तरबूज का खेती करते हैं करेला खीरा मिर्च सब लगाते हैं और टपक सिंचाई भी उससे भी हम लोग काम करते हैं करीब दो एकड़ में टपक सिंचाई के साथ मार्चिंग भी है उसमें हम लोग काम करते हैं उसमें पानी काम खर्च होता है और खेती भी अच्छा होता है अभी हम लोग का साल भर का आमदनी सब्जी खेती से साल भर में दो लाख जैसा होता है और हम लोग लखपति किसान हैं और गांव की कुछ दीदियां लखपति किसान बन गई है और सभी दीदियों को हम लोग सहयोग करेंगे और सभी दीदियों को लखपति किसान बनाएंगे The basic model of Lakpati Kisan is basically layering. Uh, and that is to say that uh, if a person has only agriculture, primary agriculture as the income, because the land holdings are extremely small, and the farmers you're dealing with are marginalized farmers, the opportunity to scale your agricultural programs is very limited. So you get between 30, 35,000 rupees, typically per family per year as income. That's obviously very difficult to live on. So what we've looked at is interventions in livestock, interventions in uh, forestry products, interventions in orchards, interventions in lac, 
interventions in livestock, anything which can supplement uh, the income. So what we have is different models that we've developed. For example, we developed a program for piggery, we developed a program for poultry, we developed a program for dairy, uh, developed programs for lac, developed programs for a whole bunch of whole bunch of initiatives. And what we find is that every one of these layers adds 30 and 1,000 rupees of income per year. If you're able to put two of them together, three of them together, four of them together, then what happens is that typically you're able to kind of mitigate the risk of a bad crop or a bad or a bad pest wiping out uh, your entire crop of a particular year. And this has been very successful. I'll share some details. We've done an impact assessment on this, and I'll share some statistics that the third party has found of what the efficacy of the program has been. Uh, but I think it's worthwhile to see. It has the elements of all that I spoke about, the scale. We're looking at, in, I'll talk, the example I'll give you is about one lakh households, but ultimately we're going to go to five lakh households. It has impact because it's clearly directly focused on increasing the livelihood of the family. And there are examples to say 30,000 rupees has gone to 80,000 rupees, 30,000 rupees has gone to 1 lakh, 20,000 rupees. And the ripple effects of that are enormous. Uh, and I can take some examples uh, where we found that, uh, let's take an agricultural example, and we've done this in South Rajasthan, we've done this in Jharkhand, in fact. In fact, one of the, one of the good examples is the work that we've done in Jharkhand where we provide some kind of water mechanism or a water irrigation system for a, house, for a, for a village or a bunch of uh, cluster of houses in a village. And what that does is we typically use some kind of solar intervention. We do a solar lift system either from a perennial water, reverse perennial water source like a river or a well of some kind. We're able to provide irrigation. The irrigation allows a set of households to be able to irrigate their land, increase the quality of crops, grow a second crop, maybe a third crop, maybe intersperse vegetables in the middle of their regular cereal growing season. And what that does is it, one, enables better nutrition. In many cases, because the household is growing vegetables for consumption, they're also able to get better levels of nutrition. More importantly, availability of water means the, the, the lady of the house no longer spends seven hours collecting water. She no longer is stressed out because she just spent seven hours collecting water and then taking care of the household on top of that. So suddenly she has leisure on her hands. She's getting better nutrition. She has more time to spend with the children. The husband is no longer out there doing distress work because he no longer has to go and find a job because the house is no, there's no agriculture, there's no water, there's no nothing. So he no longer has to go look for distress livelihood somewhere else. He's available to support some of the activities of the family. The ripple effects that any one of these programs has is enormous, right? And I think that's something which we should not underestimate that typically we think we're intervening in one space. It's not, you're really intervening in the entire life of the entire family. And therefore, there are a lot of spin-offs that you could get as benefits. Uh, just take you through some of them, and I'll take you to the uh, um, <laughs> take you to the benefit in the end. Yeah, this is I've covered most of that. Okay, let me take you to the impact assessment page. Yeah, so this is a study that was done by a third party for us, um, and what it says, if you look on the left, is the state-wise average annual income. The blue line uh, is after the intervention, and the green line is before the intervention. And if you look at it, in Gujarat, they started at a family income of 47,000. That ended up at a lakh and seven. Similarly, at uh, Maharashtra, 47,000, lakh and one. Odisha, 35,000 to 85,000. And if you look at state-wise families that cross the one lakh annual income mark, roughly half the households in Gujarat, Jharkhand, and Maharashtra have crossed that one lakh per year kind of mark. So this is a fairly important and fairly sustainable kind of story that has happened. Where we are in this program is that this program has been running in these geographies for the last five years. Out of a lack of families, we moved 50,000 above the one lakh line. The remaining 50,000 are sitting at about 70,000, 80,000 rupees. So in the next five years, the program is going to focus on taking the remaining 50,000 people over the one lakh line. But more importantly, more importantly, for the 50,000 who have crossed that line, how do you ensure that whatever work you've done is sustainable? And the way we're doing that is to create institutions and uh, yeah, and the way we're doing that is to basically set up institutions of, it started off as self-help groups which were focused on a particular activity, part of agriculture, part of water and so on. The self-help groups came together to form federations or producer organizations. In many cases, these organizations are entirely run by women. The women are the shareholders, the women are the board of directors, and the women are the ones who decide how the initiative will be taken forward, which is why even in the film, the person that you saw, the lady, was speaking. Um, and <coughs> sorry, 
we have any number of uh, success stories and I have quite a few examples from Jharkhand itself where we've had a very successful run with creating institutions. But now the institutions are starting to ask questions. I've got, we had 200 shareholders we were able to manage. Now we've got 2,000 shareholders. How do we manage complexity? Many of the issues that we are going through as business people are exactly the same issues that they're facing. I was in Jharkhand two months ago. And uh, we had seven of these institutions into a room. And they were doing a five-year plan. And I was completely bold away saying, in the companies, we don't do five-year plans effectively. Here were ladies in a cooperative doing a five-year plan, asking questions about what went well, what did not go well, what do we need to do in the next five years, what is the vision of the future, and so on. So it's, it's quite interesting how, given the motivation, given the right tools and the right support, people are able to step forward to want to do things that have a significant impact on the quality of life. The other. Uh, Sorry. And, and, and the interventions go across multiple things. We've tried to adopt technology. We've tried to adopt digital technology, solar technology. We've tried to bring anything and everything that was available out in the market um, into these particular programs. Many of them are in a pilot phase, but we're able to scale some of these programs as well. I talked about uh, uh, entrepreneurship. We have livestock entrepreneurs. We have dairy entrepreneurs. We have uh, agricultural entrepreneurs. So we've done entrepreneurship. We're now bringing skilling into this in a big way. Uh, financial inclusion has happened. We've done financial support of, of livestock. We've done financial support um, of some of the non, uh, or some of the timber kind of non-forest forest products as well. So we are able to get financial inclusion into the model as well. Okay. The other big program that we've been running for the last uh, four or five years um, is the cancer care program. And I'll talk a little bit about how we came at this. Um, and I talked about the reason, the, the focus that we have is to focus on issues which are of national importance, focus on programs which are scale, impactful, and sustainable. The cancer program was started to address three basic issues in cancer treatment. One, cancer is always detected very late. That's the first problem that we have. Most people don't get detected for cancer until they're at stage three or stage four, by which time there's not much you can do if you take a person into hospital. Second, Cancer treatment is not available locally. Access to cancer treatment is difficult. So people have to travel great distances to get treated for cancer. Um, and this is a problem because cancer treatment is sustained. If you go through a chemotherapy session, it could take you six weeks, eight weeks. You do a radiation session, it could take you six weeks, eight weeks. You have to pick up your bags, baggage, family, and go and live some, some other city or some other location, lose sight of your livelihood for a month, two months, three months and then get treated. So it's a very expensive proposition. Access to cancer treatment is also limited. And because of this, what we have seen is many people don't complete the entire course. People drop out after three rounds of chemo, three rounds of radiation. And that, unfortunately, is not effective. If you don't complete the entire course of treatment, then the, the medication is not going to be effective in curing you or treating you for cancer. So the availability, or the access to treatment was, was the second issue. And the affordability was a third. If you have to pick up your family and go live somewhere else for two months, I'll give you examples. I mean, 20 years ago, there were people sleeping outside the streets of Tata Memorial Hospital in Peril. You had multiple hospitals come up, but you still have people sleeping outside the streets of Tata Memorial Hospital in Peril, because that's the kind of demand for services that you have. So that's how this whole concept started. And we came up with basically a multi-layer model. And the multi-layer model says that in many cases, cancer treatment is really inpatient treatment. You don't even have to Sorry, it's really outpatient treatment. You don't even have to get admitted for chemo. You don't have to get admitted for radiation. It's possible to come in in the morning, get your chemo session done, and go back home in the afternoon or evening. Similar for radiation as well. So we came up with a three-tier architecture for our cancer, cancer model. The bottom layer uh, is level three, which is basically a treatment center which has both chemo as well as radiation therapy, which allows a person to come in and get his chemo sessions or to get their radiation sessions. And that's something which, like I said, is pretty much an outpatient activity. So you don't need to have an extensive hospital, inpatient, operation theater, and so on. So the level three system, the tier three, is basically hospitals which are largely for treatment using chemo and radiation, and some diagnostics, but not no diagnostics, but some diagnostics. Level two is one level above that, which is all of level three, plus it has a lot of the inpatient capability as well. You're able to handle more complex cases. You're able to handle inpatients, do operations, and so on. And level one is that added level of complexity where you have an education institution, research institution attached to it. So we came up with this three-tier model. And what we've been trying to do is to basically implement it. Oops, yeah. 
across the country. We're building more than uh, 20 hospitals at this point in time. Um, you've got a map in terms of where they are. You talk about the L1, L2, L3, and so on. This distributed model is what we are working with both the state governments as well as with private uh, NGOs to figure out how we can implement this across different geographies. So at this point in time, we've got um, seven hospitals that we completed. We launched the Assam Hospital, seven hospitals in Assam uh, on the 28th. We launched Tirupati yesterday. Um, and we're going to be launching a hospital, Ranchi, uh, probably in the next month or so. So total of 30-odd hospitals, large number, about 17 hospitals of these are coming up in Assam. Assam is the place where we've implemented the model across the entire state. There are multiple level threes, multiple level twos, and one level one in Guwahati. Yeah. This is just a look of some of the hospitals we just inaugurated. Dibrugar was the site of the the inauguration itself, that's where the Honorable Prime Minister, the Honorable Chief Minister, and Mr. Tata were present when the inauguration happened. And all of these are the different hospitals that we have across the state. The creation of infrastructure is half the story, right? And like I said, if, you're, if the person comes late um, into the hospital and the detection has not happened in time, you're fighting a losing battle, right? And therefore, our view very clearly is that uh, the outreach program that we are running is as important as the infrastructure we are setting up. And the outreach program is focused on three or four things. First, the outreach program is focused on demystifying cancer. Um, the concerns, the myths, the superstitions of cancer. Everybody believes that if you have cancer, you're dead, right? Which is not so. If detected early, it treated to a large extent and allow a person to live a long and fruitful life. So it's important to catch the disease early. So the myths around cancer, the fears around cancer have to be alleviated. So communication around how we can break down some of the myths, break down some of the superstitions. Second, how do we get people to come in for early screening? How do we encourage people to, to come in for uh, early testing? So if you have any change in behavior, you have a problem swallowing, you have a problem with your digestion, with your digestion process in any form, how do we encourage people to come forward to get screened? Right? And there are a common set of cancers. We know what the common cancers are. Throat cancer, cervical cancer, breast cancer. We know all of that now. There's enough science available today. But unless people come forward to be screened and if found to be symptomatic, to go forward for testing, unless we have that happening around the country at an early stage, we're never going to get people early. We're always going to get people in stage 3 and stage 4 by the time when it's become too late to really cure the person. So the second and third legs are really around screening and testing. So what we're doing is basically going out into the community, getting people together, talking about the benefits of screening, trying to pull people into screening. We have mobile screening vans, which have basic capability. We have the ability to take the devices out into the field um, and to do screening in the field itself. This is a huge, huge challenge for us because the program, the screening is one, it takes a lot of time. It takes a huge effort to be able to screen all the people between 30 and 70 who are typically your high-risk profiles uh, for cancer. And that's something where more and more, we are starting to work with the primary health system in the states, the PHCs, the Anganwadi system, the ASHA workers, and so on, to get them trained to be able to do some of this. So this, to us, is really the biggest challenge that we have. How do we go out there and do mass screening of people in the age group 30 to 70, which is a substantial part of your population today? And if you're not able to do that screening early, if you're not able to do detection early, then you're not going to find the right treatment for cancer in time. So this is a huge part of what we do. The uh, last and I think important part is also dovetail into some of the important uh, government programs. For example, the anti-tobacco campaign that we have. How do you get people to, to stay away from high-risk behavior like tobacco abuse? Those are all clearly direct correlations to a high incidence of cancer. And therefore, how are you able to treat that is something we should be doing a lot more of. Okay, Just some statistics in terms of what we are setting up. I kind of covered that in, in some detail. Yeah. Uh, very quickly, a little bit about the collaborations and the institutions. Um, one of the important aspects, I think this is something which our chairman also said, is that a lot of the work that I've described to you today is really looking at today's solutions for today's problems. Right? We're talking about what you can do today with how are you treating diseases, how are you helping people find livelihoods, and so on. <coughs> but the challenge is more how do you find the answers or how do you find tomorrow's solutions for today's problems. And I'll give you one example again. Uh, we do a lot of malaria-related work in, in Odisha, for example, 
where our focus is again traditional, eliminate all stagnant water, find a way to provide pesticide treated mosquito nets and so on. Uh, but one of the institutions that we started recently, some time ago, five, six years ago, collaboration with the University of California at San Diego is, is an institution called the Tata Institute of Genetics and Society, where what they are doing is genetic research to identify how they can disrupt the life cycle of the Anopheles mosquito at different points in time and prevent the basic propagation of the vector itself. So this is where you're trying to see how modern genetics can help you modify the way the vector propagates in mosquitoes, how the mosquito reproduces, how the life cycle of the mosquito is impacted. And we're trying to do research into those areas to find tomorrow's solutions for exactly the same problem, which is malaria. So the combination is not only to continue to work on day-to-day -day issues as you have today, but also find how technology, how innovation, how development, how new progress that's happened in different sectors can also help you, can also help you find solutions to today's problems. So uh, Social Alpha is basically our innovation engine. Uh, it's basically an incubator which is focused on developing social enterprise, new companies which are working in the social sector. Again, they're working on areas <coughs> very similar to what I described. They're working in agri-tech, they're working in nutrition, they're working in health, um, they're working in uh, renewable energy, all of the sectors which are of importance uh, for the country going forward. Okay, um, I talked a little bit about the institutions, not gonna spend time, I think we're running out of time, so I'm gonna move to that very quickly. Collaboration is uh, something that I've stressed quite a bit. Partnerships and collaboration are an important part of ensuring that the work that you do is, is sustainable, is bringing the best solution to a particular problem, and is creating something which is sustainable well after the program is complete. Um, just give you an example of the India Climate Collaborative, which was a program that we anchored. We believe that the climate change issues are very serious and something which we all need to address as a society. We believe it's important that different people come together to address the problem. So what we did was we helped to we helped to initiate it. So in the ICC was set up inside the trust, was initially supported by the trust. And now what we are trying to do is to make it broad-based, get other partners into the system, make it an industry issue, make it a larger issue that the entire civil society can come together around and be able to make a mass movement out of it. So that's, again, an example of the kind of mission that we've been trying to do. Yeah. Uh, our response in COVID, uh, multi-pronged, again, specifically what we've been doing for the last two years, uh, big focus on PPE because at the point in time when we started, PPE didn't exist. Big focus on improving, increasing the number of hospital beds. We probably added about 10,000 hospital beds uh, in existing hospitals just by supplementing the infrastructure which they had. Uh, did a lot of training for doctors, nurses, and paramedics. We trained about 10,000 people in 2020. Uh, did a lot of behavior change communication around masking, social distancing, around appropriate behavior, hand wash, and so on. Um, and uh, more importantly, we did a program specifically for migrants where we found that since the migrant issue had gone completely out of hand, we had to find some way to get some income into their hands. So we set up programs by which they were able to connect them to existing programs and to be able to raise, raise money for them. So if you look at how much money, we raised almost 300 crores. Uh, for about two plus million uh, migrants who had no other source of income. Yeah. Okay. Um, a lot of people that we work with, and thank you to Coal India for the support that you've given us in some of the programs that we've run jointly. Uh, and uh, we're happy to work with you in other areas as well. But we work with a whole bunch of CSR partners, domestic and international. We work with a lot of foundations, both domestic and international. Um, of course, we work with a several set of institutions as well. And of course, we work with pretty much all the companies in the Tata Group as well. So just to kind of summarize, uh, if you look at what is it that we try to do, in some ways, I think the role that we are trying to play is more of a catalyst to basically bring together people who are all participants in the space in some form, uh, who have a role to play in different parts of the, of the ecosystem and find a way to get them together to address a particular issue of some level of national importance. So thank you very much. Nice to have uh, had the opportunity to be able to present this to all of you, and I'm quite happy to take any questions. Thank you. <laughs> thank you, Mr. Srinath. Uh, wonderful speech and presentation. Uh, just to summarize uh, some of the things that you mentioned was around uh, the entire problem statement to impact assessment, uh, the entire paradigm that you looked at. Uh, 
you sp spoke about the flagship programs, education, Parag, Cancer Care, WASH, and multiple others. Lakpati Kisan was a phenomenal uh, learning for me, as at least. And uh, last, of course, the catalyst, you know, in, in how the Tata Trust is becoming a catalyst for the change in the you know, entire society. So one question I had before I open up to audience, uh, we are now talking about social entrepreneurship. So creating uh, entrepreneurs who are investing in social. So you mentioned about seed funding, you mentioned about startups, the entire tech startup that you're looking at. What is the view and uh, your learning or uh, experience in terms of the social entrepreneurship creation within India and the regions that you're working? It's a lot, lot to be done. I think we're still at a fairly early stage in terms of uh, having a robust infrastructure for social enterprise like you have on the startup space in the commercial side. Um, I still think we have a long way to go. But I think there's a fair amount of interest. Um, and we are just one of m many players in the space. So we work with some of the other incubators as well. Because clearly, the more you're able to partner, the more you're able to identify opportunities of interest. Um, in terms of the process um, of actual incubation, we don't see it as being that different. right? The, 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 the process is pretty much the same. You have to find somebody with the right idea, help them through their various stages of going from incubation to at least some kind of uh, some kind of basic business model, some basic uh, proof of concept, and so on. That's not been very different. Um, I think, if anything, our experience has shown that uh, the effort to convert an idea to market, and I mean market in the context here is more of make it available at a scale on a commercial uh, scale somewhere, the challenge is there. The challenge we found is more there, uh, which is where one of the things that we're looking at doing from a trust perspective is I gave you some examples of the kind of work that we do. We're a big laboratory for anybody. right? So somebody wants to try out a new idea in agriculture. Somebody wants to try out a new technology in solar. Somebody wants to try out something new, for example, in health. right? We have the programs out there where potentially somebody could take that idea and go into that particular geography and try it out on a pilot basis. So that's something we're looking at. The challenge for us is how do you take the, while, while in the commercial world, there are umpteen opportunities for somebody to take something from a simple idea that's in somebody's mind all the way to a proof of concept to a business model. The challenges here are that it's a little bit of a steeper hill to climb. right? And that's where I think we need to support some of these organizations a little bit more. Um, we have lots of interesting stories. We have a company which basically used AI to come up with analysis of x-rays. That was a program that we supported because we're supporting TB research. So the whole idea started off with TB. But then COVID came along, and interestingly, COVID also is a is a lung impacting disease. So X-rays that we did for tuberculosis, very quickly we were able to repurpose the product to also look at evaluating COVID X-rays. Right. So there are many many interesting stories in terms of uh, in terms of what we are trying to do and what what is possible. I think it's something that we need to do a lot more focus on. It's something for the trust at least is going to be a fairly important focus area for us. Innovation is a huge part of what we do. Sure. Huge part of what we do. Sure. I think. Uh, Mr. Sairam has a question. Sir, uh, thank you very much for coming all the way from uh, distant place. Uh, my question is regarding your cancer initiative, sir. Uh, uh, you have said that uh, in Assam, in tier two, tier three cities, Kokrajhar, Tejpur, Darang, those places, you are establishing cancer hospitals to make a uh, uh, larger population available, uh, this thing. So uh, the question is, uh, while chemotherapy can be made available, even surgical oncology can be made available. Uh, chemotherapy requires just uh, you make uh, available the drugs and uh, chemotherapy can be administered. Similarly, you make available the uh, specialist uh, uh, surgical doctors and they will do all the uh, surgical oncology part. Uh, the only question is how to make available that radiation part because it requires some regulatory permissions, then safety issues, all that. So in those small places, suburbs, or even kasba like uh, city towns, how that thing can be made available? All 17 hospitals will have at least one LINAC machine. Um, if you look at the hospitals that we built today, all hospitals by default will have chemotherapy and radiation, both. Right. So that's the starting point. Yeah. Um, that's what I'd also said uh, when I spoke about this to us. You have to take the treatment closer to the patient. right? Otherwise, the patient is not going to sustain through 10 rounds of chemo, 15 rounds of radiation. This is unfortunately. It's unfortunately stressful, right? Physically stressful, emotionally stressful, financially stressful. And you need to help a patient navigate that entire course. As it is, the patient is scared. As it is, the patient doesn't understand what's going on. On top of that, you tell the person he has to come 15 times every two days, every three days. It's, it's very psychic. 
right? So the, the story for us was we had to take the treatment closer to the patient, which is why all the hospitals that you see, all 10 have provision for two Linux. We've installed one today. As soon as the load picks up, we'll install the second one, right? So, so the, all the permissions, et cetera, will be taken? All taken. Oh, operational very good. today. Nice, very good. Seven sir. hospitals we launched are operational today, right? right. right? And this is, this is the bare minimum. You can't, you can't not do this, right? What we've also added in the in this in the tier two in the tier two towns, particularly Barpeta and Dibrugar, the two big hospitals that you saw, um, you also have uh, you also have PET scan. Not only do you have the CT scan, but you also have the PET scan. So what it allows you to do is it allows you to do diagnostics at a far more radiation therapy is a little bit like a shotgun, right? You you kill the cancerous cells, but you also have collateral damage. Normal it's not system. exactly shotgun, but it's better than that. But I'm saying the basic solution is it also has collateral damage on good cells as well. So the more accurately you're able to identify where the particular cancerous cells are using things like a PT, like a PET scan, right? And the more you're able to do that, the more the better quality of Linac, which is what we've installed, each machine would probably cost about 15, 20, 20 crores today. Yes. And that's what we put. We put 10 of them so far. We'll put the rest as soon as the load starts picking up. So radiation and chemo exist everywhere. You have to take that to the, to the people. Um, other forms of diagnosis, you can start aggregating to the tier two or aggregating to tier one, depending on what is required. Tier two will have surgery. Tier one will have surgery plus this, plus more diagnostics as well. The more complex cases, some of the more specific cases, not the more traditional oral cancer or breast cancer or pelvic cancer. Some of the more rarer cancers we'll have to treat in the level one centers. But radiation is a, in all geographies, sir. Even in the tier three, there is radiation already built in. want to understand that whatever trust run by the Tata, I think this is totally, I think, the social welfare entities. Only. There is no income. Uh, there is business? earnings. Is, is that in any component of we have business? income is donations, but no earnings. Uh, that is what I want to know. Right. Yes. Okay. And second thing, uh, you have ne not ne is there any, uh, what about the CSRs? I think Tata has a lot of companies. Let me explain. So that. what are yeah. the component or contribution in what form that money is going to those trust? Let me explain As a that. Charity? Let me explain that. Uh, there's a lot of confusion about what the Tata Trust do and what CSR does. Uh, the structure of the group is the following, right? All of the operating companies exist, Tata Motors, Tata Steel, Chemicals, and so on. All of them ultimately tie into a holding company called Tata Sons. So Tata Sons is the holding company for all the operating companies of the group. Tata Trust is the holding company of Tata Sons. So the Tata Trust holds 66% of Tata Sons, right? We have no commercial activity at all. We are a pure philanthropic trust. We have zero commercial activity, right? All the money we get as dividends, all the money we earn as interest from the whatever treasury income that we have, all donations, contributions, like for example, from Coal India, all of that money goes 100% into social activities that I described, right? The group has its own CSR activity. Companies all do their own CSR. That is a separate. It's not separate. What happens is the companies do their CSR. We work jointly with them. We do projects. They do projects. We do so joint whatever projects. whatever that rural area program you are running, that is a combination of both. May not be, sir. All I'm saying is there are three buckets. The groups do their own programs. We do joint programs. We do our own programs. Okay. Right? For example, Lakpati Kisan is done jointly with Tata Steel. Right? But I do a lot of Lakpati Kisan without Tata Steel as well. So I work with group companies. I work with people like Coal India. I do programs jointly with you, but I also do programs of my own. The Assam program, for example, we had funding from Indian Oil, from BPCL, from a whole bunch of companies. But we also run the programs on our own. So the income that we get as CSR contribution donations goes to part fund some of these programs. So our own funding plus the donations is together what we spend. One more point, sir, because Tata is a big, uh, uh, big boss, I think, of our country, is big donator. My point is this, just number of programs, like your education, like your poor, that poverty elevation, that our central government is also running some schemes. But sure. And if we suppose in some areas, which are mostly backward, 
if the some your that private partners and like tata if they come together and and they if they run jointly all these programs i think uh, that would be more beneficial we do that today uh, uh, rather than we are running no, no. the program we do it today <laughs> excuse me we do it today half my programs up there are with the government right you would have seen the government you would have seen fssai for example you would have seen jaljeevan mission for example government work the government right so the partnership model that we have is i'll give you examples of some of the work that we've done assam program for example is a joint initiative with the state government right so both of us are co-funding the project we've set up a separate institution jointly run by the two organizations the chief minister of assam is the chairman of that company right so we have directors from both tata trust as well as the assam government on that board we run that program jointly so lot of the programs that we do are run in partnership with government we are very clear that for you to be able to scale working with government is important right i have i work with the madhya pradesh government in setting up primary health centers i work with the andhra pradesh government in setting up health health facilities we work with the odisha government in malaria treatment the hospital at mara is being built jointly with uh, the maharashtra government so it's partnership with government is a given in this line sir it's a given thank you uh, my name is alok srivastava thanks sir thank lovely presentation very informative uh, my question is in contribution to my uh, sri sai sir uh, why only assam sir is there any need based assessment no. instead of pan india we are doing it pan india if you saw Right. So, but so yeah. many uh, facilities in Assam only. Is any special reason? No, it's more in terms of uh, we work with multiple state government. It's a question of also what is the parity of the state as well. So, if you look at the programs I have, I have programs coming in Odisha, I have programs in UP, I have programs in uh, Jharkhand, I have programs in uh, other locations as well. But the state government in Assam was willing to look at a pan-state program. But the so state government is more initiative. They are approaching you. No, not not necessarily so them. sir not necessarily so we are in dialogue with multiple states thank you sir we are all again please keep in mind that it's also a function of how much infrastructure already exists right in many states for example some of that facility exists some of those hospitals have been built right so it's also a question of what is the particular need of that state at any point in time that's the way you should see it so, so in future other state government will willing to collaborate with you are you ready to take up this we're talking to many already thank you in sir. fact many people are already talking to us Thank you, sir. So we'll take one last question. Uh, Hi. Thank you, Mr. Srinath, for a wonderful presentation. I think uh, what you're doing today, uh, the nation will uh, remember uh, this. Uh, just in continuation to uh, the, your intervention in the health sector and uh, 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 trying to tackle one of the most complex health uh, challenge like cancer, uh, I would just like to seek your uh, guidance on, on transforming uh, the primary health center, the first basic unit at the village level, and your proposition, if we have to bring 360 degree transformation at the basic uh, village level, what would be your uh, three uh, strong recommendation for the government? Uh, would you suggest outsourcing of these institutions could be a potential um, solution to tackle our basic health challenges? We're doing Thank this you. in a couple of places. Uh, we're doing it. Um, in an urban context uh, and a little bit of a rural context as well. We did something in Nagpur. <laughs> we're doing something right now in Madhya Pradesh. We've done something in Chhattisgarh as well. Um, the basic model that we propagated with the government is that if you look at the primary health centers today, there are challenges of different kinds, so challenges of infrastructure, challenges of people, challenges of process. So what we are doing in this particular model that we're working with one of the states is that the capex for renovating the primary health centers is coming from the government. The OPEX to pay for the salaries of the people is coming from the government, right? The workflows and the SOPs for, I think, 26 or 27 specific interventions that we identified in that state, that piece of work is coming from us. The PMO is coming from us. The underlying system that we spoke about, the Dell example we gave you is just that, right? So the underlying IT system is coming from us. Um, what we are trying to do is to basically put together, if you, as, as you well know, the health system in the country is completely inverted. Everybody goes to the tertiary centers instead of going to the primary health centers. And the challenge for us is to make the primary health center ecosystem effective. And we've got this reach of primary health centers. How do we make them more effective in serving the purpose that they were built for? Um, I think the challenge really around that is one, 
is to get the people to believe and to come back into the primary health centers. I think that's really where the challenge is today. So for that you need, and the example that we're trying in this particular state is, is to try to make it work first, which is to basically put in place a clean location, put in place the people, put in place the drugs that you need to distribute, put in place the basic medical capability. Start with that as a building point, right? I'm not convinced that by any stretch of the imagination that's the end game, right? The end game is, it's more transaction. What you're getting, if, if you're able to get that far, you're getting transactional. You're not looking at managing the health of the 30, 40,000 people in the community who happens to be your client. I believe that's step two. I believe trying to get to that in the first step is a little bit of a leap of faith, which will be a bit of a challenge for us. So what we are trying to do is to make the basic PSC system work in the geographies that we are operating in. If you are able to make that work, and the underlying data systems are there, the primary health record is being corrected, once you get that basic information together, what you should look at, right, and what you should really look at is, you are uniquely positioned in the primary health center to manage the health of the 30, 40,000 people in your catchment. You're able to identify environmental issues, you're able to identify opportunistic issues, you, find, you can find things out, right? So if you're able to do that and you're able to manage that, then you're no longer managing illness, you're managing health, right? I think that's, that's really where we want to go, right? The government is interested, but from where we are today to jump to that, I think is a bit of work to be done, right? So to me, if you look at what is the story today, get the basic PHC equipped to the point where it can run, which means CapEx, which means people. You know, half the PHCs don't have people, right? You need to get the PHCs to the point where they're capable of doing the work that they're supposed to do. And that includes the SOPs, that includes the IT tools, right? Once you've done that, flip it around from being simply a transaction point to being a primary health manager for the catchment of that geography, right? Turn it around to do that. Once you've done that, so the linkage to the secondary centers, the linkage to the tertiary centers, extension to telemedicine, that's easy to do. That's easy stuff, right? The challenge is how do you get the, how do you get the community to come back into the primary health center? That's your challenge today. You've got to find a way to get people back into those centers. You've got to convince them that the center can do what it's supposed to do. I think that's the battle we're fighting today. And that's the battle we are seeing at least in the geographies that we're working in. Outsourcing we can look at, but to me, outsourcing without fixing this will have the same issues. You're not going to solve the problem, you're just pushing the problem somewhere else. So the objective for me is make the PLC work, convince the people to come back in, convert it from a transaction center to a primary health manager center. Flip it around. Then you can really do fantastic things with it. Then you put tertiary linkage, the secondary linkage, tertiary linkage, telemedicine, you put in all that jazz, it works after that. But you need to get the basics right. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Srinath. I think uh, we are at the top of the hour, so request for the felicitation to happen. Thank you, sir, for making us understand how the practices of Tata Trust are aligned towards creating deep, irreversible, and long-lasting impact on the community. I would like to invite Srivina Ranjan, Director, Personnel, and IR, Coal India Limited, on stage to felicitate Sri N. Srinath with Momento, Uttariye, and a personalized frame. A big round of applause for our speaker. Thank you. It was an absolute honor, sir, to have you with us today. Moving ahead. As we all know, Deloitte is playing a pivotal role as the moderator of all the technical sessions of this conclave and works in tandem with CIL to meet the statutory reporting requirements. Our next speaker, Sri Shubhanshu Patnaik, 
is a partner with Deloitte and an expert on ESG and is here to deliver a session on recent ESG trends in the mining sector. Ladies and gentlemen, with a huge round of applause, I would like to welcome on stage Sri Shubhanshu Patnaik. A partner with Deloitte India, Shri Patnaik has more than 23 years of experience in the power and sustainable energy field. He has led several assignments for International Renewable Energy Agency, governments and private and public sector companies on renewable energy financing and sustainable development goals. He is currently leading the Deloitte team in hydropower development initiatives of Nepal. He has been playing a pivotal role in supporting clients in the electronic vehicle market. He is driving the ESG energy strategy for multiple power, energy and resources company. The stage is now yours, sir. Thank you so much. I hope I'm audible. <coughs> right. So, uh, so far, you know, I've been uh, privileged to listen to so many speakers since the morning, and we've been focusing primarily on CSR. Uh, we'll change tracks for this particular session. We will move and focus slightly uh, different topic, which is ESG, uh, environment, social, and governance aspects. Uh, and so therefore, this is more about, uh, I would say, the purpose of the organization and the trust that it builds uh, for businesses to be held sustainable in the longer term. So we'll start to look at ESG. What is the driving value that ESG has acquired over the last couple of years in particular? Uh, I'm sure you'd be listening to ESG much more over the last couple of years than you have in the past. Uh, and that's been a trend. That's been a significant trend. We will shine a bit of uh, light on ESG trends in the mining industry in particular. What are we hearing about uh, globally as well as uh, in India? And uh, we will then look at some of the strategic aspects of navigating the ESG transformation journey uh, for organizations such as CIL. Uh, and what have we done? What are the next steps that uh, CIL is looking at? Uh, and we will try and strategize around that a bit. So, okay, so that's, that's what we'll walk you through. So first we will look at what, what ESG is in the current scenario. Uh, what, is the, what are the drivers that really uh, put ESG back in focus? Of course, we all know that uh, one of the significant drivers for ESG, of course, is climate change itself. But that's not the only reason why ESG is majorly in focus. We'll look at that. Uh, as I said, we'll look at some of the key mining trends uh, in 2022 in particular. Uh, industry perspectives on ESG, which is metals and mining perspective. Uh, we will look at sustainable development goals in the mining sector. Some of the reporting standards, which is more brass tax, which is compliance. What are the compliance requirements as far as ESG is concerned in India? Uh, and how will it possibly evolve in the future as well? As I said, we will also walk through key trends from an ESG perspective in 2022. Uh, and then, of course, how do we shift from strategy to implementation itself? Right, so as I said, ESG currently, uh, if you look at it, uh, you know, has, has acquired a status of, uh, in the past, it was essentially being driven by departments which were peripheral to the core aspects of governance in the organization. So it would possibly sit as an ESG department somewhere uh, or as an adjunct to uh, you know, the administration uh, wasn't really the core, uh, but we held a survey at Deloitte, for instance, of 1,000 Indian companies, uh, and about 90% of them, so very, very similar to the S&P index uh, report that you're seeing there, 90% of the Indian uh, companies, the top 1,000 companies in a way, said it's a boardroom agenda of importance, right? It is no longer a peripheral activity. It's not something that you do as a compliance. It is central to what businesses are driving. Uh, so that's reflected in the next statement also. 86% of employees expect their CEOs to speak about ESG issues as well. Uh, seven out of 10 uh, people globally said they would revolt or they would actually start to boycott goods and uh, products 
uh, which are coming from irresponsible companies are uh, increasingly now ESG is rated for organizations also. So companies which have poor ESG rating possibly would be at the receiving end of such uh, boycotts. Uh, so that's, that's, uh, that's exclusion. Uh, so from compliance, you start to also go into the zone of exclusion as a corporate, uh, which is dangerous, right? But if you start to embrace ESG, you see positive benefits also. So there are companies which have looked at ESG from a more positive lens. How do they embed ESG into all activities that uh, they undertake going forward? Uh, and they have certainly started to look at increased profits as well. So of importance, therefore, if, if you, you know, do not need to get into the brass tacks, uh, why do we look at ESG as something which creates value? Because in very simple terms, it defines or makes you assess the purpose of the company itself from a planet, people, and, uh, uh, you know, uh, from a planet and people perspective, and also looks at sustainability from a longer term perspective. So if you're a business, if you look at shorter term objectives of just uh, maximizing profits, uh, then that is, that is likely to be counter to ESG goals. But if you look at longer term objectives, how do I make my business sustainable over a longer period of time? And that can never be counterproductive or uh, counter to what an investor's expectation would be. Uh, then you are already, you're already thinking along the ESG lens. Uh, and so therefore that is the frame that needs to be used increasingly. It is, so ESG essentially is not counter to business um, uh, objectives of earning profits, let's say. It is essentially at the center of making businesses more sustainable over a longer period of time. And so how has ESG created value? Uh, if you start to look at sales and innovations, as I said, 53% of the surveyed CXOs reported that revenue streams from conscious, socially uh, conscious offerings uh, always are on the higher side. So that's something that's uh, already playing out. Operational efficiencies, if you reduce uh, your ESG footprint, uh, emissions footprint, I should say, it has a obvious positive spin-off in terms of reducing costs. Uh, and so therefore sustainability in products, uh, if you start to build out circularity, uh, if you bring waste reduction down, if you build supply chains which are more circular in nature, you start to look at cost reductions also, uh, something that is, uh, uh, you know, some, something that, that obviously adds to your bottom line. Uh, and so therefore, uh, the valuation, which is uh, essentially twofold, one of course is in terms of the direct profit-related valuation, but also what the market values you for. In all aspects of that, you see positive gains, uh, which are already playing out. Uh, and this is, as I said, as recent as the last two to three years and not necessarily longer term. Your access to cost of capital, and this is something where exclusion can play out. Uh, the extreme is that there could be action by financial institutions which do not lend or have a very high cost of capital to poorly rated ESG companies. Uh, and so this is already playing out, as I said, you would see financial institutions following equator principle or some uh, avowed principles which are aligned to ESG standards of their own, uh, which, as I said, either uh, associates higher cost of capital because it's a riskier business that they're lending to, or goes to the extremes of saying a very poorly rated ESG company is some, are some where we will not associate with it at all. Uh, so therefore, that plays out in the form of higher cost of capital already. There is, as I said, you know, uh, the ESG portfolio of assets under management for uh, companies which invest in these uh, organizations, uh, where you see already higher returns coming through, exceeds, uh, you know, already a significant amount of the capital is flowing through to companies which are better rated, uh, as opposed to non-ESG assets, right? Uh, and lastly, of course, the importance of looking at it from a risk perspective also. 15% uh, of the companies, uh, you know, uh, would be unprofitable uh, if, if you actually were to account for the entire environmental impacts uh, that, that the companies, uh, if they were to use a frame like, let's say, carbon, uh, internal carbon pricing, 
uh, or any other frameworks for ac accounting for environmental uh, aspects, then they would actually be loss-making. And it may not be too far uh, for global communities, global financial communities, to our accounting communities to evolve standards, and there's already discussions of these, to actually report according to these kind of standards where you factor in environmental aspects also. Uh, and then, of course, what you report as profits currently could turn out to be less so or even go into the negative uh, frame. So, so therefore, you know, keeping an eye on ESG on all aspects of business is therefore very, very important going forward. Now what I'll do is... The next uh, decade... This is one video, one let's just look at it and from, from a trends perspective. ...in the mining industry's history. Here are the top 10 trends the mining industry may face in the year ahead. One, aligning capital allocation to ESG. Companies will need to think holistically and ensure that their investment portfolios are not only financially sound, but also support the company's sustainability, governance, and social responsibility goals. Two, reshaping traditional value chains. As companies lay the foundations for a low carbon future, they will reshape their value chains. This may mean new alliances, working with new commodity players and creating new circular business models. Three, operating in the new super cycle. The new super cycle for key commodities coincides with governments around the world emerging from COVID-19 with high level of debt. Companies will need to navigate an uncertain regulatory and tax environment where commodities are being targeted. Four, embedding ESG into organizations. Companies will need to align operating models to support their ESG commitments. This means embedding sustainability goals into their business strategy creating transparent information flows, aligning incentives, and driving accountability. Five, evolving mining's world of work. An increasingly competitive labor market, digitization, and remote working are reshaping the talent equation in mining. Companies need to rethink how they attract talent, tell the narrative of mining in the energy transition, and drive diversity, equity, and inclusion in the workplace. Six, establishing a new paradigm for indigenous relations Indigenous communities around the world are looking to create new partnerships with miners going forward. Miners will need to work with traditional landowners to align with their long-term objectives to create broader economic and social prosperity. 7. Continuing the journey towards innovation-led organizations. Innovation remains key for the mining industry, but as companies look to embed more innovation in their organizations, they need to challenge the status quo. Create a culture of innovation and learn from other industries. Eight, unlocking value through integrated operations. There is a significant opportunity for miners to unlock additional value through integrated operations. To do this will require a focus on improving holistic decision-making at every level while leveraging data analytics to drive the long view. Nine, closing the ITOT vulnerability gap. Improvements in information technology and operational technology have reduced costs and created new business opportunities. However, they have brought increased cybersecurity risks that must be addressed. 10. Preparing operations for climate change. Climate change poses significant physical risks to mining operations as well as to water sources and supply chains. Miners must assess and prepare for different crisis scenarios. For more on this year's trends, visit www.deloitte.com forward slash tracking the trends. The next step. Okay. So I don't know whether you uh, kept a count of the 10 trends that uh, Deloitte globally is reporting for mining. Uh, five of them actually are I mean, related to the environment metrics. One of them uh, related to the social metrics. So of ESG, therefore, you know, six out of the top 10 trends actually are related to ESG-related aspects. And uh, it is core, therefore, to business strategy and business operations. It's no longer, as I said, a reporting issue or something that just has to be a compliance-related aspect. Uh, let's look at some of the other aspects, I mean, from a, from a survey perspective, if you look at mining's, uh, mining and metals industry, uh, from a sentiment perspective, 
The CEOs also are reporting, not surprisingly, given the, the whole focus on climate change and what impact it has from a mining perspective, one fourth of the CEOs uh, reported uh, ESG as one of the top factors uh, that they're worried about, you know, they're, they're, that featured in the top uh, aspects of the, what, what keeps them awake. Uh, also the social license to operate, right? So from a rising glo global commodity prices as well as the com communities that they work in, uh, how are investors looking at it uh, in terms of attracting investors itself and uh, holding a social license to operate? This is some of the, uh, this was sub this, this, these two ranked as the biggest or the top uh, elements from a CEO perspective, right? So if you were to take away just two things from this entire uh, slide, it is the transition, the energy transition risk, which has been called out as one of the major, major factors that mining has to contend with, and the impact on local communities, right? Uh, and both are significant ESG factors. Uh, so therefore, there is both an opportunity for us to leverage these trends to look at our strategy afresh uh, and ride disruptions in a way which is positive for the business, uh, but also manage these from a risk perspective, right? So the existing business models, the existing business footprints are risky. And to that extent, how do we transit to a new business era where energy transition is a reality is something that we need to be keeping an eye on, which is uh, the underlying theme of this uh, uh, survey in a way. Okay. I'm sorry. Okay. Right. Uh, also, if we were to <clears throat> start to use frameworks for analyzing ESG, one of the frameworks, of course, is uh, the, the SDG itself, the 17 SDGs outlined by the uh, United Nations itself, uh, and see that, you know, most of them, actually all, uh, um, you know, almost all of them are relevant to the mining industry because we work in communities, uh, and so therefore we impact uh, you know, uh, not just in communities, but in communities which are uh, where human development index is obviously on the lower side, as we were discussing in the earlier sec uh, uh, you know, sessions. Uh, and so therefore, we have a responsibility when we are working in these environments uh, to address uh, SDG goals from a, uh, from a poverty perspective, from hunger, from education perspective, and of course, community development also. Uh, so therefore, they, these are core goals, uh, but also there are others which are with regards to, uh, primarily with regards to energy itself. How do we make sure that access to energy is higher? How do we make sure that industry, innovation, and infrastructure are central uh, uh, to operations itself? And then very importantly, climate change, right? So SDG 13, uh, which is how do we ensure that our own footprints as far as scope one, scope two emissions are concerned uh, are minimal. How do we make that transition happen? Uh, so these are, these are important factors to keep in mind that, you know, uh, we have a responsibility as far as mining companies are concerned to actually impact virtually all aspects of human development uh, uh, indices and all 17 SDGs are kind of relevant to us from an ESG perspective. Now, what is the existing frame? We'll analyze this and then we'll get down to more details. Uh, the existing compliance framework that exists today, of course, is BRSR, which is applicable to the top 1,000 listed companies in India. It's mandatory from this year onwards, uh, from this financial year onwards. Uh, but ultimately, it'll give, you know, the roadmap has already been laid out by SEBI that it will be applicable to all listed companies, not just the top 1,000. <clears throat> so therefore, the writing is on the wall. But if you look at how it has gone about, uh, you know, we started with voluntary systems. Uh, so the Ministry of Corporate Affairs had something. Uh, we had BRR for a while, uh, which was there for listed companies, the top 500. And now we have, as I said, BRSR, which is far more evolved. Uh, if you look at BRSR closely, you have two sets of indicators. This is, there are the essential indicators. Uh, which all of them have to report. All the thousand entities have to mandatorily report. There are also leadership indicators, which uh, you know you can report on. There is a, a large list of leadership indicators, 
uh, and you can choose to report on some of them or all of them, uh, and this is a voluntary framework. But ultimately, SEBI has constituted a committee to start looking at it in greater detail. Uh, the reason I'm outlining this is also to do with how we collect data and how we monitor uh, this in the longer term. So therefore, we have to be aware of how this, this framework is going to evolve. Uh, there is a likelihood that you will have industry carve-outs for the leadership indicators. Slowly and slowly, they will have industry-specific indicators also. Uh, and top of the heap, of course, is metals and mining. They are looking at metals and mining as one of the areas uh, where they will look at very, very specific leadership indicators to be published. Uh, and then, over time, that could also be an area which becomes mandatory, right? The whole objective is to obviously move the industry towards that. Um, and what are the details that you have under BRSR? You have under the three buckets, environment, social, and governance. You have energy management parameters. You have GHG emissions, of course, waste management. Uh, under social, you have well-being, health and safety, human rights, gender equality. All of these have to be measured and reported in a reliable manner, right? Uh, and after, because this is a part of your annual report itself, uh, you know, there is no requirement of assurance at this point in time, but that could also become mandatory going forward. So these are essentially, therefore, items which, uh, you know, from, from, as I said, peripherally sitting in administration or some other department, will move to the focus of the CFO himself because he has to report, a, uh, he has to prepare the annual report himself. Uh, and therefore, this is something that he's also signing off on in a way. Uh, and it's getting assured. So <clears throat> therefore, front and central in terms of how we report data, uh, how we monitor it, and obviously that which is measured can obviously be actioned upon, so therefore that is something which will uh, be under focus from an action perspective also. Right, now we'll start looking at some of the ESG trends. Uh, so this is from an ESG perspective, we of course looked at general mining trends. Uh, we'll look at ESG trends and Again, uh, central to ESG, of course, is the capital allocation alignment. Uh, mind you, what we're talking about from an ESG perspective, uh, very, very central to it, of course, is emissions. Uh, how do you manage emissions? How, what kind of emissions footprints do you have? Uh, how environmentally uh, conscious are you? Uh, and are you working towards uh, you know, navigating the energy transition of the future? Uh, from that perspective, uh, it is about deciding where your next set of investments are going. And so therefore, not surprisingly, capital allocation is a very, very significant trend which is reported around how ESG gets, um, you know, how ESG gets managed. And at its score, as I said, it is about strategy. So what is it? It is about reorienting and, you know, uh, uh, re-articulating re your strategy around a purpose which is more enduring. Uh, if you define your business as simply, let's say, energy generation, uh, just giving an example, uh, then that is not necessarily enduring. What forms of energy are you generating from? Is it something which is uh, in line with climate change trends? Is it in line with energy transition trends? So you have to basically say, in the long run, you cannot be, but be generating from sources of energy which are less emissions intensive. And if there are sources that you use from an emissions perspective, how do you necessarily capture that carbon and utilize it will also be in focus going forward, right? So these are all areas where therefore strategy needs to play out a much bigger role than it does at this point in time. The second is around embedding a framework for decision which accounts for ESG. Uh, now, most organizations do not have a carbon pricing framework or an investment framework which d looks at emissions as a de decisive parameter, right? When you actually look at, uh, you know, uh, your capital allocation between projects A, B, and C, you wouldn't necessarily look at carbon priced out uh, as a value. Uh, and that's, that's flawed to the extent that when you go forward, uh, what looks good on paper financially may not be the most sustainable project going forward, right? Uh, and so therefore, how do you change your allocation policy, which is how do you create value from an investment decision, which accounts for carbon also, is something that needs to be looked at. 
right? Uh, and so a lot of organizations, therefore, increasingly, again, Indian companies over the last two years have adopted internal carbon pricing as a framework. Uh, and so therefore, that is also something that you should keep in mind. Even if you don't necessarily have to convey that externally, you don't need to necessarily be transparent about it, uh, as of now, you need to have a framework internally. The third is around how to build resilient infrastructure. Now, carbon, uh, uh, sorry, climate change is something which is not just creating energy transition as a reality. That is something which we uh, have taken on uh, as nations as well as corporates as a, uh, um, you know, as a commitment. But it also creates physical risks, right? Climate change is creating physical risks. No other company uh, than uh, Coal India realizes that better with, uh, you know, the weather patterns that they're experiencing in, in mining operations. Uh, and so therefore, that is a physical uh, resiliency assessment that you also need to carry out from a business sustainability perspective. Uh, this is increasingly so for businesses which operate in the infrastructure segment, including mining. Um, and so therefore, how do you look at uh, future-proofing your business from climate change risk perspective, as well as, as I said, from strategic uh, you know, transition risks is something that also needs to be looked at from an ESG perspective. Uh, and then, of course, as I said, uh, in the long run, how do you create value, uh, not just from an environmental lens, but also from a social lens, creating economic value for local communities is as important as, uh, you know, climate change related aspects are for, for ensuring a business sustainability. So what does it come down to? Once you have a repurposed strategy, uh, and most organizations are therefore looking at their existing strategy from an ESG lens to see whether it holds from an energy transition perspective going forward. Uh, if it doesn't, then how do we really repurpose our strategy? So one of the important things is how do you look at um, a net zero goal or a decarbonized goal for the future, right? It need not be net zero, but what pathway are you outlining for yourself over the future? Uh, and there could be several levers that you employ for that. So that is the energy you know, economic decarbonization perspective that you look at uh, from a portfolio theme perspective. So that could be, as I said, uh, looking at your scope one, scope two emissions. As a business, uh, it's not, the, not about the product that you're uh, generating. It is about the business the operations that you have. What is the footprint you have from an emissions perspective? And how do you bring it down to zero over time? Um, and there could be energy management related issues. There could be technology interventions that you can look at. Uh, or if you cannot avoid it completely, there are process emissions which are not completely avoidable uh, with the existing technologies that, have, that exist today. For instance, in the hard to abate sectors, you could look at offsets uh, in the interim, right? Uh, and then of course, procurement also, which is a scope two element, uh, which is about renewable procurement and how do you uh, make sure that what you procure is clean and green. So that's one aspect. As I said, in all of this, there is a silver lining, which is if the new order is all about a different energy transition uh, uh, paradigm and a different uh, way of operations, can we ride that disruption by creating new business models, right? Uh, a lot of businesses are focusing intensively on that from a strategic standpoint. What are the new business models that could evolve? Can we play in those business models, right? Uh, and from a CIL perspective also, uh, you know, you've started focusing on what could be the new business models, uh, be it from a renewable energy perspective or from a coal uh, perspective itself, coal gasification or related elements. Uh, these are all new business models which will open up for the future. And how do we position ourselves for that is as important as looking at uh, internal elements of, as I said, uh, reducing our footprints from a carbon perspective. Uh, and, and so th these are, you know, that's the, disrupt, uh, that's the disruptive sustainable as well uh, in a different name. The second trend that we are seeing uh, is, is um, you know, the related aspect of diversification for climate change. Uh, so uh, the example that I gave, which is, um, you know, most organizations are looking at how do they diversify, uh, uh, you know, uh, from their existing line of operations 
to make sure that they stay sustainable, that from a climate change perspective, they are able to ride the new business models that emerge. Uh, and so therefore, from a coal sector perspective, uh, how do we really balance out um, with, with, let's say, focus on renewable energy? And this, of course, uh, from a CIL perspective, is very, very relevant. Uh, given all the commitments that India itself has given in the global fora, how do we ride the new uh, business models that's that, that present themselves? But given that coal will remain as a strategic priority for a while, how do we make sure that even in that specific area, we bring in technologies, right? New technologies to bear is as important. Uh, so this will obviously be part of the CIL's diversification strategy. This is something that we worked with you on, uh, and there are uh, clear insights around what are the strategic pillars that CIL will ride on from a diversification standpoint. So that's something that I'll not get into in detail, but uh, obviously this is of relevance to you. The third area is if we accept that there'll be parts of the businesses which will transit out or get phased down, uh, how do we manage this transition, right? Uh, we spoke about that, uh, I think, in uh, two sessions back. Uh, how do you manage this transition uh, better? Uh, because it impacts livelihoods, it impacts communities, and we are not just in a, you know, we're not just doing business in, uh, in isolation, we are obviously doing business harmoniously with a community in action. And unfortunately, as, as the uh, figure de depicts, uh, you know, the, the alternatives that we are outlining in terms of new business models do not sit geographically in the same area that coal operations uh, happen to be. So, for instance, the southern India and the western India uh, is where most of the renewable energy uh, resources exist, uh, be it wind or solar. And so, therefore, uh, you know, it doesn't sit with CIL's operating footprint at this point in time. So, therefore, the whole focus around just transitions, um, which is something that may be financially, uh, you know, has to be managed along with the livelihood itself. Uh, you know, how do you transit livelihood, of course, would be a significant focus. But there could be actually a financial implication of managing this transition, which not just is a CIL question, it is a national question itself. How do you manage these industries from a just transition perspective? The third uh, major trend uh, from a, uh, you know, again, this is, this might look like a globe, you know, this might look like a generic trend, but it has implications on, um, on, on ESG footprints itself, uh, which is how, can you harness the power of digital interventions, the new technologies that are on offer, to actually be more efficient from a, um, from a emissions perspective or from an operations perspective to have your footprints which are lower in terms of uh, ESG uh, emissions, I should say, not ESG. So there are quite a few examples. Uh, we just put two here. For instance, you know, the entire uh, energy value chain is managed through IoT interventions by uh, Gold Cup so effectively now, and they report a significant reduction in their energy footprints uh, or GAG footprints uh, by, by deployment of digital. Uh, similarly, you know, the use by tech of uh, uh, on-site water consumption uh, and tracking that uh, adds to the lowering of uh, water footprints, of course, water consumption footprint for tech. Uh, so yeah, so this is one area which will come into significant focus, which is existing businesses to be made more efficient through digital interventions. Uh, and also any kind of clean energy deployment, uh, not any kind, I should say, any kind of renewable energy, variable renewable energy deployment, uh, comes with a disadvantage, which is that it is variable in nature, right? And therefore has to be managed on a continuous basis. So if you were to deploy that in isolation, uh, then it is not something which will meet your demand on a stable basis. So if you, you have to marry it with either storage uh, or hybridize it, uh, and the moment you do that, it has to be real-time, on a real-time basis, managed as well. Uh, and so therefore that brings digital technologies into play, smarter technologies into play, which is inalienable as far as variable renewable energy is concerned. Right. 
Now, how do you make this, uh, you know, so, so it's good to have a strategy. We talked about trends and what could be the, uh, you know, the, the pillars of strategy for this transition. How do you start to make this to bear itself out for the organization? The first and foremost activity that one needs to focus on is, of course, benchmarking your GAG emissions, um, you know, in its entirety. Understanding from a scope one, scope two perspective, what is the contribution of each kind of operation that you have from an emissions perspective or, or from a social uh, perspective is very, very important. I mean, talk about emissions here primarily. Uh, and this is, uh, you know, if you were to benchmark CIL uh, from a ESG perspective, again, emissions in particular, if you were to benchmark them um, with uh, Indian companies, Indian miners, you compare quite favorably. Uh, but if you were to be benchmarked with global miners, um, you know, it's, it's at least 15, 20% off from a GHG benchmark perspective. Uh, and so therefore there is plenty of room for improvement uh, as far as interventions are concerned to reduce our own emissions footprint. Uh, and there are some examples which you have put here uh, with forward-looking statements by uh, global miners uh, which talk about net zero, which talk about achieving significant cuts in existing footprints from a GHG perspective. Uh, this is by no means exhaustive, uh, but it just gives us a direction around how globally uh, people are committing to, and as a listed company, it, it becomes incumbent upon us also to uh, start looking at these elements because you know it impacts investor sentiments in a way significantly, apart from uh, uh, ESG rating as such. The second element, um, you know, uh, not the second element, I think the, um, you know, these uh, key challenges for implementation uh, are fourfolds, if I were to say. Uh, from, a, from bringing it down to CIL perspective, the first is how do we repurpose land and infrastructure, right? Uh, how do we look at the, uh, you know, the land and infrastructure which becomes, uh, which becomes, uh, um, you know, has to be redeveloped or redeployed uh, once you phase down operations in certain areas. Uh, this is something that obviously comes into significant focus from an emission standpoint, and that can be positively contributing to your emission footprints if it, it, it is managed properly uh, through plantations, let's say, or through value-added agriculture activities. Uh, this is one area that needs to be there for, for looked at from an ESG lens as well. The second we took, talked about, which is what is your diversification strategy? And how can it be net positive from an ESG perspective? Uh, so that, of course, is uh, from a renewable energy perspective, as well as new technologies in the coal mining uh, segment itself, which leads to a cleaner footprint. Uh, and all of them will come into focus uh, going forward uh, at various abatement curves. Obviously, you know, the cost is something which is to be taken into account. but. Uh, renewable energy for sure is already one of the cheapest forms of energy, so therefore that is an easier diversification. Reskilling of workforce, we spoke about, right? So this is the third element that needs to be clearly looked at. How do we train the workforce, rescale uh, from an ESG perspective? Uh, and then, of course, financing the transition itself. Uh, and this is something where, as I said, it is not an individual corporate responsibility. While it will be something that needs to be managed, it is a national level uh, um, issue. And so therefore, even the government is clearly looking at schemes and uh, mechanisms to make sure that this is something that can be managed along with the organizations which are operating in this space. Right. So. Uh, four, four elements of looking at uh, behavioral change uh, or, or the way in ma which organizations operate going forward. Uh, one is, of course, as I said, purely from a compliance perspective, we will have to look at uh, ESG. So you have, as I said, BRSR today. Tomorrow, some other framework could emerge, and there are industry-specific indicators on which we'll have to report on. Uh, so therefore, that is something that we will have to yield to because it's a compliance measure. Uh, that's that minimum that we need to look at. But it has a related aspect, which is that once you start measuring 
as I said, if you have a benchmark against energy efficiency, against energy footprints that you have per ton of coal, let's say, excavate, uh, per ton of coal produced, uh, you start to really start looking at how do you reduce that, right? So that yields itself into decision-making metrics and drives actions. Uh, and so therefore, that is the second element that you'll have to look at. But as I said, um, you know, from a core operations perspective, how do I embed ESG into each and every area of my existing operations is something that you'll have to look at. And it goes beyond scope one and scope two. It extends to scope three also, which is how do I impose this on my suppliers and vendor community as well. Uh, and a lot of organizations have three related targets also, which is we will associate with our vendors, with our suppliers, uh, provided they also have a minimum level of ESG commitment or minimum level of ESG achievement. Uh, and then, of course, as I said, uh, from a cultural perspective, how a behavioral perspective, how do I drive this change sustainably? So embedding ESG in all learning activities and all development activities internally, uh, but also making sure that we engage with our employees. Uh, of course, the millennial com you know, uh, community comes in with a lot of information, a lot of uh, awareness about ESG perspectives, uh, but just about everyone within the employee community. How do we make sure that this is something also that they embrace uh, and, and make sure that uh, you know, that is something that is embedded into business? <coughs> right. So. This is what I had. Uh, this, uh, you know, this this is the perspective that I had from an ESG uh, uh, overall. Uh, happy to take on questions. Thank you, Subranshu. Uh, wonderful uh, presentation. Uh, just to summarize some of the things that you mentioned, you started off with, uh, you know, how is ESG looked at from a global perspective, especially from our investors, what they're looking at. Uh, from some of the trends that we have seen in the last in 2020 two trends, they're tracking the trends that Deloitte publishes every year. Out of the 10 uh, top trends in mining, five are from ESG, I mean, focused on ESG. So that's relevance today in the global mining context. Uh, you also mentioned about some of the challenges that people are having. Social license to operate is a big challenge, especially for miners and especially true for Coal India as well. And, uh, you know, uh, things like what needs to be done, especially if I look at from a Coal India perspective, uh, Coal India has an annual GHG emission of 2.06 billion uh, tons. So it's the largest emitter in India. So I have a question in this regard. You mentioned about RE, transition to RE as one of the uh, key measures, especially if you look at E point of view out of the ESG. Yeah. But also Coal India operates its mines in very backward areas where gender equality, where social inclusion is a major, major challenge. So if I look at from a BRSR reporting point of view, the investors will look at all the three parameters, governance, social, and environment. So what can be the measures that Coal India can look at, especially from a social point of view, yeah. given the context? Yeah, that's a very good point. So, <coughs> so let's recognize the reality that, you know, industry-specific uh, parameters will vary, right? It's not going to be uniform. So you can't obviously compare a mining business with a technology business, information technology business, and hold them as equals. But, and therefore, you have peer group ratings as far as ESG is concerned. When you look at ESG rating frameworks, uh, you have peer group ratings. Uh, and what is therefore of importance is how do we compare within the peer group itself and how do we improve this, our score? Not necessarily trying to be something else uh, because our operations are not going to change overnight. Uh, within that, there are obvious measures that we can take. Um, you know, obviously embedding from a social perspective, how do I, uh, and this is something that most organizations have started focusing on, how do I look at diversity and gender uh, or, or be more inclusive uh, in terms of my workforce, uh, you know, pipeline itself at recruitment through to retention, through to uh, leadership positions and leadership, uh, uh, you know, um, attributes. Uh, that's very, very important. Uh, and this is something that obviously CIL, I'm sure, has a focus on, but how do I improve on that over time is something that can be looked at. Uh, the other is, of course, social is not just about inclusion. Social is about how you engage with the community, right? 
Uh, and on that score itself, you'll score much better than quite a few other organizations. Uh, your CSR score would be significantly better. Uh, but even there, how do we do in the longer term, I preserve this and manage this from a transition perspective would be an insignificant focus. Uh, so Rajiv, to your question, uh, it's not about the current aspects, but about how I manage this transition going forward. So if there were closures going to happen tomorrow, how do I work with the government? How do I work uh, in creating policy positions, advocacies, to make sure that there is a just transition element which is embedded into my activities going forward would be of significant focus. Right, absolutely. So, two aspects. One is physical uh, disruptions, which you're already facing, right? There could be increased weather events which are impacting more rainfall, more rain days, uh, or rain in periods uh, which you don't expect, and so therefore that leads to disruptions. Uh, and so that, that is one aspect, the physical risks of uh, climate change itself. But the most significant risk is around energy transition itself. So what, what as, as a, a nation we do, uh, or, or as a global community we've done, is we've taken on commitments, right? And India is no different. India has NDC, nationally determined uh, uh, you know, commitments, which it is committed to. And if it is committed to a transition path, which is, let's say, 500 gigawatts of installed renewables by 2030, uh, we also committed to 50% of our energy coming from non-fossil fuel-based sources uh, by 2030, which is what uh, the Prime Minister announced in, under Panchamrit, all these start to impact backwards, right? Uh, through to right down to coal. Uh, obviously, you would start to look at, therefore, reduced coal intake at some point in time, right? Uh, you'd also be looking at net zero by 2070, which means that you'll start to bend your curve by, you'll look at emissions peaking by 2040, between 2040 and 2050, uh, and then downward curve, right? Uh, so essentially, coal would go away from a to you know, being used unabated. Emission is going to pollute the your air. When the emissions comes out from the coal mines, that means they are polluting the airs. But my point that rains are as usual. But in terms of as we take that climate is changing. When we say climate is changing in terms of rising of temperature, in general we yeah. consider. So in that respect, how can you elaborate the impact of climate? So you're talking about physical risks. That physical, is yeah. That is my right. So f the way to do it. Is it as usual. That is going. No, 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 sir. But <laughs> no. you take in terms of climate change when you are yeah. taking it. Let me explain that. Yes. Let me explain that. Right. So physical risks are. <coughs> Uh, are, uh, you know, the way to look at physical risks is by actually modeling climate events. So if you were to do climate modeling and do it physically, geographically, you'd start to realize that there are more weather events now than there were about even 10 years back, right? There are increasing incidences of rain during times which you don't anticipate. There could be increasing r levels of intensity of cyclones in coastal areas which is already being experienced, right? If you take the example of Odisha, for instance, they have, on an average have 30% more cyclones now every year than they used to have 10 years back, right? So that is physical disruptions. Uh, now that could not, may not play out uniformly across the country, but if you were to model that and see what kind of physical disruptions could happen over the future, you can plan for it. You can build in resiliences in your operating framework, right? So that is the, uh, from a physical perspective, that's the level of uh, intensity that you need to get into from a planning perspective. There could also be the case of less water availability itself, right? Uh, which is happening in most cases. Uh, so these are all aspects of physical disruptions which are apparent. But I thought, you know, physical disruptions apart, I think the bigger issue, as I said, is around energy transition itself, because that is something that we've committed to as a nation. If you're committed to as a nation that we will transit away from a particular way of working with fossil fuels, then it disrupts our business itself. And so how do we strategically diversify? How do we make sure that even in coal, which will stay for the next 30 years at least, it's not going to go away anywhere, how do we make sure that, that there we infuse technologies to make it at least cleaner? 
work with our partners who are possibly generating companies to see if can we capture carbon better. These are technologies which are evolving, right? Uh, and make sure that these are commercially adopted so that we still have another 30, 40 years to uh, manage operations. Thank you. Uh, uh, sir, I have a... Uh, as every company, the SEBI has mandated for reporting ESG footprint by every company, and this is a buzzword. Uh, my question is, uh, every company is reporting particularly social sector as well as governance sector. Is there any framework to check the reliability of data reported by a particular company? Right. And uh, if that data is being assured by some other company, yeah. what is the reliability of that assurance body? Right. <laughs> so that's a very good question. I think, you know, <coughs> so far, uh, as you saw in my chart, everything was voluntary. There was no real mandatory reporting until BRSR made, was made mandatory now. Um, you know, so therefore, uh, this is an evolving framework. Uh, in fact, you, most companies never even actually had a proper reliable data on energy consumption, uh, internal energy consumption. Uh, if you go to several industries, you would not have that. You would have that at the facility level maybe, manually written down. Uh, manually read meters, which are read maybe three months, once in three months, once in a uh, month is a very, very good practice, but once in three months possibly. So these data is definitely not reliable at this point in time, right? You do get data now in, instead of once being collected at the end of the year, you scramble and you create a sustainability report. People are now good putting in places to say, at least on a monthly basis, I get this data in real time, right? So they're putting systems in place. but. My, you know, my belief is that this level of data will improve in just about two to three years' time uh, for most industries. Because what will happen is you have benchmarks available. Even if you as an industry is not reporting it properly, you'd get caught out because the level of details that's being asked will only increase. You have 135 parameters now, it'll go to 200, 220 parameters. So the one indicator that you are reporting will have four different sub-indicators which, against which you'll have to report tomorrow. So if you were to reporting one indicator which was wrong, you'd get caught out when the four sub-indicators get reported, right? And it is not just you reporting, you can get compared against your peers. Your peers' values will also come up. So a specific consumption in a particular segment will get compared with four different industries. So the wrong reporting will get found out. And then, of course, the point around assurance. You know, assurance itself is also at a low level now. Uh, very few companies assure their reports, uh, but Assurance itself will pick up. That also is being thought about as mandatory. SEBI is also looking at whether assurance should be made mandatory going forward. It is not at this point in time, but that could also become mandatory going forward. So it's an evolving process. I fully agree that as, as it stands today, it is not the most reliable. Subrancho, a follow-on question. Yeah. Uh, I have. Yeah. Uh, so Coal India has already uh, come up with its ESG report last year, and. Uh, I was involved in preparation of that report. I have two observations. Uh, one is uh, regarding this ESG terminology itself. Uh, normally, any acronym carries a single meaning. Yeah. To take JIT just in time, a TQM, total quality management, TBL, uh, this right. uh, total, uh, triple bottom line. But uh, ESG, environment, social, Completely different. governance. <laughs> so <laughs> these three things means uh, Thai, Chinese, and South Indian <laughs> food on the same platter. So how can that be? So that is one observation. And number two is that, uh, uh, okay, the environment part can be measured. What was the baseline scenario? What improvements you have made? And what is the impact that can be measured? Similarly, social impact can be measured. What was the baseline scenario? What was their uh, earnings? And what is the uh, post-intervention uh, uh, earnings? So those things can be measured. But how on this earth that governance part can be measured? Okay. Because what we are saying, what we are doing as of now, is that we are measuring the financial parameters and we are assuming that, yes, a company who, is, who has got strong fundamentals, or financial fundamentals doing fine on financials, earning more profit, they must be having some good governance. That's why they are able to do perform better. Okay. So we are measuring uh, governance on the guise of uh, financial parameters only. Right. No, that's a very good question. So, Sainaji, the way to look at governance is governance is a compliance parameter, right? Um, 
it, it can be forward looking in terms of saying I'll put risk frameworks uh, to make sure that my business is foolproof from a future perspective. But most you know, elements cannot measure that. What you would start to measure is compliance against mandatory parameters that exist today. Now, the reason why you report on financial is because financial always existed, existed for hundreds of years, so it is very easy to capture and measure that. You would have the same parameters evolve for environment and social also uh, in no time, right? Because you already have the parameters, you have 135 odd uh, indicators to report on. So you will have those parameters also evolve. If they are mandatory, uh, obviously it is much less uh, you know, from a, uh, from a mandatory set of parameters, but if you were to include leadership indicators also, it's a fairly long list. Now, if you were to adopt all of that and start reporting on at least the governance framework for that, then it, you're, you're going beyond financials, right? That is something that will get embedded in your ESG report going forward, in a sustainability report going forward. Uh, minimum compliance-related parameters, but it should move from compliance to actually risk-related factors also in a forward-looking manner. Are you doing a risk metrics on a regular basis? Have you benchmarked your strategy against risk parameters? Have you identified risk uh, you know, ratios for all of your indicators? These are all factors that you start to report on going forward, but it's an evolution. Um, you need to start from financial because that's been there for hundreds of years. Uh, probably the last question from my side, Shubhranshu. You mentioned about. Uh, well, not so much from social also. Social has fairly well measured indicators. Governance, I agree. You know, governance is difficult, but it'll, you know, from a governance, if you look at it from a compliance standpoint, is easy. Whether you're complying with whatever is the framework laid out or not. You, it's a tick mark exercise, right? There's midway. You are complying or you're not complying. So that, of course, can be measured. Uh, to Sainaji's point, very correct that financial compliance, you do it, right? You already have a measure. You have frameworks to go against, policies, procedures. Uh, you would evolve the same thing in social and environment also over time because it's become now mandatory in a way. Yeah, you mentioned about technology. Uh, especially uh, people are scrambling to prepare the reports at the end of the year. And going forward, uh, it will be more periodic, maybe quarterly, maybe monthly. Yep. So when we look at some of the global peers, like say BHP or Rio, they are actually mm -hmm. having uh, technology systems which can monitor the environmental footprint as well as people are extending to social and governance, the kind of uh, any incidents they are reporting. So how important, especially for Coal India perspective, would be to create a technology system which can measure some of the KPIs at a real-time level? I think uh, very, very important. Very, very important. I think we should not, given that it is now mandatory, um, and it will become more and more, more and more indicators will get folded into this, making sure that you have a technology system, just like you know, ERP measures the financial parameters uh, quite well, right? Uh, and that is because you have mandatory levels of uh, reporting. You would need to have a similar kind of reporting structure for environment and social aspects also. Uh, and, and that should be real time. Uh, it is not something that you do periodically, go and gather information from your facilities. It should be something which is hooked onto a system and gets reported on a regular basis. Uh, now, the ERP vendors themselves will add on modules over time. Uh, if you look, talk about SAP and Oracle, uh, both are working on sustainability suites. Uh, but that will take time. You need not wait for it. You can have your own system developed, which at least has real-time reporting on a regular basis, captures data, puts it on a database, gives you a single pane of glass, and also allocates decision-making uh, thresholds for your facilities, right? So each of your facilities then are measured against what they report and how are they moving against the targets, right? So from a planning and target setting and monitoring perspective, you then have better lever once you start measuring this data on a real-time basis. So I think that is very, very important, Rajiv. Thank you. Thank you so much, Subranshu. Thank uh, you. I think probably we'll go for the felicitation now. Uh, thank you, sir, for explaining to us this emerging concept of ESG and its relevance for the mining industry in the present context. I would now request uh, Shri B. Sairam, EDCD CIL, to felicitate Shri Shubhanshu Patnaik with the memento Uttarai 
and personalized frame. A big round of applause for our speakers, please. Thank you, sir. Uh, due to paucity of time, we are moving ahead with the uh, next session, next scheduled session. Um, uh, post that session, we will have the tea break. For the last session of day one, we would be connecting virtually with Dr. S. Arvin, Director Projects, Arvin Eye Care System, who will deliver a virtual session on reaching I request to please, uh, please do not leave the hall. Uh, we are just about to end the day one technical sessions with the last session. Uh, this session is a very, very important session. Uh, it is a highly acclaimed, renowned person who is uh, into this eye care system and it is very knowledgeable. I would request to please uh, be patient for a few more hours and uh, we'll soon begin with the last session. For the last session, I would invite uh, virtually Dr. S. Arvin, Director Projects, Arvin Eye Care System, who will deliver a virtual session on reaching the unreached, the Arvin journey. Founded by Dr. Venkataswamy after his retirement at the age of 58, with an 11-bedded hospital at Madurai, Arvin Eye Care System today is famous for the largest eye care provider in the world. Arvin, with its mission to eliminate needless blindness, provides large volume, high quality and affordable care, eye care. High patient volume handled at Arvin brings with it benefits of economies of scale. Arvin's unique assembly line approach increases productivity manifold. Over 4.5 lakh surgeries or procedures are performed a year. Arvin facilities include 14 hospitals, 6 outpatient centers, and 100 primary facilities in South India. An MS Auto Ophthalmology from Madurai and an MBA from University of Michigan, Dr. Arvind Srinivasan is, a, is serving as a director of projects of Arvind Eye Care Systems. He is also a resource person for reputed management institute such as the IIM, Wharton School of Business and University of Michigan where he shares the Arvind way of eye care. I request sir to please take forward with the session. Thank you. Uh, can you hear me? Yes sir. Oh. Uh, it's indeed a great uh, privilege to, to be part of the CSR conclave that uh, Coal India Limited uh, is conducting. I wish I was there in person, but due to uh, some commitments, I was unable to make it in person. I uh, appreciate the opportunity to share the uh, genesis of uh, Arvind Eye Care System. I know it's the end of the day, so I'll try and uh, make it uh, interesting and uh, brief so that uh, you will have uh, uh, more time in the evening for you to spend time. So let me start my uh, presentation. Uh, are you able to see my slides? So the title of this talk is uh, Reaching the Unreached, uh, the story of Arvind Eye Care System, how it evolved uh, over the past decades. Uh, you know, worldwide, uh, if you really look at blindness as a problem, we are about, say, 7.5 billion people in the world. It's estimated that 36 million people are blind worldwide approximately about 0.5 to 0.6 percent of the population and 8.8 .8 million uh, people are blind in India and India is a young country as we all know so there is a higher preponderance of uh, blindness in a country like uh, India. The good news about blindness is 80 percent of the blindness is treatable. We can give a pair of glasses, we can do a cataract surgery and we are able to give uh, sight to people and cataract surgery is 
probably takes about 10 to 15 minutes, but gives back 100% of the vision uh, to the patient. So it is very important that we are able to take the solution to the people uh, who need it in our country and beyond our country. It's estimated that uh, no, a population needs about, like in India, you need about 20 to 25 percent of the population needs to have eye care. Am I audible? Uh, is everything okay? Excuse me. Can I go ahead? Can yes, sir. Yes, ahead, sir. Continue, sir. Pardon? Clear. Please go ahead. Okay. We can hear you. So that don't. Hello. Hello. Okay. Hello. Two hundred million. Yes, sir. You are loud and, and clear. Uh, sir, may I request okay, to please uh, put the PPT on slideshow mode, sir? Oh, it is on slideshow mode. It's full screen, sir. Please. Yeah, full screen. I have shared it. You want me to put it again? Stop sharing and do it again. No, sir. It's fine then. Please continue, sir. Are you able to see the slide full screen? Uh, sir, it's fine, sir. Please continue. Are you? Okay. So, 200 million people need eye care. In a country like Germany, uh, England, you will have about 40 to 50 percent of the people needing eye care. What it means is at least once in a year, they need to go to an eye doctor to check up their eyes. That the reason that they have such a high percentage is because they are an older population than what we have in India. So the sad part is even India, for the 200 million people, we are only now seeing about 40 to 50 million people uh, every year for their eye care. All doctors put together. We are about uh, 24,000 eye doctors in this country taking care of about 1.4 billion people, their needs for eye care. Not only the doctors, but the nurses that uh, work with the doctors, the technicians and the companies, all of us together. Today, we are able to reach only 20% of the people who need uh, eye care. So we have a long way to go in India to be able to saturate eye care for our uh, community. So Dr. V, uh, Dr. Venkataswamy is his full name. He founded this organization uh, called Aravind Eye Care System. And uh, this is a question that people ask, why did he found? Interestingly, he founded this organization after his retirement at the age of 58. He was a government employee. He was working in the government medical college. He retired as a dean. So this, in a way, is his second innings in his life. And uh, he was born in the year 1918, passed away in the year 2006. But uh, this organization, was, as I said, was founded at, in 1976. And for about 30 years of his work, he was able to build, make an impact uh, globally on in the field of eye care. So Dr. V was a very uh, uh, spiritual man. And the name Aravind comes from Sri Aravindo of Pondicherry. I'm sure some of you would be aware of uh, uh, their work and their presence. And the reasons why he was able to contribute was he owned the problem of blindness. You know, he felt if somebody was blind in the world, it was something that he should do something about it. Many, not many times we feel that way, right? We, do, we see a lot of problems in the society. We don't feel that we should be the ones who are trying to work to eliminate it. We sometimes feel what is my role in it? How can I make a difference? <clears throat> or we may feel I'm very small. I'm unable to uh, contribute to this large problem. But Dr. B felt it was his problem and uh, his own spiritual evolution and growth allowed him to look at the world very differently. He was very... Uh, far-sighted. He was able to look beyond his own lifetime. Uh, he spoke about next 50 years, 100 years, 200 years. And, uh, you know, we are from, a, this hospital was founded in a place called Madurai. Some of you would have obviously visited Madurai. There is a beautiful temple called Minakshi Temple. You know, Madurai Minakshi Temple. Madurai Minakshi Temple was built about 1,000 years ago. It was built over 300 years by about five, five to six generation of kings who built the temple. That's what he would say. Can we build organizations like that? Five to six generation of people working on the same project and it lives thousand years after them. You know, we don't know who even the who even built it at this point of time, but they built something phenomenal that it stays uh, even after thousand years. So that was his vision of trying to see and uh, work for things which are much ahead of his own uh, lifetime. He was also very selfless. You know, he was a bachelor. And uh, he wanted to definitely work in the community and wanted to build a sustainable business model. 1976, India was very different from India of today. 1976, the per capita income was $150. Today, 
the poverty uh, below poverty line population was close to 50 52 percent so it's a very different uh, conditions we are literally talking about 46 47 uh, years uh, uh, since uh, from today and he was also a leader who led by example you know he was a hard worker sincere man simple lifestyle and he also built his individual built individual capacity you know, he started at the age of 58 so he was more of a coach rather than a player he encouraged other people to do well. He was not competing, but he was uh, contributing and enabling others to function a lot better. So today, on the owning the problem, today, urban eye care system covers 100 million people, directly serving 100 million people. 75 million of Tamil Nadu, about uh, uh, Pondicherry and uh, Kerala and Andhra put together 25 million. In that 100 million population, we provide close to 52% of all eye care needs in that population. Uh, so Tamil Nadu and bordering districts of Andhra Pradesh and Kerala and people of all economic strata. So Arvind works on a cross-subsidizing model. The 50% of the patients pay, they choose to pay, they can come directly to the paying hospital. There is also a free hospital in the same uh, uh, facility. So people can also walk into the free hospital and we also do outreach programs, which I'll car cover in my presentation. So Dr. V was a very, uh, uh, you know, innovative thinker for his times. Imagine a man born in a small village, worked all his life uh, in Madurai Medical College, but he had a, a very vibrant mind. Philo spiritually, he was drawn to Sherbindo and mother, and he said, make me a better tool to be able to give sight to a lot of people. But the other end of the spectrum, Dr. V was also very pragmatic, you know, very practical. He says, oh, look at McDonald's. This is 76 of McDonald's or 75 of McDonald's. Sir, look at them. They are uh, worldwide. Sir, so sir, scale. sir. Yes. Sir, sorry to interrupt. Oh, yes. I think the slide is not getting changed. Uh, can you please reconnect to the uh, sharing mode? Okay. What I will do is probably I will, uh, uh, yeah, I will, should you reconnect or should I just upload it? Uh, yeah. Uh, again, share the slide, please. Only the slide Only part, slide. sharing part. Yeah, I just shared the slide. Yeah, now uh, now I think it is okay. Uh, is it moving now? Uh, yes, at the slideshow mode, uh, please click on the icon that is already, uh, the cursor is there on that icon. Yeah. Yeah. No, I'm not, can, can you see it moving? There is a slide called Dr. V inspired by, there is a McDonald's, there is Shia with the uh, philosophy, is that there? No, sir. Uh, no, sir. There's a slide. Yeah, this slide is coming. Uh, Arvind Eye Care System as a sustainable business model. Yeah, maybe I will. I will use this mode. You know, when I go to full screen, you are not able to see it. If that's okay. Because when I go to slideshow, you are not able to see. Yes, sir. Uh, is that okay to use this mode? Yes, sir. This, this seems to be fine. Okay. Okay. Is it moving? Next slide. Yes, is sir. Yes, sir. It is moving. Slide? It is moving, sir. Yes, sir. Perfect. Okay. Then I will do this one. Okay. So, Dr. V, uh, this was the slide I was talking about. Dr. V had a very vibrant mind. At one end, he was very spiritually evolved. He wanted to help others. He wanted to be provide solution to people who were not able to see. But the other end, he was also very practical. He said, can we learn something from McDonald's of 1970s? He says, they have created assembly line efficiency. They have standardized their product, consistent, strict quality, cost control. Uh, so he said, if we can do all this in eye care, then eye care will be available for all people in this uh, society. So that was how he approached the, uh, the problem. Coming to the guiding principles, these are the values and the uh, we, what we call as an Aravind way. Uh, I'm sure all large organizations will have their own uh, values and culture and the philosophies that they believe in. For us, it is making eye care accessible to all, frugality, be staff-centric, share whatever uh, we have with other organizations, work on continuous improvement, self-reliance, patient centricity, and quality. So these are the uh, guiding values that uh, drive us in the organization. So the building blocks of Arvan are uh, three. One is the strong uh, value system of Dr. V, and also the delivery system. You know, We handle today about 18,000 patients, 16 to 18,000 patients every day. We are about 7,200 employees. Coal India is much larger, but for an eye care organization, this is uh, 
a large uh, number of people working in an organization to be able to bridge those two the only way to do it is to bring in innovation and innovation is how this organization tried to scale up from a 11 bedded uh, clinic which was started in 1976 today we are uh, close to about uh, 8000 beds and perform about uh, 600000 surgeries a year so this is where it was started in a rented building as you can uh, see Uh, in 1976, uh, the idea was to provide compassionate and quality eye care and make it affordable. 1976, India, 50% of the people couldn't even pay to travel; they couldn't even come to the hospital. So that was the situation. Today is a very different India. The government has also done a lot of good work on below poverty line insurance. Things have changed uh, dramatically. But last uh, 45 years of sustained work in eye care, not only by Arvind. but most many good organizations have made india a, a, a very a global uh, model for sustainable eye care in the world so one example i can give you whole of china does only about 2.5 million cataract surgeries india does close to 8 million cataract surgeries so if you look at it we are way ahead of china in the uh, in eye care and chinese products the intraocular lens the suture the viscoelastic most of them go from india so india exports a lot of eye care products uh, to china so india is a, not only a, a self sustaining model for the country but globally it has made a, a significant impact in uh, eye care so these are our own hospitals in different locations we have uh, it's a pyramid model we have primary care centers in the community about 102 we have outpatient centers 6 and these 7 and plus 7 14 centers are tertiary and secondary so they take care of the hospital i'm sure you've seen the government hospitals primary health care is there secondary district level hospitals and and the state headquarters will have the tertiary care and specialty hospitals very similarly we work that way 2021 was a covid year so we were able to do only about 60% of what we would typically do so on a typical year we would do close to about 5 uh, to 6 million outpatients a year and last year the covid year we did about 2.88 million and performed about 327000 uh, surgeries and uh, gave about uh, close to 500000 spectacles and arvind eye care system also you know employs a lot of young women you know as you can see all these young women of the 7200 employees 3600 employees are we call them as mid level of karmic personnel they are the equivalent of a nursing staff in a hospital but they go through a two year training program we recruit them after when they are 18 when they finish their 12th standard they train with us for 2 years and work with us for 3 to 4 years and then some of them will stay but most of them will get married and uh, move on in their uh, life so every year we also select about 1000 young women so that is also a very important uh, element of the model that uh, we need to also take care of these young women and make bring a difference to their life this is the first time somebody is getting educated in their family Uh, they are from a rural area so we need to give them the right values right uh, culture and orientation and also give them a skill that they can leverage and make a better life uh, for their children in the future so here we look for value fit more than skill fit because we are the ones who train them in skills so these women today perform most of the routine clinical tasks thus doctors can focus on diagnosis diagnosis and surgery they allow us to be uh, giving higher quality and productivity and also lower the cost and life of these young women are also vastly improved because of this the other challenge that we have in india uh, you know for an example in us with the population of about 300 million people us has about 32000 ophthalmologists we are having four times the population of us but we have less doctors than us so that's the problem that we have even that some states have more and some states have less so south of india has about 70% of all of the ophthalmologists uh, i'll give you an example whole of up graduates about close to 150 ophthalmologists a year tamil nadu graduates about uh, close to 650 ophthalmologists per year tamil nadu is one half of uh, up's population including uttarakhand is much more so there is a lot of uh, mismatch today the government is trying to address those mismatch and trying to start uh, uh, education programs and postgraduate training so that more doctors are available in the community so there are resource constraints within the country 
some the southern states, Gujarat, have done well in in eye care. Uh, Jammu Kashmir has less of a problem. Kerala has less of a problem because the incidence of cataract is less in those uh, states. But other states, if you see, uh, certain states have done extremely well, and certain states have to have a lot more work to do. Part of the reason is they don't have adequate number of doctors. That is one important reason, and also lack of institutions. So Arvind has done a, a lot of work in this regard. So uh, this slide is a little jumbled because it is come, it's supposed to come on the full screen. But what it means is uh, we have innovated a way to work. One surgeon, two surgical tables, an adequate number of sets. The surgeon's productivity can go up by 500 to 600 per set. So this is an example that you can see. An average surgeon in the country today does about 200 to 300 surgeries a year. Whereas an, an average Arvin surgeon does about 1,000 to 1,200 surgeries a year. That's purely because there is an assembly line model. There is a, a logistics model. I'm sure, you know, in Coal India, you're all talking about logistics. In eye care, if you ask me, what is the biggest challenge that we have? It is not eye care. It is logistics. How do we bring in 18,000 people every day? How do we go and do our eye camps? How do we shift them? We have to be very careful taking care of them. You know, they can have any problems in the heart any problems in their lung. So we have to have the entire system. I was telling the logistics, transportation, food, accommodation, water for them, all of that is a big uh, challenge and an opportunity for us to build scale. That was the point I was making. And because of that scale, we are able to give a very affordable care. Uh, you know, it costs in US about $3,450. At Arvind, it costs about $88 to uh, give the same quality effect, a little better quality surgery. So this was a, you know, whenever we have a high volume, we think the quality has to be compromised. Uh, the, the example I was giving was uh, a busy airport is usually a better airport. You know, they have their systems in the right place. Every minute an aircraft lands and takes off compared to an air, airport where only five aircrafts land every day or even a fewer uh, aircrafts. So Arvind is also a very busy organization. So though naturally the outcomes are also better. So as you can see, even compared to developing developed nations, Arvind's outcomes and complication rates are definitely better than others. India as such, not only Arvind, India as such, the quality of eye care is far better because our, our doctors are very skillful. Uh, and also Indian companies, you know, not only uh, Arvind and Aurolab, which is our manufacturing arm, there are quite a few other ophthalmic manufacturing companies who are doing a, a wonderful job and putting uh, India on the global map. And... Uh, you know, the market conditions of India, even today, it's true. Large underserved population, resource scarcity, both capital and HR. The problem with the medical community is most of the doctors are available only in the cities, not in the rural area. And understandably so. You know, the rural areas don't have adequate schools for their children, don't have a infrastructure to support them. So doctors tend to be uh, staying in large cities. I'll give you an example. If you take whole of Tamil Nadu, Tamil Nadu has about uh, 2,500 doctors uh, today. If you take five cities in Tamil Nadu, uh, Chennai, Coimbatore, Tiruchi, Madurai, and uh, say Salem, you will have about 75 to 80% of doctors taking care of this population. And this population will be not more than 20%. So 80% of the doctors, 75% of the doctors taking care of a much smaller population. Now, the rural people will also come into the bigger cities. So there is a mismatch all around. So what we try to do is whenever we open a hospital, we don't try to compete with anybody. Like, for example, we opened a hospital in Tirupati, in Chennai. We also work in Uttar Pradesh in a place called Sitapur. We work with Sitapur Eye Hospital. We also work in Africa. So we try to go to the population that is already undiagnosed. So our whole focus is to look for non-customers rather than customers. So for us, competition is not with the other hospitals. Uh, we, our whole effort is to grow the market so that everybody will uh, benefit from uh, the whole purpose. And the market is huge. You know, if you take the served market is small, 20% in healthcare. 80% of the market is still uh, virgin and a lot more needs to be done by all organizations uh, in this country. So community outreach programs in the year 2020, 2021, we conducted 442 eye camps. I'm sure you're all involved in eye camps. So where you go in the community, screen them. 
the biggest problem for the community today is how will I come to the hospital? They all know they can't see. You know, it is everybody knows. You know, it's not like a heart problem, which is hidden. Eye problem will tell you it is either paining or I can't see well. But their problem is who will take me to the hospital? Who will come along with me? Who will spend for the transportation? So if we can bridge those gaps, if we can do eye camps and bring arranged transportation, bring them to the hospital, bulk of the problem in the community is gets sorted out. That's why I said. Logistics is very critical in, in conducting uh, good eye care uh, in the community. One of the challenges that we have with eye camps, you know, this was a study done in the uh, early, uh, late uh, 90s. So this study showed eye camps are a good model to take care of cataract, but not other problems. The problems in the community could be glaucoma, could be retina related problems, it could be injury to the eye. But eye camps happen only randomly. It doesn't happen in a structured way. So we established something called as a vision center. So vision centers are centers with the two technicians. So these two technicians are willing to stay in a rural area. So this is the first time we are able to saturate eye care for a 50 to 75,000 population with these technicians. So as you can see, uh, we have about 102 vision centers uh, now. And these vision centers cover uh, a population of about uh, 5 million to 6 million people in the community. So this is a little old slide, 91 centers. We have about 102 centers. Maybe we are covering about 8 million population. So where 90% of the patient's problem can be handled in the community. They don't have to come to the hospital near their doorstep, not more than four to five kilometers from where they live. Surgery, they have to come to the hospital, but that's a one visit that they come and we are able to take care of them. So what Arvind has done to the community is uh, gave it away free. Maybe in the in 70s and 80s, Arvind gave 80% of its care free. Those days, insurance was not available. Today, I'm sure all of you in the audience will have medical insurance. All of us are aware about medical insurance. The government is also aware about the importance of medical insurance. Several states, even the uh, Ayushman uh, Bharat scheme that the government has brought, people have, the government also has realized healthcare is not only uh, is a, it's a national issue, and the government hospitals alone cannot take care of the underprivileged. We have to bring in every resource available, private, not-for-profit, and the government to be able to address the problems in the community. Arvind is a not-for-profit organization. That's how uh, we uh, are able to work. And the mindset came from our founder. Our founder said, if somebody is not seeing well in the community, this is the problem of the professionals and the providers of care, not the community. What will the poor man or lady will do about cataract or any of the eye problem? It is we who know how to deal with that as a problem. It's we who have solution. We are responsible for taking the solution to the larger community. So the basics are the patient should come first. Anything that we do for us, the patient is always, uh, uh, our decisions are based on patient well-being. Strive for single visit. Don't make the patient come five times, six times. Rural area, it's not easy to travel from their place, older person, not able to see. Always remove the constraints. Like I said, transport is a constraint. Food is a constraint. Taking care of diabetes is a constraint. We try to address all that. Keep well-balanced resources to keep the system smooth. Be transparent in pricing and showing what we do. Constantly measure and share the data to make up better. And also amplify caregivers' voice. You know, a lot of our young staff, who kind of have good ideas to do this well, can we amplify their voice and make our system a lot more better than what it is. So what we have learned in the last 50, uh, 45, 46 years is both we have both paying and free, both contribute to the viability of the organization. The free allows us to gain tremendous community acceptance. If you can see, we provide 52% of all eye care in a hundred million population. There are only about 15 countries larger than 100 million population. So that kind of a scale allows us to build a highly sustainable uh, uh, organization focused on efficiency, frugality, and training. This is the what the free gives to the DNA of Arvind. The paying patients also give to the DNA. Paying patients would come because they want good quality. They are not coming because we are a charitable organization. We are serving free. So we have to set our service quality our outcomes have to be world-class, and also it allows us to get better technology, the best technology in the world. 
and also allows us to generate surplus to be able to handle the needs for our, our own expansion. So Arvind works purely on a, a patient revenue generation, generation model. We uh, get very little uh, uh, support from uh, government and uh, corporate organization by default, uh, so that it's a sustainable organization that keeps working on eye care. Not only uh, delivering eye care, Arvind is uh, somebody had written an article about uh, this concept called market driving and not market driven. Many or most organizations are market driven. Very few organizations are market driving. They create a market. So they had shown Arvind as an example. So Arvind also went into manufacturing. Uh, this was in the late, uh, mid, early 90s. The paying patients were getting lens inside the eye. I'm sure some of your parents, some of your relatives would have had a surgery. An intraocular lens uh, would have gone into their eye. In 1975, 80 to 90, the only the paying patients were getting intraocular lens. Till about 1995, 96, 97, the free patients were not able to get uh, uh, intraocular lens. Intraocular lens came to the market only in the 80s, uh, early 80s. So India did not have uh, intraocular lens manufacturing. Arvind got into manufacturing. We also do consultancy work with other uh, India-like countries, you know, other African countries, South American countries, other Asian countries, and also get involved in research. So Aurolab is a manufacturing arm. Today, 34 million people uh, use Aurolab lenses in their eye. These are the patients who had surgery. It has 12% uh, of the global market share. These products are used in 130 countries. The manufacturing plant is in Madurai. Imagine a small town, about 1.5 million people, uh, supplies world's 12% of the world's need for uh, intraocular lens. And started by a man who was 50, at the age of 58, he founded an organization after his retirement and built it into what it is today. And also the consultancy arm, Lions Arvind Institute of Community Ophthalmology is the, whatever Arvind has done is not rocket science. You know, it has only had the mindset and has found a way constantly and strive to give better eye care to be by building the scale in eye care. Uh, healthcare is high in the fixed cost, you know, because of the doctors, uh, the salary component is usually 45 to 50 percent in a hospital. It's a fixed cost. And then we have the buildings, we have everything else available. So if we can from that scale, the 100 million population allows us to get that scale possible. And also Leiko, as I said, is a capacity building arm. We work partner with Lions Aravind Institute of Community Ophthalmology to give eye care to more people. Research is another element. Most of the research is done in developed countries, not in India-like countries. So it's high time that we need to take care of our own disease, not wait for somebody in the Western world to give a solution. So we are also actively involved in eye care research. And uh, we also do a program called LEAP, where we build uh, leadership, where we work with the people and there are quite a few participants that uh, work together, like, like what you're doing in Conclave. So we try to help other hospitals to build capacity to become better. So we have worked with about 159 hospitals, 173 teams, and we have had 475 participants uh, in that pro program. And Apart from consultation, we also do partnership kind of work. So this is in Africa. So we have done extensive work in Africa in the past uh, four decades. Uh, even now there is a team of, of Arvind in Africa in Nigeria. We have a hospital there uh, at Abuja, Nigeria, where we work. Uh, the whole of Nigeria is, Nigeria is about 200 million people. Whole of Nigeria does only 60,000 surgeries a year. Tamil Nadu alone does about uh, uh, 7 lakh surgeries a year. So it's, it's sad, three times the population of Tamil Nadu and they do one-tenth of the surgery of the state. So their, their population is really struggling. So we have a lot to share and give to countries in Africa. So we, this is a hospital managed by Aravind Eye Care System. So we uh, aim to do about 12,000 surgeries a year. Uh, so this is the hospital that we have uh, there. Uh, this is a foundation called Tulsi Chandrai and we manage it uh, for them in Nigeria. The other project that we do is called UP site. So this is a hospital in uh, uh, 
uh, Uttar Pradesh uh, in a place called Sitapur. You know, you see the buildings. There is a Dr. Meghre. He started this hospital in 1947. And in 1947, this place, Sitapur is about two hours from Lucknow. This hospital was world class in 1947. But today, unfortunately, they have degenerated for various reasons, lack of leadership and direction. But for 25 to 30 years, they were the iconic hospital in this country. People would go from Tamil Nadu, wealthy people would go from Tamil Nadu to Sitapur to get their eyes taken care of. Uh, now you hear a lot of good hospitals in, uh, in Hyderabad, Chennai and other places. Earlier in 1950s, 60s, it was Sitapur. All people in this country went to Sitapur. They also came from other countries to Sitapur. So this Dr. Mayre was a revelation. Even in 1947, he was able to think uh, that much. A 25-acre campus, 400,000 square foot built-up space in 1947 for eye care. Even the general hospitals were not that big uh, in 1947, on the year of independence. But it's a phenomenal organization. We have uh, taken over the management. We are trying to work with them to be able to uh, build, bring better eye care to UP. And we have called it as UP site to be able to give better site to people of uh, UP. Uh, we have also set up hospitals in Lucknow and uh, Ameti uh, earlier, but this is a much larger scope. We can do about 100,000 surgeries a year. Whole of UP today does only about 300,000 surgeries. So UP needs to do about uh, a million surgeries, uh, at least a 10 lakh uh, surgery a year. So we have a long way to go uh, in UP. So these are, this is how urban works, you know, multiple ways of uh, engagement uh, with the community. And as our founder uh, had always said, uh, you know, a lot more has to be done. Uh, that is true for eye care. Maybe that is true for all fields in the world uh, in a country like India. So thank you again for this opportunity. I'm sure uh, you're all doing a great work, uh, you know, uh, giving, bringing light to this uh, country with your coal. And uh, in our own small ways, we are bringing light to the eyes of the people. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Arvind. So this is Thank Rajiv you. from Deloitte. Uh, basically, I have a few questions, uh, but before that, I will summarize uh, some of the key things that you spoke about. You taught us the sure. Arvind way of uh, managing you know, and delivering healthcare, which is remarkable, and uh, the assembly line for uh, ophthalm ophthalmic treatment. Uh, but one question I had around in terms of uh, the, this kind of business model, or I would say delivery model, uh, if you look at, the, especially from a mining uh, area perspective and Coal India as we're working in these areas, we see that uh, pulmonary diseases are one of the major diseases which kind of impact the local uh, community in the in these areas. Uh, and we have found that access to healthcare in these regions is a major, major challenge because the per capita income of people here is really low. Uh, they don't have proper uh, healthcare. So, so what is the kind of uh, business model or delivery model you would suggest for modular healthcare in these regions, in uh, you know, areas apart from ophthalmology? Yeah, uh, uh, you, you, know, it's a, it's a, you know, this is a chronic problem, right? So it's, it's what we try to take care of eye care. Eye care is more a one-time problem. You know, people are blind. We go into the community, we operate and get them better. But chronic problem is a challenge. You know, tuberculosis is a challenge like coal mining, you know, people will have lung issues. It's a chronic problem. So there, the public-private partnership becomes very important. You know, you are a public organization, partner with a large organization so that people can go for tertiary, but their primary care. Obviously, Coal India will do its best for safety, taking care of all their uh, safety measures and precautions that they will take. But apart from that, you know, uh, there are other problems that can come. Uh, it's not easy. You know, the point I made about... Uh, rural areas and uh, areas which are very far, uh, you can't blame the healthcare providers too. You know, they have their family needs. Uh, so it, we have to build a hub and spoke model. You know, like the offshore rigs they have, they have people work for three months there, come back to the mainland. Uh, so I think we have to create models where people can do it. And it's been successfully done in America, actually. If you remember, there is a large organization called Kaiser Permanent in you know, America, the large hospital chain. So they started primarily with the coal workers. They started because with Dr. Mr. Kaiser went to the coal uh, organization said, I will insure all your patients, take care of your health. And that's how the Kaiser Permanente as an organization started. So it's not an easy problem to solve, but uh, partnership is the only way to go. And also hub and spoke model.
another question I had around the, you know, you mentioned about fixed cost. How do we recover fixed cost for this, uh, you know, uh, capacity build that you have built? So I understand that you are operating more on a variable cost model, where you have, your, you know, number of, you have more number of surgeries so that, you know, your uh, costs are recovered. So if I look at, similarly from a rural area perspective, and again the mining areas, how do we ensure footfalls? Because footfalls of patients, and thereby we recover cost and make this sustainable, uh, those models, and maybe we engage the lo local entrepreneurs or the local people. So what, what kind of models will work over there? Yeah, as I said, you know, for us, the high volume works because we are a one-time intervention model. But in a chronic model, that doesn't work because chronic model is a trickling model, right? People will come once in a month for their checkup. They will need once in a month if they're a diabetic, if they're hypertensive, if they have a, a bronchiectasis, pulmonary issues. So they will need a, a very frequent checkup. That's where I said uh, cost recovery becomes a little tricky. So that's where... Uh, institution like uh, you know coal india or whoever is the industry in that area have to take keep the well-being of that community uh, in the minds and that's why you are having this conclave right? it's a corporate social uh, responsibility for uh, the organization to take care of its people so it the organizations cannot be sustainable on their own for chronic diseases and that's true for government too you know if you really look at eye care government's contribution to eye care is only about uh, less than 10 percent of the overall surgeries it's all private and public uh, organizations. And the government, that's a smart thing to do. Government should focus on HIV, tuberculosis, vaccinating children, where cost recovery is not possible. Where cost recovery is possible, there are other organizations will come and do it. So I, I don't have a simple answer to the question, uh, but it is it is the interest in the, of the organizations, the companies, and also of the hospitals to take care of the larger companies. Anything, any questions from the audience? Yes. Uh, hi, good evening. My name is Alok Srivastava. I am from CMPDI. And big round of applause for your visionary, Mr. Arvindo. And uh, yeah. uh, you have, uh, we are all are here service class people. Uh, you have given us the message that much has been done and much remains to be done. So you have you said that your founder member has just started after 58 years. After seeing your presentation, we have feel more motivated and we will do much more better in our second inning also. And this is good message for all of us. Thanks and Thank keep you. doing good work, sir. Thanks. Thank you. Appreciate the message. Thank you. Thank you. Today, you know, today people live longer. You know? Today people 80s are all, people are living longer, people are living healthy. All of us are aware of healthy eating habits, healthy lifestyle habits. So 58 is not old, though, though the government may retire at 58 or 60. But uh, that could be also a good start, you know, with so much of wisdom, so much of experience gained in the last 30 years of one's life. You know, it can be a, a platform for doing uh, much more than what was done in the first innings. Any other question? Hello, uh, good afternoon. I am Jyotin Maisena from Bhubaneswar. My question to you is that uh, you have, uh, uh, this institution has been named in the name of spiritual leader, Sri Aurobindo. His name is Sri A-U-R-O Bindo. But this organization name is, I can say, Arvind, A-R-V-I-N-D. Why th this is so? Can I know? Yeah, sure. It is in Tamil Nadu, uh, where Pondicherry, he is called as Aravinder. He is not, you see, Aurobindo is a Bengali name. So the way we pronounce that name is Aravind. We call it as Aravinder. So that's why his name is called as Aravindai Hospital. So if you ask, if you go to Pondicherry, you will not see it as Aravindu Ashram. You will see it as Aravinder Ashram. That is only this. Or this name, Aurobindo, you know, the Bindo. And Oro is not in Tamil. It's not natural, but it's in Bengali, Odisha. It's a natural way of, uh, you know, communicating. Uh, so that's what. That is the only reason. Thank you, sir. Thank you, sir, for making us aware about the unique and well-recognized Aravinda way of eliminating avoidable blindness for the needy persons. Sir, we would have felt great to felicitate you in person. 
we have a token of appreciation for you sir which will reach to you by post a big round of Thank applause you. for the last speaker dr s arvind thank you so much thank you have a good evening thank you I'll thank you sir you may please uh, disconnect sir please yes yes i'll disconnect yes okay. today marks the end of day 1 of the technical session tomorrow we will come with another set of eminent speakers from different csr backgrounds sharing their experiences and thoughts with us before we conclude for the day i would like to express my appreciation to the speakers and distinguished guests for their valuable contribution towards the conclave my deepest gratitude goes to all who attended the technical session and helped to make it a successful event i would request everyone to assemble near the high tea area for tea and refreshments request everyone not to leave the campus as we have organized a cultural evening at 7:30 pm uh those who are staying in uh, those who are having their stays in the hotels nearby hotels or other places i would request not to go because this is peak traffic hour and you may face a traffic jam and we have a beautiful performance lined up by school children as well as ccl officials so let's go for the refreshment and post that refreshment session we can have the cultural evening at 7:30 pm thank you followed by dinner tomorrow the same at the same time 9:30 so i would request everyone to please be seated by 9 uh, so that we can have the session sharp at 9:30 thank you so much thank you so much have a great day ahead thank you so much